Modern Greek Songs by Elizabeth Gaskell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Household Words, number 205, 25th of February, 1854. I have lately met with a French book, which has interested me much, and as it is now out of print and was never very extensively known, I imagine some account of it may not be displeasing to the readers of household words. It is called Chant Populaire de la Grèce Moderne, Passé Fauriel. Monsieur Fauriel is a Greek, in spite of his French name and the language in which he writes. The plan on which he has collected these Chant Populaire resembles that of Sir Walter Scott in his Border Minstrelsy. In both cases there is a preliminary discourse explaining the manners and peculiar character of the people among whom these ballads circulate, and the history of whose ancestors and popular heroes they commemorate. This discourse and the explanatory notes give the principal interest to the book, as they tell of the habits and customs and traditions of a people whom we are apt to moan over as having fallen low from the higher states of the civilization of their ancestors. But as there are four millions of men who claim a direct descent from the most polished people the world has ever known, it becomes worth one's while to learn something of their present state. Monsieur Fauriel divides the poetry of modern Greece into two kinds, works of literature written down as composed, and corrected and revised in strict accordance with the rules of art, and the real ballads, poems springing out of the heart of the nation whenever it is deeply stirred, and circulating from man to man with the rapidity of flame, never written down but never forgotten. Some of these songs relate to domestic, but the majority to popular events. Let us take the household songs. There are two feasts which are celebrated in every house. The first is on New Year's Day, the feast of St. Basil in the Greek church. The account which Mr. Fauriel gives reminds me much of a Scottish New Year's Day. The young men pass from one house to another until all their friends have been visited, bringing with them presents and going in glad procession to salute all their acquaintances. But instead of our I wish you a happy new year and many of them. The young Greeks, on entering each house, sing some verses in honour of the master or head of the family, others in the honour of the mistress. The sons of the house have each their song, nor are the daughters forgotten. Those who are absent or dead receive this compliment last of all. The key changes. The remembrance of the lost is sung mournfully and sadly, but none of the family are left out on the feast of St. Basil. As they go along the streets, they sing in honour of the saint. I was once in England, most kindly received by a Greek family, who allowed me to witness their Easter day ceremonies, which, in the expression of good wishes and the glad visits of congratulation paid by all the gentlemen to their friends, must have resembled a feast of St. Basil without the songs. The family consisted of a Greek mother, a most lovely daughter, and a son who left his own home on this day to visit his friends. In one corner of the small English drawing-room there was spread a table covered with mellow-looking sweetmeats, all as if the glow of sunset rested on their amber and crimson colours, and there were decanters containing mysterious liquids to match. In came one Greek gentleman after another, with some short sentence which burst forth as if it contained the perfection of joy. It was the Greek for Christ is risen. Then all shook hands. The visitors tasted of the jewel-like sweetmeats and rushed off to go somewhere else and to have their places taken by other troops of friends. But we had no songs, nor do I know if, in our cold northern climate, the Greeks keep up the feast of the coming spring. In Greece this is held on the 1st of March, the first of May would often be early greeting to the spring in England. At this pretty holiday, the children in their spring of human life join the young men and go singing about the streets and asking for small presents in honour of the soft and budding time. 
and everyone gives them an egg or some cheese or some other simple produce of the country the song they sing is one which for its grace and the breath of spring and flowers which perfumes it is known in many countries as well as in greece under the name of the song of the swallow the children carry about with them the figure of a swallow rudely cut in wood and fastened to a kind of little windmill which is turned by a piece of string fastened to a cylinder the modern greeks are an essentially commercial people i have heard a saying which shows the popular opinion of their bargaining talents it takes two englishmen to cheat a scotchman two scotchmen to cheat a jew two jews to cheat a greek this turn for commerce added to the poverty of their own country and the uncertain tenure of property there causes numbers of greeks to become merchants in other countries but they suffer acutely on first leaving their homes the nearer to the mountains the more they mourn and their sadness as well as their joy is expressed by song when any one is leaving his home to go into a strange land his friends and companions meet together at his house to share with him one final meal and after that they accompany him on a part of his way as orpah and ruth accompanied naomi as raphael's companions for the great love they bore him went with him when he left the studio of perugino as they walk along they sing there are songs set apart from time immemorial for the sad occasion of a greek's departure from greece and others are made on the spot out of the excited feelings of the moment there is a story told of a youth the youngest of three brothers but little beloved by his mother the poor fellow endeavoured in vain to win some scanty sprinkling of the affection that was showered on his eldest brothers and at last he determined to become an exile from that home which was no home to him so he set forth accompanied by his young companions his brothers his sisters and as a matter of form by his mother herself four or five miles from his birthplace there was a small gorge through which the narrow road wound this was the determined point of separation and here among the rocky echoes were sung the most doleful farewell songs suddenly the young man mounted upon a rock and improvised a poem on the sufferings he had experienced from the indifference of his mother he cried to her to bless him once before he went away for ever with something of the wild entreaty of esau when he adjured isaac to bless me also o oh my father nor was this strange poetic appeal in vain the mother with a sudden eastern change of feeling could hardly wait until the improvised song was finished i have sometimes felt as impatient over an improvised sermon before she in return sang her repentance and promised if he would remain at home that she would be a better mother for the future Monsieur Fauriel says no more i should not have been sorry to have had the old fairy tale ending affixed to this true story and they lived together very happily for ever after now let us hear about the marriage songs life seems like an opera amongst the modern greeks all emotions all events require the relief of singing but a marriage is a singing time among human beings as well as birds among the greeks the youth of both sexes are kept apart and do not meet excepting on the occasion of some public feast when the young greek makes choice of his bride and asks her parents for their consent if they give it all is arranged for the betrothal but the young people are not allowed to see each other again until that event there are parts of greece where the young man is allowed to declare his passion himself to the object of it not in words however does he breathe his tender suit he tries to meet with her in some path or other place in which he may throw her an apple or a flower if the former missile be chosen one can only hope that the young lady is apt at catching as a blow from a moderately hard apple is rather too violent a token of love after this apple or flower throwing his only chance of meeting with his love is at the fountain to which all greek maidens go to draw water as rebecca went of old to the well the ceremony of betrothal is very simple on an appointed evening the relations of the lovers meet together in the presence of a priest 
either at the house of the father of the future husband, or at that of the parents of the bride-elect. After the marriage contract is signed, two young girls bring in the affianced maiden, who is covered all over with a veil, and present her to her lover, who takes her by the hand and leads her up to the priest. They exchange rings before him, and he gives them his blessing. The bride then retires, but all the rest of the company remain, and spend the day in merry-making and drinking the health of the young couple. The interval between the betrothal and the marriage may be but a few hours. It may be months, and it may be years. But whatever the length of time, the lovers must never meet again until the wedding day comes. Three or four days before that time, the father and mother of the bride send round their notes of invitation, each of which is accompanied by the presence of a bottle of wine. The answers come in with even more substantial accompaniments. Those who have great pleasure in accepting send a present with their reply. The most frequent is a ram or lamb, dressed up with ribbons and flowers, but the poorest send their quarter of mutton as their contribution to the wedding feast. The eve of the marriage, or rather during the night, the friends on each side go to deck out the bride and groom for the approaching ceremony. The bridegroom is shaved by his paranymph, or groom's man, in a very grave and dignified manner, in the presence of all the young ladies invited. Fancy the attitude of the bridegroom, anxious and motionless under the hands of his unpractised barber, his nose held lightly up between a finger and thumb, while a crowd of young girls look gravely on at the graceful operation. The bride is decked for her part by her young companions, who dress her in white and cover her all over with a long veil made of the finest stuff. Early the next morning, the young man and all of his friends come forth, like a bridegroom out of his chamber, to seek the bride, and carry her off from her father's house. Then she, in songs as ancient as the ruins of the old temples that lie around her, sings her sorrowful farewell to the father who has cared for her and protected her hitherto, to the mother who has borne her and cherished her, to the companions of her maidenhood, to her early home, to the fountain when she daily fetched water, to the trees which shaded her childish play, and every now and then she gives way to natural tears. Then, according to immemorial usage, the paranymph turns to the glad yet sympathetic procession, and says in a sentence which has become proverbial on such occasions, Let her alone, she weeps, to which she must make answer, Lead me away, but let me weep. After the cortege has borne the bride to the house of her husband, the whole party adjourn to the church, where the religious ceremony is performed. Then they return to the dwelling of the bridegroom, where they all sit down and feast, except the bride, who remains veiled, standing alone until the middle of the banquet, when the paranymph draws near, unlooses the veil, which falls down, and she stands blushing, exposed to the eyes of all the guests. The next day is given up to the performance of dances peculiar to a wedding. The third day, the relations and friends meet all together and lead the bride to the fountain, from the waters of which she fills a new earthen vessel and into which she throws various provisions. They afterwards dance in circles round the fountain. At every one of the ceremonials which I have thus briefly recounted, a song appropriate to the occasion is chanted. They explain the motive of each particular act, of what event in human life it is to be considered the type. Even the shaving has its song, set apart. But many of the forms I have described are very poetical and full of meaning in themselves. The character of the marriage songs is tender, yet gay and hopeful, but the character of the myriologia, or funeral songs, is altogether despairing and sad. When any one dies, his wife, his mother, and his sisters all come up to the poor motionless body and softly close the eyes and the mouth. Then they leave the house and go to that of a friend, where they dress in white, as if for some glad nuptial occasion, with this sole difference, that their hair is allowed to flow dishevelled and uncovered. Other women are busy with the corpse while they change their dress in a neighbour's house. The body is dressed in the best clothes that the dead possessed, 
and it is then laid on a low bed with the face uncovered and turned towards the east, while the arms lie peacefully crossed on the breast. When all these preparations have been made, the relations return to the house of mourning, leaving the door open, so that all who wish once more to gaze on the face of the departed may enter in. All who come range themselves around the bed and weep and cry aloud without restraint. As soon as they are a little calmer, someone begins to chant the Myriologia, a custom common to the ancient Hebrews, as well as to the more modern Irish, with their keens and their plaintive enumeration of the goods and blessings and love which the deceased possessed in this world which he has left. In the mountains of Greece, the nearest and dearest among the female relations, first lifts up her voice in the Myriologia. She is followed by others, either sisters or friends. Monsieur Fauriel gives an instance of the style of dramatic personation of events common in the Myriologia. A peasant woman, about twenty-five years of age, had lost her husband, who left her with two infant children. She was extremely uneducated, and had lived the silent, self-contained life common to the Greek women but there was something very striking in the manner in which she began her wail over the dead body. Addressing herself to him, she said, I saw at the door of our dwelling, yea, I saw at the door of our house, a young man of tall stature and threatening aspect, having wings like the clouds for whiteness. He stood on the threshold of our home with a naked sword in his hand. Woman, he asked, is thy husband within? He is within, replied I. He is there, combing the fair hair of our little Nicholas, and caressing him the while that he may not cry. Do not go in, O bright and terrible youth, thou wilt frighten our little child. But the man with shining white wings heeded not my words. He went in. I struggled to prevent him. O oh, my husband! I struggled, but he was stronger than I. He passed into our home. He darted on thee, O oh, my beloved, and struck thee with his sword. He struck thee, the father of our little Nicholas, and here, here is our little son, our Nicholas, that he would also have killed. At these words she threw herself sobbing on the corpse of her husband, and it was some time before the women standing by could bring her round. But she had hardly recovered before she began afresh, and addressed her dead husband again. She asked him how she could live without him, how she could protect his children, without his strong arm to help. She recalled the first days of their marriage, how dearly they had loved each other, how together they had watched over the infancy of their two little children, and she only ceased when her strength utterly failed once more, and she lay by the corpse in a swoon like death itself. Occasionally there is someone among the assemblage of mourners who has also lately lost a beloved one, and whose full hearts yet yearn for the sympathy of their griefs or joys, which the dead were ever ready to give, while they were yet living. They take up the strain, and in a form of song used from time immemorial, they conjure the dead lying before them to be the messenger of the intelligence they wish to send to him who is gone away for ever. A similar superstition is prevalent in the highlands, and everyone remembers Mrs. Heman's pathetic little poem on this subject. It is rather too abrupt to turn from the deep pathos of the faithful love implied by this superstition to a story of something of a similar kind, which fell under the observation of a country minister in Lancashire, well known to some friends of mine. A poor man lay a-dying, but still perfectly sensible and acute. A woman of his acquaintance came to see him, who had lately lost her husband, and who was imbued with the idea mentioned above. Bill, said she, where thou art bound to, thou'lt maybe see our Thomas. Be sure thou tell him we have getted the wheel of Shandry mended, and it's mostly as good as new. And mind thou sayest we're getting on very wheel without him. He may as wheel think so, poor chap. To which Bill made answer, Why, woman, dost do think I's have naught better to do than go clumping up and down the sky, a searching for thy Thomas? To those who have lived in Lancashire, the word clumping exactly suggests the kind of heavy walk of the country people who wear the thick wooden clogs common in that country. 
but let us jump, like Dr. Faustus, out of Lancashire into Greece. In that country, some of the people around the corpse are not content with sending messages to their dead friends. They place flowers and other tokens of remembrance upon the body, entreating the last deceased whose remains lie before them to bear their flowers and presents to those who have gone before. All these messages, and these adieus, are expressed in song, nor do they cease until the body is laid in the grave. For a year afterwards his relations are only allowed to sing Myriologia. Any other kind of song, however pious or pathetic, is prohibited by custom. The anniversary of the death is kept by a final gathering together of the friends, who go in procession to the grave, and once more chant their farewells. If a Greek dies far away from Greece, they substitute an effigy for the real corpse, round which they assemble, to which they bid farewell, but with an aggravation of sorrow and despair, inasmuch as he has died far from his own bright land. But perhaps the most touching of the Myriologia are those addressed by the mothers to the infants they have lost. When the child dies very young, no one but the mother sings the Myriologia. It is hers, and she belongs to it. The tie between them was too mysteriously close to allow a stranger to intermeddle with her grief, but her lost child takes the form of every pretty thing in nature in her mind. It is a broken flower, a young bird fallen out of the nest and killed, a little yearling lamb lying dead by the side of its mother. It is the exclusive right of women to sing the Myriologia. The men bid farewell to their companion and friend in a few simple words of prose, kissing the mouth of the deceased ere they leave the house. But two centuries ago, among the mountains of Greece, the shepherds sang the Myriologia over each other. The original significance of the custom is dying out even now. Women are hired to express an assumed grief in formal verses, where formerly the anguish of the nearest and dearest gave them the gift of improvisation. Before I go on to explain the character and subject of the occasional songs, I had perhaps better mention what class of men are the means of their circulation among the peasantry of Greece, as well as through the islands of the archipelago. There are no beggars in these countries, excepting the blind. All others would think it shame to live by arms, with their blue and sunny sky above them, and their fertile soil beneath their feet. But the blind are a privileged class. They go from house to house, receiving a ready welcome at each, for they are wandering minstrels, and have been so ever since Homer's time. Some of them have learnt by heart an immense number of songs, and all know a large collection. Their memory is their stock in trade, their means of living. They never stay long in any one place, but traverse Greece from end to end, and have a wonderful knack in adapting their choice of songs to the character of the inhabitants of the place where they chant them. They generally prefer the simple villagers as audience to the more sophisticated townspeople, and in the towns they hang about the suburbs rather than enter into the busy streets in the centre. They know, half by experience, half by instinct, that the most ignorant part of a population is always the least questioning, and the most susceptible of impressions. The Turks stalk past these blind minstrels with the most supreme and unmoved indifference, but the Greek welcomes them affectionately, particularly at those village feasts which are called Panegyris, and which would fall as flat as Hamlet without the part of Hamlet, if there were not several blind singers present. They accompany themselves on the lyre, a five-stringed instrument played with a bow, these minstrels are divided into two sets, those who merely remember what they have learnt from others, and those who compose ballads of their own, in addition to their stores of memory. These latter, in their long and quiet walks through country which they know to be wild and grand, although they never more may see it, turn inward and recall all that they have heard that has excited their curiosity or stirred their imagination, either in the traditional history of their native land, or in the village accounts of some local hero. Some of the minstrels spread the fame of men whose deeds would have been unknown beyond the immediate mountain neighbourhood of each, from shore to shore. In fact, 
these blind beggars are the novelists and the historians of modern Greece. But if one subject should be more clear to them than another, it is always the deeds of arms of the clefts, the Adam Bells, the Klein of the Clough, or perhaps still more, the Robin Hoods of Greece. All these songs are chanted to particular airs. The poet must also be his own musician. If he can also improvise, he is a fully accomplished minstrel. There was one who lived at the end of the last century, at Ospelatria in Thessaly, under the shadow of Mount Ossa. His name was Gavayanius or John the Blind. He was extremely old, and in the exercise of his talents he had amassed considerable wealth. So at the time when the account was given, he lived at home at ease, and received the visits of those who wished to hear and were ready to pay for his songs. The Albanian soldiers of the Pasha, degenerate Greeks who served the Turk and who could find no one to chant their exploits, voluntarily or gratuitously, used to pay John the Blind to sing their fame. The higher the praise, the greater the pay. I have alluded to the Panagiris. They are feasts in honour of the patron saint of some one hamlet where the meeting is held. All the surrounding villages turning out their inhabitants to come and make merry. In short, they must bear a close resemblance of the wakes in England, for they are always held on the Sunday after the saint's day to whom the parish church is dedicated. But there are some slight differences between a Greek panagiri and English wakes. The Eastern festival is gayer, and more simple in character. The evening before a panegiri, each of the neighbouring villages comes trooping into the place of rendezvous. The people are dressed in their Sunday's best and march along to merry music. When they arrive at their destination, they make haste to pitch their tents, and those who are not rich enough to possess the necessary canvas pluck branches of trees and make themselves a leafy covering to protect themselves from the dew and the moon's beams, both of which are held in the east to be injurious to health. On the day of the feast, everyone goes to the service in church in honour of the patron saint. When they come back to their houses or tents, there is no general feast for everybody to share. Each family prepares its separate meal, the greater number in the open air, and nothing is to be seen or smelt but roasting mutton and broiling lamb. After dinner the dancing begins. Every village dances by itself and makes merry by itself until supper time. After that they pay visits to each other or listen to the blind minstrels who accompany each set of villagers. The little homers of the day find an attentive and numerous audience in the groups who sit round them in the cool of the evening, some on the soft turf crushing below them the blue hyacinth which makes the ground purple and odorous hereabouts, some on pieces of rock, all listening with unquestioning eagerness, all for the time forgetting that the Turk is their neighbour. Many ballads are composed expressly for these occasions, nor can there be a surer mode of securing their popularity. One sung for the first time at a panagiri is circulated the next day through eight or ten villages. Some of these songs are literally ballads in the old Provençal sense of the word. They are exclusively sung by the dancers as they dance. Indeed, it is a characteristic of the Greek popular poetry that it is so frequently intended to be sung while the singers are dancing. The dancing is, in fact, with them, a pretty mimicry of the emotions and movements which the song describes. Every province has its own peculiar dance and ballad, appropriate to the district from time immemorial. This custom of singing and dancing in concert seems almost to be the origin of the serious part of our modern pantomime. Of course, the dance is not a mere mimicry of the ballad sung, but the character of the dance depends on that of the song. If the latter relates to deeds of arms or feats of warriors, the movements are abrupt and decided. If it be a love song, and this description is condemned and despised by the austere mountaineers, the motions of the corresponding dance are soft and graceful. Of the former species of song, those relating to deeds of arms, the story almost invariably has a cleft for a hero. Cleft signifies freebooter, a more picturesque name than thief, 
which is, I believe, the literal translation. But we must not judge of everything by its name. To explain something of the true character of the clefts, when the Turks first conquered the Greek provinces, there were always native mountaineers who refused to acknowledge the Mussulman government and considered the Turkish possession of the lands of the Greeks, their forefathers, as nothing less than robbery. These mountain peasantry came down in armed bands upon the fertile plains and the luxurious towns, and stripped the Turks and those who had quietly submitted to their sway whenever they could. It was from those who were thus robbed that the mountaineers received the name of clefts. But our Saxon ancestors did the same to the Normans. Robin Hood was an English cleft, taking only what he thought was unjustly acquired and unfairly held. The Turks found it rather difficult to make war against these guerrillas. They fled to wild and rocky recesses of the mountains when pursued. So the wise and cautious conquerors tried to make friends, and partially succeeded. In return for certain privileges, a portion of the mountaineers organised themselves into a kind of militia called Armatolians. But there was always a rough and stern remnant who persevered in their independent and cleftic habits and in course of time many of the Armatolians, oppressed by the Turks, who no longer feared them, returned to their primitive state of hostility against the conquerors, began to pillage afresh, and resumed the name of Cleft. A front an Armatolian captain of the militia, bound to preserve order, or let him be unjustly treated by a Turk, and he instantly turned Cleft, and robbed with more zest and enjoyment than he had ever experienced in preserving the peace. So, as may easily be imagined, the clefts who were weak yesterday may be strong today, both in numbers and in intelligence, respecting the movements of the great convoys appointed to guard treasures. They lived in wild places with their arms in their hands, sometimes on the brink of absolute starvation, but rarely forgetting that they were Greeks and might only steal from the Turks. The flocks and herds of the Turks were carried off in the night, but seldom those of the Greeks, unless indeed they had made positive friends with those of the oppressors who lived among them. Sometimes an unlucky Aga would be taken prisoner by the clefts, and would have to pay a high ransom for his liberty. Again they were like Robin Hood and his merry men in the hatred they bore to the Kaloyas or monks, and these last were not slow in avenging themselves. Whenever they could, they gave information to the Turks where they might surprise a half-starved party of clefts. Sometimes the clefts, when hard-pressed by starvation and an ever-watchful enemy, would send word to a village that unless a certain sum was paid in a place specified by a particular day, all the houses should be burnt. The poor villagers were between two fires. If they gave to the clefts, the Turks took from them all their possessions. If they did not give to the clefts after such a notice, the menace was sure to be fulfilled. So, before they gave to the clefts, the warning had usually to be repeated. If they showed no sign of acquiescence after the second notice, the third and last came on a piece of paper, burnt at all the four corners, and then the poor villagers dared no longer refuse. They gave what they were asked for, the Turks took all the rest of their possessions, and they were turned empty and naked upon the world to become clefts if they liked. The clefts kept a constant watch against surprises all day long. At night their mountain paths were all but inaccessible, and they might sleep in the open air, wrapped up in goatskins on beds made of leaves. When they set out on a predatory expedition, it was always by night, the darker and the more stormy, the better for their purpose. In their mountain hiding places, they practised shooting until they acquired what they supposed to be extraordinary skill as marksmen. They had rifles of an unusual length, with which some of the most expert could hit an egg hung by a thread to a branch of a tree at a distance of two hundred paces. Others yet more skilful could send a bullet through a ring hardly larger and this gave rise to a proverbial expression for a good marksman. He can thread the ring with a bullet. 
the clefts by long practice acquired such quickness of sight that many of them could by watching from whence the flash of an enemy's musket fire proceeded pick out the man and lay him low with their rifle they called this firing upon fire besides all these exercises the clefts practised some which came down to them from the ancient greeks one of the principal of these was the game of the disc which was to be thrown he who hurled it the furthest was the conqueror the clefts were famous leapers and wonderful stories are told of them in this capacity one cleftic hero the captain nico isaras is said on good authority to have cleared seven houses standing abreast there is another anecdote on record of a man who leapt over three wagons loaded with stones to the height of seven or eight feet their feats in running were equally marvellous not to say incredible they tell of one man who literally ran so fast that his heels touched his ears fortunio's servant lightfoot was a fool to this but there is no doubt that the cleft was unrivalled in his power of making long marches they were also capable of enduring extraordinary hunger combats of three days and nights during which the clefts neither eat drank nor slept were not unusual among them according to m Fauriel, the same endurance was known in bearing the torture which surely awaited them if taken alive having their limbs crushed by repeated blows from a blacksmith's hammer was a common mode of execution there were others more rare too horrible to be mentioned no wonder that it became a favourite toast among the clefts to wish each other a sure hit from the bullets but what was most injurious to their sense of honour was the dread of having their heads after death exposed to all the insults which the turks could devise the entreaty of the wounded cleft to his comrades was to cut off his head and bear it far away to their mountain fastnesses far out of the reach of the turks thus in one of their songs the cleft says o oh, my brother cut off my head let not the turkish passers-by see my shame my enemies will wag their heads and laugh but my mother my brother will die of grief all honour attended the death of him who was slain in battle he was called a victim and the survivors mourned him with pride whereas he who died of illness on his bed was spoken of as the corps crevé and he was looked upon with a kind of shame and repugnance but the clefts in the middle of their wild and barbarous life preserved many chivalrous and noble feelings they might be simple they were not vulgar they might be fierce they were never cruel they were full of delicate honour in their treatment of their female captives even when these were the wives or daughters of those who had most deeply injured and outraged relations of their own the captain of the band of clefts who insulted a turkish woman taken prisoner was immediately killed by his own soldiers as unworthy to command brave men their songs are full of allusions to the respect with which their female prisoners are treated images of the virgin hung up in some rocky cleft made their chapel where they performed their devotions with the utmost piety some of the clefts made pilgrimages to jerusalem on foot their rifles on their backs no cleft was ever known to be a renegade whatever horrors awaited him if he refused to become a mussulman he remained true to his faith but indeed he pined away and died if he was forced to leave his wild rocks and the mountain gorges which were his home up in these homes women cooked the flesh of goats and kids roasting them whole in the open air and they had always secret friends in the fertile plains who furnished them with wine in abundance to wash down their homeric feasts mount olympus was the especial hold of the clefts and although not so high as some of the alps or the pyrenees it is uninhabitable in the winter on account of the snow the poor clefts were often obliged to descend they first hid their arms and ammunition by wrapping them well up in waxen cloths and covering them over with stones then they dispersed and sought some hospitable shelter among the ionian islanders under the protection of the venetian government 
but they never mixed themselves up with the Greek population that they had to pass through. They preserved their national dress, their proud and haughty bearing, their brilliant complexion, which made their great beauty yet more distinguished. The Greeks looked at them with admiration. These were the men who dared to defy the Turks. In each Greek cottage there hung a rude portrait of some cleftic hero, and their fame was the staple subject of all the popular songs. It was the clefts who contributed mainly to the establishment of the kingdom of Greece. The Greeks would shudder if they thought that they preserved any of the old pagan superstitions. Nevertheless, without their knowing it, much of the heathen belief is mingled with their traditional observances. They speak of their Hellenic forefathers as giants who once inhabited the country where they now dwell. These giants were as tall as the highest poplar trees, and if they fell down they died, not having power to get up again. The most terrible oath among these old pagans, according to the modern Greek tradition, was, May I fall if it was not so! Many of the superstitions derived from their ancestors are common to all nations, such as the necessity for blessing themselves if they sneezed, to prevent the entrance of an evil spirit at such times. The evil eye, the presage of death by the barking of dogs, etc., Everyone knows how famous or infamous Thessaly was in ancient times for its magicians. Thessaly is still the headquarters of witches and wizards, who, so says popular report, can draw the moon out of the heavens to do their bidding, a remnant of the old invocations to Hecate, and to turn the moon into a cow from which they draw milk that has irresistible power of enchantment. All over Greece they believe firmly in sorcery. The Hamadryads, the Nymphs, the Nereids, etc., under which names the ancient Greeks personified the different objects of nature, are gone, their very names forgotten by their descendants, who nevertheless believe that every tree and rock and fountain has its guardian genius, who takes any shape he likes, but most frequently that of a serpent or a dragon, and is always on the watch to defend the object which is put under his care, and with the existence of which his own is bound up. The plague is personified, as I think I have read is also the case in some of the country towns of Scotland. My idea is that Hugh Miller mentions it somewhere, as a blind woman going from house to house, giving death to all whom she touches. But as she can only grope along by the sides of the walls, those escape harmless who keep in the middle of the streets or the centre of rooms. This is probably a modern superstition, but again the plague is personified as the ancient fates in many places. No longer a blind woman, but as a terrible three does it come to a doomed town. One awful woman holds a roll of paper on which she writes the name of those appointed to die. Another has the shears with which she snaps the thread of life and the third carries the besom of destruction with which to sweep the dead forth from their habitations. The furies are no longer known, but everyone remembers how the attempt was made to propitiate them by calling them the Eumenides. Just as in Scotland the fairies, who stole children and performed all manner of small mischief, were called the good people. There is the same desire now shown to conciliate the smallpox, which is to this day a terrible scourge among Greek families. The smallpox is personified as a woman scowling on children, but who may be mollified by calling her and invoking her under a Greek name, which means, she who mercifully spares. The smallpox indeed is universally spoken of as eulogia, the well spoken of. She whom all are bound under pain of terrible penalties to name with respect. Some of their superstitions are a confused blending together of several ancient beliefs. For instance, it is said that round the summit of Mount Scardamilla three beautiful maidens dance perpetually. They appear at first of unearthly beauty, but they have the legs and feet of goats. Whoever draws near to that enchanted spot is first compelled to kiss them, and then is torn to pieces and thrown down from the rocks. 
This is evidently a mixture of three old beliefs, the Oreads, the Satyrs, and the Graces. Death is personified under the form of a stern old man who comes to summon the living, to leave the light of day. He is called Charon, although his office is more properly that of Mercury. He can transform himself into a bird or an animal. In fact, take any shape under which he can best surprise those who do not think enough about him. He has no power over those who are constantly remembering his existence. Such are some of the national customs and superstitions of which Monsieur Fauriel gives an account before introducing his songs to the reader's notice. The translation of the ballads into French is literal. From it we may judge of the racy and individual flavour of the ballads themselves. Abrupt, wild and dramatic are they, not unlike, in vividness of painting and quick transition from one part to another, to some of Robert Browning's smaller poems. They are full of colour. There is no description of feeling. The actions of the dramatis personae tell plainly enough how they felt. Reading any good ballad is like eating game. Almost everything else seems poor and tasteless after it. End of Modern Greek Songs by Elizabeth Gaskell Read by Phil Benson in Sydney, Australia Company Manners by Elizabeth Gaskell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Household Words, a weekly journal, conducted by Charles Dickens. Number 217, 20th of May, 1854. Victor Cousin the French philosopher, has undertaken a new task within the last few years. Whether as a relaxation from, or a continuation of, his study of metaphysics, I do not know, but he has begun to write the biographies of some of the celebrated French women of the 17th century. In making out his list, he is careful to distinguish between authoresses and femmes d'esprit, ranking the latter infinitely the higher in every point of view. The first of his series is Jacqueline Pascal, the sister of Blaise, known at Port-Royal as the sister Euphemia, a holy, pure and sainted woman. The second whom the grey philosopher has chosen as a subject for his biography is that beautiful, splendid sinner of the Pond, the fair-haired Duchess de Longueville. He draws the pure and perfect outlines of Jacqueline Pascal's character with a severe and correct pencil. He paints the lovely Duchess with the fond, admiring exaggeration of a lover. The wits of Paris, in consequence, have written the following epitaph for him. Here lies Victor Cousin, the great philosopher, in love with the Duchess de Longueville, who died a century and a half before he was born. Even the friends of this Duchess, insignificant in themselves, become dear and illustrious to Cousin for her fair sake. It is not long since he contributed an article on Madame de Sable to the Revue des Deux Mondes, which has since been published separately, and which has suggested the thoughts and fancies that I am now going to lay before the patient public. This Madame de Sable was in her prime, an habitual guest at the Hôtel Rambouillet, the superb habitation which was the centre of the witty and learned, as well as the pompous and pedantic society of Paris, in the days of Louis the Thirteenth, When these gatherings had come to an end after Madame de Rambouillet's death, and before Moliere had turned the tradition thereof into exquisite ridicule, there were several attempts to form circles that should preserve some of the stately refinement of the Hôtel Rambouillet, Mademoiselle Scudery had her Saturdays, but an authoress herself, and collecting around her merely clever people, without regard to birth or breeding. Monsieur Cousin does not hold the idea of her Saturdays in high esteem. Madame de Sable, a gentlewoman by birth, intelligent enough, doubtless from having been an associate of Ménage, Voiture, Madame de Sévigné, 
and others in the Grand Hotel, whose meetings must have been delightful enough at the time, though that wicked Moliere has stepped between us and them, and we can only see them as he chooses not to do. Madame de Sablé, friend of the resplendent, fair-haired Duchess de Longueville, had weekly meetings, which Monsieur Cousin ranks far above the more pretentious Saturdays of Mademoiselle Scudery. In short, the last page of his memoir of Madame de Sablé, where we, matter-of-fact, English people are apt to put in praise of the morals and religion of the person whose life we have been writing, is devoted to this acme of praise. Madame de Sablé had all the requisites which enabled her to tenir un salon with honour to herself and pleasure to her friends. Apart from this crowning accomplishment, the good French lady seems to have been commonplace enough. She was well-born, well-bred, and the company she kept must have made her tolerably intelligent. She was married to a dull husband, and doubtless had her small flirtations after she early became a widow. Monsieur Cousin hints at them, but they were never scandalous or prominently before the public. Past middle life, she took to the process of making her salvation and inclined to the port royalists. She was given to liking dainty things to eat, in spite of her Jansenism. She had a female friend that she quarrelled with off and on during her life, and, to wind up something like Lady O'Looney of famous memory, she knew how tenir un salon. Monsieur Cousin tells us that she was remarkable in no one thing or quality, and attributes to that single simple fact the success of her life. Now, since I have read these memoirs of Madame de Sablé, I have thought much and deeply thereupon. At first I was inclined to laugh at the extreme importance which was attached to this art of receiving company. No, that translation will not do. Holding a drawing-room is even worse, because that implies the state and reserve of royalty. Shall we call it the art of sableing? But when I thought of my experience in English society, of the evenings dreaded before they came, and sighed over in recollection, because they were so ineffably dull, I saw that to sable well did require, as Monsieur Cousin implied, the union of many excellent qualities and not to be disputed little graces. I asked some French people if they could give me the recipe, for it seemed most likely to be traditional, if not still extant in the nation. I offer to you their ideas, fragmentary though they be, and then I will tell you some of my own, and last, perhaps, with the addition of yours, O oh, most worthy readers, we may discover the lost art of sableing. Said the French lady, a woman to be successful in sableing must be past youth, yet not past the power of attracting. She must do this by her sweet and gracious manners and quick ready tact in perceiving those who have not had their share of attention or leading the conversation away from any subject which may give pain to any one present. Those rules hold good in England, said I. My friend went on. She should never be prominent in anything. She should keep silence as long as anyone else will talk. But when conversation flags, she should throw herself into the breach with the same spirit with which I notice that the young ladies of the house, where a ball is given, stand quietly by till the dancers are tired, and then spring into the arena to carry on the spirits and the music till the others are ready to begin again. But, said the French gentleman, even at this time, when subjects for conversation are wanted, she should rather suggest than enlarge, ask questions rather than give her own opinions. To be sure, said the lady, Madame Recamier, whose salons were the most perfect of this century, always withheld her opinions on books or men or measures until all around her had given theirs. Then she, as it were, collected and harmonised them, saying a kind thing here and a gentle thing there, and speaking ever with her own quiet sense, till people the most opposed learnt to understand each other's point of view, which it is a great thing for opponents to do. 
Then the number of people whom you receive is another consideration. I should say not less than twelve, nor more than twenty, continued the gentleman. The evenings should be appointed, say weekly, fortnightly, at the beginning of January, which is our season. Fix an early hour for opening the room. People are caught then in their freshness, before they become exhausted by other parties. The lady spoke. For my part, I prefer catching my friends after they have left the grander balls or receptions. One hears then the remarks, the wits, the reason, and the satire which they had been storing up during their evening of imposed silence or of ceremonious speaking. A little good-humoured satire is a very agreeable source, replied the gentleman, but it must be good-humoured, and the listeners must be good-humoured. Above all, the conversation must be general, and not the chat-chat-chat up in a corner by which the English so often distinguish themselves. You do not go into society to exchange secrets with your intimate friends. You go to render yourselves agreeable to everyone present, and to help all to pass a happy evening. Strangers should not be admitted, said the lady, taking up the strain. They would not start fair with the others. They would be ignorant of the illusions that refer to conversations on the previous evenings. They would not understand the, what shall I call it, slang. I mean those expressions having relation to past occurrences or bygone witticisms common to all those who are in the habit of meeting. Madame de Duras and Madame Racamier never made advances to any stranger. Their saloons were the best that Paris has known in this generation. All who wished to be admitted had to wait and prove their fitness by being agreeable elsewhere, to earn their diploma, as it were, among the circles of these ladies' acquaintances, and at last it was a high favour to be received by them. They missed the society of many celebrities by adhering so strictly to this unspoken rule, said the gentleman. Bah, said the lady, celebrities, what has one to do with them in society? As celebrities, they are simply bores. Because a man has discovered a planet, it does not follow that he can converse agreeably, even on his own subjects. Often people are drained dry by one action or expression of their lives drain dry for all the purposes of a salon. The writer of books, for instance, cannot afford to talk twenty pages for nothing, so he is either profoundly silent, or else he gives you the mere rinsings of his mind. I am speaking now of him as a mere celebrity, and justifying the wisdom of the ladies we were speaking of in not seeking after such people, indeed, in being rather shy of them. Some of their friends were the most celebrated people of their day, but they were received in their old capacity of agreeable men, a higher character by far. Then, said she, turning to me, I believe that you English spoil the perfection of conversation by having your rooms as brilliantly lighted for an evening, the charm of which depends on what one hears. As for an evening when youth and beauty are to display themselves among flowers and festoons, and every kind of pretty ornament. I would never have a room affect people as being dark on their first entrance into it, but there is a kind of moonlight as compared to sunlight, in which people talk more freely and naturally, where shy people will enter upon a conversation without dread of every change of colour or involuntary movement being seen, just as we are always more confidential over a fire than anywhere else, as women talk most openly in the dimly lighted bedroom at curling time. Away with your shy people, said the gentleman. Persons who are self-conscious, thinking of an involuntary redness or paleness, an unbecoming movement of the countenance, more than the subject of which they are talking, should not go into society at all. But because women are so much more liable to this nervous weakness than men, the preponderance of people in a salon should always be on the side of the men. I do not think I gained more hints as to the lost art from my French friends. Let us see if my own experience in England can furnish any more ideas. First, let us take the preparations to be made, 
before our house, our room, or our lodgings can be made to receive society. Of course, I am not meaning the preparations needed for dancing or musical evenings. I am taking those parties which have pleasant conversation and happy social intercourse for their affirmed intention. They may be dinners, suppers, tea, I don't care what they are called, provided their end is defined. If your friends have not dined and it suits you to give them a dinner, in the name of Lucullus, let them dine. But take care that there shall be something besides the mere food and wine to make their fattening agreeable at the time and pleasant to remember. Otherwise you had better pack up for each his portions of the dainty dish and send it separately in hot water trays so that he can eat comfortably behind a door like Sancho Panza and have done with it. And yet I don't see why we should be like ascetics. I fancy there is a grace of preparation, a sort of festive trumpet call that is right and proper to distinguish the day on which we receive our friends from common days unmarked by such white stones. The thought and care we take for them to set before them of our best may imply some self-denial on our less fortunate days. I have been in houses where all, from the scullion made upward, worked double tides, gladly, because master's friends were coming, and everything must be nice and good, and all the rooms must look bright and clean and pretty. And, as a merry heart goes all the way, preparations made in this welcoming, hospitable spirit never seem to tire anyone half so much as where servants instinctively feel that it has been said in the parlour, we must have so-and-so, or, oh dear, we have never had the so-and-sos. Yes, I like a little pomp and luxury and stateliness to mark our happy days of receiving friends as a festival, but I do not think I would throw my power of procuring luxuries solely into the eating and drinking line. My friends would probably be surprised, some wear caps and some wigs, if I provided them with garlands of flowers after the manner of the ancient Greeks. But put flowers on the table, none of your shams, wax or otherwise. I prefer an honest wayside root of primroses in a common vase of white ware to the grandest bunch of stiff rustling artificial rarities in a silver epine. Flower or two by the side of each person's plate would not be out of the way as to expense and would be a very agreeable pretty piece of mute welcome. Cooks and scullion maids acting in the sympathetic spirit I have described would do their very best from boiling the potatoes well to sending in all the dishes in the best possible order. I think I would have every imaginary dinner sent up on the original Mr. Walker's plan each dish separately, hot and hot. I have an idea that when I go to live in Utopia, not before next Christmas, I will have a kind of hot water sideboard, such as I think I have seen in great houses, and that nothing shall appear on the table but what is pleasant to the eye. However simple the food, I would do it and my friends, and may I not add the giver, the respect of presenting it at table as well cooked, as eatable, as wholesome as my poor means allowed, and to this end, rather than to a variety of dishes, would I direct my care. We have no associations with beef and mutton. Geese may remind us of the capital, and peacocks of Juno, a pigeon pie of the simplicity of Venus's doves. But who thinks of the leafy covert which has been her home in life when she sees a roasted hare? Now flowers as an ornament do lead our thoughts away from their present beauty and fragrance. I am almost sure Madame de Sablé had flowers in her salon, and as she was fond of dainties herself, I can fancy her smooth benevolence of character taking delight in some personal preparations made in the morning for the anticipated friends of the evening. I can fancy her stewing sweetbreads in a silver saucepan or dressing salad with her delicate, plump white hands. Not that I ever saw a silver saucepan. I was formerly ignorant enough to think that they were only used in the sleeping beauty's kitchen, or in the preparations for the marriage of Riquet with the tuft. But I have been assured 
that there are such things, and that they impart a most delicate flavour, or no flavour, to the victuals cooked therein. So I assert again, Madame de Sable cooked sweetbreads for her friends, in a silver saucepan, but never to fatigue herself with those previous labours. She knew the true taste of her friends too well. They cared for her, firstly, as an element in their agreeable evening, the silver saucepan in which they were all to meet, the oil in which their several ingredients were to be softened of what was harsh or discordant. Very secondary would be their interest in her sweetbreads. Have sweetbreads they'll get money in in, have sable ne'er and either. But part of my care beforehand should go to the homely article of waiting. I should not mind having none at all, a dumb waiter, pepper, salt, bread and condiments within the reach or by the side of all. Little kindly attentions from one guest to another tend to take off the selfish character of the mere act of eating, and besides, the guests would, or should, be too well educated, too delicate of tact, to interrupt a burst of wit or feeling or eloquence, as a mere footman often does with the perpetual Sherry or Madeira, or with the names of those mysterious entome that always remind me of a white kid glove that I once ate with Vseshamel sauce, and found very tender and good under the name of Oreille de Vaux à la something, but which experiment I never wish to repeat. There is something graceful and kindly in the little attention by which one guest silently puts by his neighbour all that he may require. I consider it a better opening to ultimate friendship if my unknown neighbour mutely passes me the salt or silently understands that I like sugar to my soup than if he had been introduced by his full name and title and labelled with the one distinguishing action or book of his life after the manner of some who are rather showmen than hosts. But to return to the subject of waiting, I have always believed that the charm of those little suppers, famous from time immemorial as the delightful P.S. to operas, was that there was no formal waiting or over-careful arrangement of the table. A certain sweet neglect pervaded all, very compatible with true elegance. The perfection of waiting is named in the story of the white cat. If you remember, the hero prince is waited upon by hands without bodies as he sits at table with the white cat and is served with that delicate fricassee of mice. By hands without bodies, I am very far from meaning hands without heads. Some people prefer female waiters, footwomen as it were. I have weighed both sides of the subject well in my mind before setting down to write this paper, and my verdict goes in favour of men. For all other things being equal, their superior strength gives them the power of doing things without effort, and consequently with less noise than any woman. The quiet ease and solemn soundless movement of some men servants is wonderful to watch. Last summer I was staying in a house served by such list-shod, softly-spoken, velvet-handed domestics. One day the butler touched a spoon with a fork. The master of the house looked at him, as Jupiter may have looked at Hebe, when she made that clumsy step. No noise, sir, if you please. And we as well as the servant were hushed into the solemn stillness of the room, and were graced and genteel, if not merry and sociable. Still, bursts and clashes and clatters at the side-table do disturb conversation, and I maintain that for avoiding these, men-servants are better than women. Women have to add an effort to the natural exercise of what strength they possess before they can lift heavy things. Sirloins of beef, saddles of mutton and the like, and they cannot calculate the additional force of such an effort, so down comes the dish and the mutton and all, with a sound and a splash that surprises us even more than the Phyllis, who is neat-handed only when she has to do with things that require delicacy and lightness of touch, not struggle of arm. And, now I think of it, Mademoiselle de Sablé must have taken the white cat for her model, 
There must evidently have been the same noiseless ease and grace about the movements of both. The same purring, happy, inarticulate murmurs of satisfaction, when surrounded by pleasant circumstances, must have been uttered by both. My own mouth has watered before now at the account of that fricasse of mice, prepared especially for the white cat, and Monsieur Cousin alludes more than once to Madame de Sablé's love for friandises. Madame de Sablé avoided the society of literary women, and so I am sure did the white cat. Both had an instinctive sense of what was comfortable. Both loved home with tenacious affection, and yet I am mistaken if each had not their own little private love of adventure, touches of the gypsy. The reason why I think Madame de Sable had this touch in her is because she knew how to near un salon. You do not see the connection between gypsyism and the art of being a good hostess, of receiving pleasantly. I do, but I am not sure if I can explain it. In the first place, gypsies must be people of quick impulse and ready wit, entering into fresh ideas and new modes of life with joyous ardour and energy and fertile in expedients for extricating themselves from the various difficulties into which their wandering life leads them. They must have a lofty disregard for convenance, and yet a power of graceful adaptation. They evidently have a vivid sense of the picturesque, and a love of adventure, which, if it does not show itself in action, must show itself in sympathy with others' doings. Now which of these qualities would be out of place in Madame de Sablé? From what we read of the life of her contemporary, Madame de Sévigné, we see that impromptu expedients were necessary in those times, when the thought of the morning made the pleasure of the evening, and when people snatched their enjoyments from hand to mouth as it were, while yet six weeks' invitations were not. Now I have noticed that in some parties, where we were all precise and sensible, ice-bound under some indefinable stiff restraint, some little domestic contretemps, if frankly acknowledged by the hostess, has suddenly unloosed tongues and hearts in a supernatural manner. The upper air bursts into life, more especially if some unusual expedient had to be resorted to, giving the whole the flavour and zest of a picnic. Toasting bread in a drawing-room, coaxing up a half-extinguished fire by dint of brown sugar, newspapers and pretty good-for-nothing bellows, turning a packing-case upside down for a seat, and covering in with a stray piece of velvet. These are, I'm afraid, the only things that can call upon us for unexpected exertion, now that all is arranged and rearranged for every party a month beforehand but I have lived in other times and other places. I have been in the very heart and depths of Wales, within three miles of the house of the high sheriff of the county, who was giving a state dinner on a certain day, to which the gentleman with whom I was staying was invited. He was on the point of leaving his house in his little Norwegian cariol, and we were on the point of sitting down to dinner, when a man rode up in hot haste, a servant from the high sheriff's came to beg for our joint off the spit. Fish, game, poultry, they had all the delicacies of their own land, but the butcher from the nearest market town had failed them, and at the last moment they had to send off a groom, a begging to their neighbours. My relation departed ignorant of our dinnerless state, but he came back in great delight with his party. After the soup and fish had been removed, There had been a long pause, the joint had got cold on its ride, and had to be re-warmed. A message was brought to the host, who had immediately confided his perplexity to his guests, and put it to the vote whether they would wait for the joint or have the order of the courses changed, and eat the third before the second. Everyone had enjoyed the merry dilemma. The ice was broken, and all went on pleasantly and easily in a party where there was rather a heterogeneous mixture of politics and opinions. Dinner parties in those days and in that part of Wales were somewhat regulated by the arrival of the little sailing vessels, 
which having discharged their cargo at Bristol or Liverpool, brought back commissioned purchases for the different families. A chest of oranges for Mr. Williams or Mr. Wynne was a sure signal that before many days were over, Mr. Williams or Mr. Wynne would give a dinner party, strike while the iron was hot, eat while the oranges were fresh. A man rode round to all the different houses when any farmer planned such a mighty event as killing a cow to ask what part each family would take. Visiting acquaintances lived ten or twelve miles from each other, separated by bad and hilly roads. The moon had always to be consulted before issuing invitations, and then the mode of proceeding was usually something like this. The invited friends came to dinner at half-past five or six. These were always those from the greatest distance. The nearer neighbours came later on in the evening. After the gentleman had left the dining-room, it was cleared for dancing. The fragments of the dinner, prepared by ready cooks, served for supper. Tea was ready sometimes towards one or two and the dancers went merrily on till a seven or eight o'clock breakfast, after which they rode or drove home by broad daylight. I was never at one of these meetings, although staying in a house from which many went. I was considered too young, but from what I heard, they were really excessively pleasant, sociable gatherings, although not quite entitled to be classed with Madame de Sablé's salons. To return to the fact that a slightly gypsy and impromptu character, either in the hostess or in the arrangements, or in the amusements, adds a piquancy to the charm, let anyone remember the agreeable private teas that go on in many houses about five o'clock. I remember those in one house particularly as remarkably illustrating what I am trying to prove. These teas were held in a large dismantled schoolroom, and a superannuated schoolroom is usually the most doleful chamber imaginable. I never saw this by full daylight. I only know that it was lofty and large, that we went to it through a long gallery library through which we never passed at any other time, the schoolroom having been accessible to the children in former days by a private staircase, that great branches of trees swept against the windows with a long plaintive moan as if tortured by the wind, that below in the stable-yard two Irish staghounds sent up their musical bays to mingle with the outlandish Spanish, which a parrot in the room continually talked out of the darkness in which its perch was placed, that the walls of the room seemed to recede as in a dream, and, instead of them, the flickering firelights painted tropical forests or Norwegian fjords, according to the will of our talkers. I know this tea was nominally private to the ladies, but that all the gentlemen strayed in most punctually by accident, that the fire was always in that state when somebody had to poke with the hard blows of despair, and somebody else to fetch in logs of wood from the basket outside, and somebody else to unload his pockets of fur bobs, which last were always efficacious, and threw beautiful dancing lights far and wide. And then there was a black kettle, long ago too old for kitchen use, that leaked and ran and sputtered against the blue and sulphur-coloured flames, and did everything that was improper, but the water out of which made the best tea in the world, which we drank out of unmatched cups, the relics of several schoolroom sets. We ate thick bread and butter in the darkness, with a vigour of appetite which had quite disappeared at the well-lighted eight o'clock dinner. Who ate it I don't know, for we stole from our places round the fireside to the tea-table, in comparative darkness, in the twilight near the window, and helped ourselves, and came back on tiptoe, to hear one of the party tell of wild enchanted spicy islands in the eastern archipelago or buried cities in farthest Mexico. He used to look into the fire and draw and paint with words, in a manner perfectly marvellous, and with an art which he had quite lost at the formal dinner time. Our host was scientific, a name of high repute. He too told us of wonderful discoveries, 
strange surmises, glimpses into something far away and utterly dreamlike. His son had been in Norway, fishing. Then, when he sat all splashed with hunting, he too could tell of adventurers in a natural racy way. The girls, busy with their heavy kettle and with their tea-making, put in a joyous word now and then. At dinner the host talked of nothing more intelligible than French mathematics. The air drawled out an infinite deal of nothing about the Shakespeare and musical glasses of the day. The traveller gave us latitudes and longitudes and rates of population, exports and imports with the greatest precision, and the girls were as pretty, helpless, inane, fine ladies as you would wish to see. Speaking of wood fires reminds me of Madame de Sable's fires. Of course they were of wood, being in Paris, but I believe that even if she had lived in a coal country, she would have burned wood by instinctive preference, as a lady I once knew always ordered a lump of cannel coal to be brought up if ever her friends seemed silent and dull. A wood fire has a kind of spiritual dancing, glancing life about it. It is an elvish companion, crackling, hissing, bubbling, throwing out beautiful jets of vivid, many-coloured flame. The best wood fires I know are those at Keswick. Making lead pencils is the business of the place, and the cedar chips for scent, and the thinnings of the larch and fir plantations thereabouts for warm and brilliant light, make such a fire as Madame de Sable would have delighted in. Depend upon it too. Every seat in her salon was easy and comfortable of its kind. They might not be made of any rare kind of wood, nor covered very magnificently, but the bodies of her friends could rest and repose in them in easy, unconstrained attitudes. No one can be agreeable perched on a chair which does not afford space for proper support. I defy the most accomplished professional wit to go on uttering mo in a chair with a stiff, hard, upright back, or with his legs miserably dangling. No, Madame de Sable's seats were commodious, and probably varied to suit all tastes. Nor was there anything in the shape of a large and cumbrous article of furniture placed right in the middle of her room, so as to prevent her visitors from changing their places, or drawing near to each other or to the fire, if they so willed it. I imagine likewise that she had that placid, kindly manner which would never show any loss of self-possession. I fancy that there was a welcome ready for all, even though some came a little earlier than they were expected. I was once very much struck by the perfect breeding of an old Welsh herb woman with whom I drank tea, a tea which was not tea after all, an infusion of balm and black currant leaves, with a pinch of lime blossom to give it a pico flavour. She had boasted of the delicacy of this beverage to me on the previous day, and I had begged to be allowed to come and drink a cup with her. The only drawback was that she had but one cup, but she immediately bethought her that she had two saucers, one of which would do just as well, indeed, better than any cup, I was anxious to be in time, and so I was too early. She had not done dusting and rubbing when I arrived, but she made no fuss. She was glad to see me, and quietly bade me welcome, though I had come before all was as she could have wished. She gave me a dusted chair, sat down herself with her kilted petticoats and working apron, and talked to me as if she had not a care or a thought on her mind, but the enjoyment of the present time. By and by, in moving about the room, she slipped behind the bed curtain, still conversing. I heard the splash of water, and a drawer open and shut, and then my hostess emerged, spruce and clean and graced, but not one whit more agreeable, or at her ease than she had been for the previous half-hour in her working dress. There are a set of people who put on their agreeableness with their gowns. Here again I have studied the subject, and the result is that I find people of this description 
are more pleasant in society in their second best than in their very best dresses. These last are new, and the persons I am speaking of never feel thoroughly at home in them, never lose their consciousness of unusual finery until the first stain has been made. With their best gowns they put on an unusual fineness of language. They say commence instead of begin, they inquire if they may assist, instead of asking you if they may help you to anything. And yet there are some, very far from vain or self-conscious, who are never so agreeable as when they have a dim, half-defined idea that they are looking their best, not in finery, but in air, arrangement, or complexion. I have a notion that Madame de Sablé, with her fine instincts, was aware of this, and that there were one or two secrets about the furniture and disposition of light in her salon, which are lost in these degenerate days. I heard or read lately that we make a great mistake in furnishing our reception rooms with all the light and delicate colours, the profusion of ornaments and flecked and spotted chintzes. If we wish to show off the human face and figure that our ancestors and the great painters knew better with their somewhat sombre and heavy-tinted backgrounds, relieving or throwing out into full relief the rounded figure and the delicate peach-like complexion. I fancy Madame de Sable's salon was furnished with deep warm soberness of tone, lightened up by flowers and happy animated people, in a brilliancy of dress which would be lost nowadays against our satin walls and flower-bestrewn carpets and gilding, gilding everywhere. Then, somehow, conversation must have flown naturally into sense or nonsense, as the case might be. People must have gone to her house well prepared for either lot. It might be that wit would come uppermost, sparkling, crackling, leaping, calling out echoes all around. Or the same people might talk with all their might and wisdom on some grave and important subject of the day in that manner which we have got into the way of calling earnest, but which term has struck me as being slightly flavoured by Kant ever since I heard of an earnest uncle. At any rate, whether grave or gay, people did not go up to Madame de Sable's salons with the set purpose of being either the one or the other. They were carried away by the subject of the conversation, by the humour of the moment, I have visited a good deal among a set of people who piqued themselves on being rational. We have talked what they called sense, but what I called platitudes, till I have longed, like Southey and the doctor, to come out with some interminable nonsensical word. Abbali boggy booga noribo was his, I think. As a relief for my despair at not being able to think of anything more that was sensible, it would have done me good to have said it, and I could have started afresh on the rational tack. But I never did. I sank into inane silence, which I hope was taken for wisdom. One of this set paid a relation of mine a profound compliment, for so she meant it to be. Oh, Miss F., you are so trite. But, as it is not in everyone's power to be rational and trite, at all times and in all places, discharging our sense at a given place, like water from a fireman's hose. And as some of us are cisterns rather than fountains, and may have our stores exhausted, why is it not more general to call in other aids to conversation, in order to enable us to pass an agreeable evening? But I will come back to this presently. Only let me say that there is but one thing more tiresome than an evening when everybody tries to be profound and sensible, and that is an evening when everybody tries to be witty. I have a disagreeable sense of effort and unnaturalness at both times. But the everlasting attempt, even when it succeeds to be clever and amusing, is the worse of the two. People try to say brilliant rather than true things. They not only catch eager hold of the superficial and ridiculous in other persons and in events generally, but, from constantly looking out for subjects for jokes and mo and satire, 
they become possessed of a kind of sore susceptibility themselves, and are afraid of their own working selves, and dare not give way to any expression of feeling, or any noble indignation or enthusiasm. This kind of wearying wit is far different from humour, which wells up and forces its way out, irrepressibly, and calls forth smiles and laughter, but not very far apart from tears. Depend upon it, some of Madame de Sablé's friends had been moved in a most abundant and genial measure. They knew how to narrate, too. Very simple, say you. I say no. I believe the art of telling a story is born with some people, and these have it to perfection. But all might acquire some expertness in it, and ought to do so before launching out into the muddled complex, hesitating, broken, disjointed, poor, bald accounts of events which have neither unity nor colour, nor life nor end in them, that one sometimes hears. But as to the rational parties that are in truth so irrational, when all talk up to an assumed character, instead of showing themselves what they really are, and so extending each other's knowledge of the infinite and beautiful capacities of human nature. Whenever I see the grave, sedate faces with their good but anxious expression, I remember how I was long ago at a party like this. Everyone had brought out his or her wisdom, and aired it for the good of the company. One or two had, from a sense of duty, and without any special living interest in the matter, improved us by telling us of some new scientific discovery, the details of which were all and each of them wrong, as I learnt afterwards. If they had been right, we should not have been any the wiser, and just at the pitch when any more useful information might have brought on congestion of the brain, a stranger to the town, a beautiful, audacious, but most feminine romp, proposed a game, and such a game for us wise men of Gotham. But she, now long still and quiet after her bright life, so full of pretty pranks, was a creature whom all who looked on loved, and with grave hesitating astonishment we knelt round a circular table at her word of command. She made one of the circle, and producing a feather out of some sofa pillow, she told us she should blow it up into the air, and whichever of us it floated near must puff away to keep it from falling on the table. I suspect that we all looked like Keeley in the camp at Chobham, and were surprised at our own obedience to this ridiculous, senseless mandate, given with a graceful imperiousness, as if it were too royal to be disputed. We knelt on, puffing away with the utmost intenseness, looking like a set of elderly fools, No, my dear sir, I was going to say elderly cherubim, but making fools of ourselves was better than making owls, as we had been doing. I will mention another party, where a game of some kind would have been a blessing. It was at a very respectable tradesman's house. We went at half-past four and found a well-warmed handsome sitting-room with block upon block of unburnt coal behind the fire. On the table there was a tray with wine and cake, oranges and almonds and raisins, of which we were urged to partake. In half an hour came tea. None of your flimsy meals with wafer bread and butter and three biscuits and a half. This was a grave and serious proceeding. Tea, coffee, bread of all kinds, cold fowl, tongue, ham, potted meats, I don't know what. Tea lasted about an hour, and then the cake and wine tray was restored to its former place. The stock of subjects of common interest was getting low, and in spite of our good will, long stretches of silence occurred, producing a stillness which made our host nervously attack the fire and stir it up to a yet greater glow of intense heat. And the hostess invariably rose at such times and urged us to eat another macaroon. The first I revelled in, the second I enjoyed, the third I got through, the fourth I sighed over, 
the fifth reminded me uncomfortably of that part of Stern's sentimental journey where he feeds a donkey with macaroons. And when, at the sight of the sixth, I rose to come away, a burst of imploring, indignant surprise greeted me. You are surely never going before supper. I stopped. I ate that supper. Hot jugged hare, hot roast turkey, hot boiled ham, hot apple tart, hot toasted cheese. No wonder I am old before my time. Now these good people were really striving and taking pains and laying out money to make the evening pass agreeably, but the only way they could think of to amuse their guests was giving them plenty to eat. If they had asked one of their children, they could doubtless have suggested half a dozen games which we could all have played at when our subjects of common interest failed, and which would have carried us over the evening quietly and simply, if not brilliantly. But in many a small assemblage of people, where the persons collected are incongruous, where talking cannot go on through so many hours without becoming flat or laboured, why have we not often a recourse to games of some kind? Wit, advice, bourrime, lights, Spanish merchant, twenty questions. Everyone knows these, and many more, if they would only think it's beneath them to be called upon by a despairing hostess to play at them. Of course, to play them well requires a little more exertion of intellect and quoting other people's sense and wisdom or misquoting science. But I do not think it takes as much thought and memory and consideration as it does to be up in the science of good eating and drinking. A profound knowledge of this branch of learning seems in general to have absorbed all the faculties before it could be brought to anything like perfection. So, I do not consider games as entailing so much mental fatigue as a man must undergo before he is qualified to decide upon dishes. I once noticed the worn and anxious look of a famous diner out when called upon by his no less anxious host to decide upon the merits of a salad mixed by no hands, as you may guess, but those of the host in question. The guest, doctor of the art of good living, tasted, paused, tasted again, and then, with gentle solemnity, gave forth his condemnatory opinion. I happened to be his next neighbour, and slowly turning his meditative, full moon face round to me, he gave me the valuable information that to eat a salad in perfection, someone should be racing from lettuce to shallot, from shallot to endive, and so on, all the time that soup and fish were being eaten, that the vegetables should be gathered, washed, sliced, blended, eaten, all in a quarter of an hour. I bowed as in the presence of a master, and felt no wonder his head was bald and his face heavily wrinkled. I have said nothing of books, yet I am sure that if Madame de Sable lived now, they would be seen in her salon as a part of its natural, indispensable furniture, not brought out and strewed here and there when company was coming, but as habitual presences in her room, wanting which she would want a sense of warmth and comfort and companionship. Putting out books as a sort of preparation for an evening, as a means for making it pass agreeably, is running a great risk. In the first place, Books are chosen by such people, and on such occasions, chosen more for their outside than their inside, and in the next they are the mere material with which wisdom or wit builds. And if persons don't know how to use the material, they will suggest nothing. I imagine Madame de Sable would have the volumes she herself was reading, or those which, being new, contained any matter of present interest left about as they would naturally be. I could also fancy that her guests would not feel bound to talk continually, whether they had anything to say or not, but that there might be pauses of not unpleasant silence, a quiet darkness out of which they might be certain that the little stars would glimmer soon. I can believe that in such pauses of repose, 
someone might open a book, and catching on a suggestive sentence, might dash off again into the full flow of conversation. But I cannot fancy any grand preparations for what was to be said among people, each of whom brought the best dish in bringing himself, and whose own store of living, individual thought and feeling and mother wit, would be infinitely better than any cut-and-dry determination to devote the evening to mutual improvement. If people are really good and wise, their goodness and their wisdom flow out unconsciously and benefits like sunlight. So, books for reference, books for impromptu suggestion, but never books to serve for text to a lecture. Engravings fall under something like the same rules. To some they say everything, to ignorant and unprepared minds, nothing. I remember noticing this in watching how people looked at a very valuable portfolio belonging to an acquaintance of mine, which contained engraved and authentic portraits of almost every possible person, from king and kaiser down to notorious beggars and criminals including all the celebrated men, women and actors whose likenesses could be obtained. To some, this portfolio gave food for observation, meditation and conversation. It brought them every kind of human tragedy, every variety of scenery and costume and grouping in the background, thronged with figures, called up by their imagination. Others took them up and laid them down, simply saying, This is a pretty face. Oh, what a pair of eyebrows. Look at this queer dress. Yet, after all, having something to take up and to look at is a relief and of use to persons who, without being self-conscious, are nervous from not being accustomed to society. Oh, Cassandra, remember when you, with your rich gold coins of thought, with your noble power of choice expression, were set down and were thankful to be set down, to look at some paltry engravings, just because people did not know how to get at your oar, and you did not care a button whether they did or not, and were rather bored by their attempts, the end of which you never found out, while I, with my rattling, tinselly rubbish, was thought to be agreeable and an acquisition. You would have been valued at Madame de Sable's, where the sympathetic and intellectual stream of conversation would have borne you and your golden fragments away with it, by its soft, resistless, gentle force. End of Company Manners by Elizabeth Gaskell Read by Phil Benson in Sydney, Australia An Accursed Race by Elizabeth Gaskell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Household Words, a weekly journal, conducted by Charles Dickens. Number 282, Saturday, August 25th, 1855. We have our prejudices in England, or, if that assertion offends any of my readers, I will modify it. We have had our prejudices in England. We have tortured Jews, we have burnt Catholics and Protestants, to say nothing of a few witches and wizards. We have satirised Puritans, and we have dressed up guys, but after all, I do not think we have been so bad as our continental friends. To be sure, our insular position has kept us free, to a certain degree, from the inroads of alien races, who, driven from one land of refuge, steal into another equally unwilling to receive them, and where, for long centuries, their presence is barely endured, and no pains is taken to conceal the repugnance which the natives of pure blood experience towards them. There yet remains a remnant of the miserable people called Cagos in the valleys of the Pyrenees, in the Londe near Bordeaux, and, stretching up on the west side of France, their numbers become larger in Lower Brittany. 
Even now, the origin of these families is a word of shame to them among their neighbours. Although they are protected by law, which confirmed them in the equal rights of citizens about the end of the last century. Before then, they had lived, for hundreds of years, isolated from all those who boasted of pure blood, and they had been, all this time, oppressed by cruel local edicts. They were truly what they were popularly called, the accursed race. All distinct traces of their origin are lost. Even at the close of that period which we call the Middle Ages, this was a problem which no one could solve, and as the traces, which even then were faint and uncertain, have vanished away one by one, it is a complete mystery at the present day why they were accursed in the first instance, why isolated from their kind, no one knows. From the earliest accounts of their states that are yet remaining to us, it seems that the names which they gave each other were ignored by the population they lived amongst, who spoke of them as Crestia or Cago, just as we speak of animals by their generic names. Their houses or huts were always placed at some distance out of the villages of the country folk, who unwillingly called in the services of the Cagos as carpenters or tilers or slaters, trades which seemed appropriated by this unfortunate race who were forbidden to occupy land or to bear arms, the usual occupations of those times. They had some small right of pasturage on the common lands and in the forests, but the number of their cattle and livestock was strictly limited by the earliest laws relating to the Cagos. They were forbidden by one act to have more than twenty sheep, a pig, a ram and six geese. The pig was to be fattened and brilled for winter food. The fleece of the sheep was to clothe them, but if the said sheep had lambs, they were forbidden to eat them. Their only privilege arising from this increase was that they might choose out the strongest and finest in preference to keeping the old sheep. At Martin Mass, the authorities of the commune came round and counted over the stock of each cago. If he had more than his appointed number, they were forfeited. Half went to the commune and half to the bailey, or chief magistrate of the commune. The poor beasts were limited as to the amount of common land which they might stray over in search of grass. While the cattle of the inhabitants of the commune might wander hither and thither in search of the sweetest herbage, the deepest shade or the coolest pool in which to stand on the hot days and lazily switch their dappled sides, the cago sheep and pig had to learn imaginary bounds beyond which, if they strayed, any one might snap them up and kill them, reserving a part of the flesh for his own use, but graciously restoring the inferior parts to their original owner. Any damage done by the sheep was, however, fairly appraised, and the cago paid no more for it than any other man would have done. Did a cago leave his poor cabin and venture into the towns, even to render services required of him in the way of his trade, he was bidden by all the municipal laws to stand by and remember his rude old state. In all the towns and villages in the large districts extending on both sides of the Pyrenees, in all that part of Spain, they were forbidden to buy or sell anything eatable, to walk in the middle, esteemed the better part of the streets, to come within the gates before sunrise, or to be found after sunset within the walls of the town. But still, as the cago were good-looking men, and, although they bore certain natural marks of their caste, of which I shall speak by and by, were not easily distinguished by casual passers-by from other men, they were compelled to wear some distinctive peculiarity which should arrest the eye, and in the greater number of towns it was decreed that the outward sign of a cago should be a piece of red cloth sewed conspicuously on the front of his dress. In other towns the mark of cagotteri was the foot of a duck or a goose hung over their left shoulder so as to be seen by any one meeting them. After a time the more convenient badge of a piece of yellow cloth cut out in the shape of a duck's foot was adopted. If any cago was found in any town or village without his badge, he had to pay a fine of five sous and to lose his dress. 
he was expected to shrink away from any passer-by, for fear that their clothes should touch each other, or else to stand still in some corner or by-place. If they were thirsty during the day which they passed in these towns where their presence was barely suffered, they had no means of quenching their thirst, for they were forbidden to enter into the little cabarets or taverns. Even the water gushing out of the common fountain was prohibited to them. Far away, in their own squalid village, there was the Cago fountain, and to drink of any other water was forbidden to the Cagoteri. A Cago woman, having to make purchases in the town, was liable to be flogged out of it, if she went to buy anything except on a Monday, a day on which all other people who could kept their houses for fear of coming into contact with the accursed race. In the Pay Basque, the prejudices, and for some time the laws, ran stronger against the Cago than any which I have hitherto mentioned. The Basque Cago was not allowed to possess sheep. He might keep a pig for provision, but his pig had no right of pasturage. He might cut and carry grass for the ass, which was the only other animal he was permitted to own, and this ass was permitted because its existence was rather an advantage to the oppressor, who constantly availed themselves of the cago's mechanical skill, and was glad to have him and his tools easily conveyed from one place to another. They were repulsed by the state. Under the small local governments, they could hold no post whatsoever, and they were barely tolerated by the church, although they were good Catholics and zealous frequenters of the Mass. They might only enter the churches by a small door set apart from them, through which no one of the pure race ever passed. This door was low, so as to compel them to make an obeisance. It was occasionally surrounded by sculpture, which invariably represented an oak branch with a dove above it. When they were once in, they might not go to the holy water used by others. They had a benitier of their own. Nor were they allowed to share in the consecrated bread when that was handed round to the believers of the pure race. The cagots stood afar off near the door. There were certain boundaries, imaginary lines, on the nave and in the aisles, which they might not pass. In one or two of the more tolerant of the Pyrenean villages, the blessed bread was offered to the cagos, the priests standing on one side of the boundary and giving the pieces of bread on a long wooden fork to each person successively. When the cago died, he was interred apart in a plot of burying ground on the north side of the cemetery. Under such laws and prescriptions as I have described, it is no wonder if he was generally too poor to have much property for his children to inherit, but certain descriptions of it were forfeited to the commune. The only possession of his which all who were not of his own race refused to touch was his furniture. That was tainted, infectious, unclean, fit for none but cagos. When such were, for at least three centuries, the prevalent usages and opinions with regard to this oppressed race, it is no wonder that we read of occasional outbursts of ferocious violence on their part. In the Bas Pyrenees, for instance, it is only about a hundred years since that the Cagos of Rouy rose up against the inhabitants of the neighbouring town of Lourdes and got the better of them by their magical powers, as it is said. The people of Lourdes were conquered and slain, and their ghastly bloody heads served the triumphant cagos for balls to play at ninepins with. The local parliaments had begun by this time to perceive how oppressive was the ban of public opinion under which the cagos lay, and were not inclined to enforce too severe a punishment. Accordingly, the decree of the Parliament of Toulouse condemned only the leading cagos concerned in this affray to be put to death and that henceforward and for ever no cago was to be permitted to enter the town of Lord by any gate but that called Cap de Porte. They were only to be allowed to walk under the rain gutters, and neither to sit, eat or drink in the town. If they failed in observing any of these rules, the Parliament decreed, in the spirit of Shylock, 
that the disobedient Cagos should have two strips of flesh, weighing never more than two ounces each, cut out from each side of their spines. In the 14th, 15th and 16th centuries, it was considered no more a crime to brill a cago than to destroy obnoxious vermin. A nest of cago, as the old accounts phrase it, had assembled in a deserted castle of Mauvaisin about the year 1600, and certainly they made themselves not very agreeable neighbours, as they seemed to enjoy their reputation of magicians. And by some acoustic secrets which were known to them, all sorts of moaning and groanings were heard in the neighbouring forests, very much to the alarm of the good people of the pure race, who could not cut off a withered branch for firewood, but some unearthly sound seemed to fill the air, or drink water which was not poisoned, because the cagos would persist in filling their pitchers at the same running stream. Added to these grievances, the various pilferings perpetually going on in the neighbourhood made the inhabitants of the neighbouring towns and hamlets believe that they had a very sufficient cause for wishing to murder all the cagos in the Chateau de Mauvaisin, but it was surrounded by a moat and only accessible by a drawbridge, besides which the cagos were fierce and vigilant. Someone, however, proposed to get into their confidence and for this purpose he pretended to fall ill close to their path, so that on returning to their stronghold, they perceived him and took him in, restored him to health, and made a friend of him. One day when they were all playing at ninepins in the woods, their treacherous friend left the party on pretense of being thirsty, and went back into the castle, drawing up the bridge after he had passed over it, and so cutting off their means of escape into safety. Then, going up to the highest part of the castle, he blew upon a horn, and the pure race, who were lying in wait on the watch for some such signal, fell upon the cago at their games, and slew them all. For this murder I find no punishment decreed in the Parliament of Toulouse or elsewhere. As any intermarriages with the pure race were strictly forbidden, and as there were books kept in every commune, in which the names and habitations of the reputed cagos were written, these unfortunate people had no hope of ever becoming blended with the rest of the population. Did a cago marriage take place, the couple were serenaded with satirical songs. They also had minstrels, and many of their romances are still current in Brittany. But they did not attempt to make any reprisals of satire or abuse. Their disposition was amiable, and their intelligence great. Indeed, it required both these qualities and their great love of mechanical labour to make their lives tolerable. At last they began to petition that they might receive some protection from the laws, and, towards the end of the 17th century, the judicial power took their side. But they gained little by this. Law could not prevail against custom, and in the ten or twenty years just preceding the French Revolution, the prejudice in France against the Cagos amounted to fierce and positive abhorrence. At the beginning of the 16th century, the Cagos of Navarre complained to the Pope that they were excluded from the fellowship of men and accursed by the Church because their ancestors had given help to a certain Count Raymond of Toulouse in his revolt against the Holy See. They entreated His Holiness not to visit upon them the sins of their fathers. The Pope issued a bull on the 13th of May, 1515, ordering them to be well treated and to be admitted to the same privileges as other men. He charged Don Juan de Santa Maria of Pampelona to see to the execution of this bull, but Don Juan was slow to help, and the poor Spanish cago grew impatient and resolved to try the secular power. They accordingly applied to the Cortes of Navarre, and were opposed on a variety of grounds. First it was stated that their ancestors had had nothing to do with Raymond, Count of Toulouse, or with any such knightly personage, that they were in fact descendants of Gahazi, servant of Elisha, second book of Kings, fifth chapter, twenty-seventh verse 
who had been accursed by his master for his fraud upon Naaman, and doomed he and his descendants to be lepers for evermore. Name, Kago, or Gahe, Gahe, Gahazites. What can be more clear, and if that is not enough, and you tell us that the Kagos are not lepers now, we reply that there are two kinds of leprosy, one perceptible and the other imperceptible, even to the person suffering from it. Besides, it is the country talk that where the Kago treads, the grass withers, proving the unnatural heat of his body. Many credible and trustworthy witnesses will also tell you that if a Kago holds a freshly gathered apple in his hand, it will shrivel and wither up in an hour's time, as much as if it had been kept for a whole winter in a dry room. They are born with tails, although the parents are cunning enough to pinch them off immediately. Do you doubt this? If it is not true, why do the children of the pure race delight in sewing on sheep's tails to the dress of any kago who is so absorbed in his work as not to perceive them? And their bodily smell is so horrible and detestable that it shows that they must be heretics of some vile and pernicious description. For do we not read of the incense of good workers and the fragrance of holiness? Such were literally the arguments by which the Kago were thrown back into a worse position than ever as far as regarded their rights as citizens. The Pope insisted that they should receive all their ecclesiastical privileges. The Spanish priests said nothing, but tacitly refused to allow the Kagos to mingle with the rest of the faithful, either dead or alive. The accursed race obtained laws in their favour from the Emperor Charles V, but there was no one to carry these laws into effect. As a sort of revenge for their want of submission, and for their impertinence in daring to complain, their tools were all taken away from them by the local authorities. An old man and all his family died of starvation, being no longer allowed to fish. They could not emigrate. Even to remove their poor mud habitations from one spot to another excited anger and suspicion. To be sure, in 1695, the Spanish government ordered the alcaldes to search out all the cagos and to expel them before two months had expired, under pain of having fifty ducats to pay for every cago remaining in Spain at the expiration of that time. The inhabitants of the villages rose up and flogged out any miserable cagos who might be in their neighbourhood. But the French were on their guard against this enforced eruption, and refused to permit them to enter France. Numbers were hunted up into the inhospitable Pyrenees, and there died of starvation, or became a prey to wild beasts. They were obliged to wear both gloves and shoes when they were thus put to flight. Otherwise, the stones and herbage they trod upon, and the balustrades of the bridges that they crossed, would, according to popular belief, have become poisonous. And all this time there was nothing remarkable or disgusting in the outward appearance of this unfortunate people. There was nothing about them to countenance the idea of their being lepers, the most natural mode of accounting for the abhorrence in which they were held. They were repeatedly examined by learned doctors, whose experiments, although singular and rude, appear to have been made in the spirit of humanity. For instance, the surgeons of the King of Navarre in 1600 bled 22 cagos in order to examine and analyse their blood. They were young and healthy people of both sexes, and the doctors seemed to have expected that they should have been able to extract some new kind of salt from their blood, which should account for the wonderful heat of their bodies. But their blood was just like that of other people, some of these medical men have left us an account of the general appearance of this unfortunate race, at a time when they were more numerous and less intermixed than they are now. The families existing in the south and west of France, who are reputed to be of Cago descent at this day, are, like their ancestors, tall, largely made and powerful in frame, fair and ruddy in complexion, with grey-blue eyes, in which some observers see a pensive heaviness of look. 
Their lips are thick but well formed. Some of the reports name their sad expression of countenance with surprise and suspicion. They are not gay like other folk. The wonder would be if they were. Dr. Guillon, the medical man of the last century who has left the clearest report on the health of the Cagos, speaks of the vigorous old age they attain to. In one family alone, he found a man of seventy-four years of age, a woman as old, gathering cherries, and another woman, aged eighty-three, was lying on the grass, having her hair combed by her great-grandchildren. Dr. Guillon and other surgeons examined into the subject of the horribly infectious smell which the cagots were said to leave behind them and upon everything they touched, but they could perceive nothing unusual on this head. They also examined their ears, which according to common belief, a belief existing to this day, were differently shaped to those of other people, being round and gristly without the lobe of flesh into which the earring is inserted. They decided that most of the cagots whom they examined had the ears of this round shape, but they gravely added that they saw no reason why this should exclude them from the good will of men and from the power of holding office in church and state. They recorded the fact that the children of the towns ran buying after any cago who had been compelled to come into the streets to make purchases. In allusion to this peculiarity of the shape of the ear, which bore some resemblance to the ears of sheep as they are cut by the shepherds in this district. De Guillon names the case of a beautiful cago girl who sang most sweetly and prayed to be allowed to sing canticles in the organ loft. The organist, more musician than bigot, allowed her to come, but the indignant congregation, finding out whence proceeded that clear fresh voice, rushed up to the organ loft and chased the girl out, bidding her remember her ears and not commit the sacrilege of singing praises to God along with the pure race. But this medical report of Dr. Guillon's, bringing facts and arguments to confirm his opinion, that there was no physical reason why the Cagots should not be received on terms of social equality by the rest of the world, did no more for his clients than the legal decrees promulgated two centuries before had done. The French held with Hudibras that he that's convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. And indeed, the being convinced by Dr. Guillon that they ought to receive Cagot as fellow creatures only made them more rabid in declaring that they would not. One or two little occurrences which are recorded prove that the bitterness of the repugnance for the Cagots was in full force at the time, just preceding the first French Revolution. There was a Monsieur Davedot, the curate of Lourbe, and brother to the seigneur of the neighbouring castle, who was living in 1780. He was well educated for the time, a travelled man, and sensible and moderate in all respects, but that of his abhorrence of the Cagos. He would insult them from the very altar, calling out to them as they stood afar off, O oh, ye Cago, damned for evermore! One day, a half-blind Cago stumbled and touched the censer borne before this Abbé de Lourbe. He was immediately turned out of the church and forbidden ever to re-enter it. One does not know how to account for the fact that the very brother of this bigoted abbé, the seigneur of the village, went and married a cago girl. But so it was, and the abbé brought a legal process against him, and had his estates taken from him solely on account of his marriage, which reduced him to the condition of a cago, against whom the old laws were still in force. The descendants of this seigneur de l'Aube are simple peasants at this very day, working on the lands which belonged to their grandfather. This prejudice against mixed marriages remained prevalent until very lately. The tradition of the Cago descent lingered amongst the people long after the laws against the accursed race were abolished. A Breton girl, within the last few years, having two lovers, each of reputed Cago descent, employed a notary to examine their pedigrees, and see which of the two had least cago in him, and to that one she gave her hand. 
In Brittany, the prejudice seems to have been more virulent than anywhere else. Monsieur Emile Souvestre records proofs of the hatred borne to them in Brittany so late as 1835. Just lately, a baker at Hennebon, having married a girl of Cago descent, lost all his custom. The godfather and godmother of a Cago child became Cagos themselves by the Breton laws, unless indeed the poor little baby died before attaining a certain number of days. They had to eat the butcher's meat condemned as unhealthy, but for some unknown reason they were considered to have a right to every cut loaf turned upside down with its cut side towards the door, and might enter any house in which they saw a loaf in this position and carry it away with them. About thirty years ago, there was the skeleton of a hand hanging up as an offering in a Breton church near Camperle, and the tradition was that it was the hand of a rich cago who had dared to take holy water out of the usual benitier some time at the beginning of the reign of Louis the Sixteenth, which an old soldier witnessing, he laid in wait, and the next time the offender approached the benitier, he cut off his hand and hung it up, dripping with blood, as an offering to the patron saint of the church. The poor Cagot in Brittany petitioned against their opprobrious name and begged to be distinguished by the appellation of Malandrin. To English ears, one name is much the same as the other, as neither conveys any meaning, but to this day the descendants of the Cagot do not like to have this word applied to them, preferring the term Malandrin. The French Cagot tried to destroy all the records of their pariah descent in the commotions of 1789. But if writings have disappeared, the tradition yet remains, and points out such and such a family as Cagot or Malandrin, or Oiselier, according to the old terms of abhorrence. There are various ways in which learned men have attempted to account for the universal repugnance in which this well-made, powerful race are held. Some say that the antipathy to them took its rise in the days when leprosy was a dreadfully prevalent disease, and that the cagots are more liable than other men to a kind of skin disease, not precisely leprosy, but resembling it in some of its symptoms, such as dead whiteness of complexion and swellings of the face and extremities. There was also some resemblance to the ancient Jewish custom in respect to lepers, in the habits of the people, who, on meeting a cago, called out, Cagot, Cagot, to which they were bound to reply, Pelut, Pelut. Leprosy is not properly an infectious complaint, in spite of the horror in which the cago furniture and the clothes woven by them is held in some places. The disorder is hereditary, and hence, say this body of wise men, who have troubled themselves to account for the origin of cagoterie, the reasonableness and the justice of preventing any mixed marriages, by which this terrible tendency to leprous complaints might be spread far and wide. Another authority says that though the cagos are fine-looking men, hard-working and good mechanics, yet that they bear in their faces and show in their actions reasons for the detestation in which they are held. The glance, if you meet it, is the jetatura, or evil eye, and they are spiteful and cruel and deceitful above all other men. All these qualities they derive from their ancestor Gahazi, the servant of Elisha, together with their tendency to leprosy. Again it is said that they are descended from the Aryan Goths, who were permitted to live in certain places in Guienne and Languedoc after their defeat by King Clovis on occasion that they abjured their heresy and kept themselves separate from all other men for ever. The principal reason alleged in support of this supposition of their Gothic descent is the specious one of derivation, Xiangot, Kangot, Kago, equivalent to dogs of Goths. Again, they were thought to be Saracens coming from Syria, in confirmation of this idea was the belief that all cagos were possessed by a horrible smell. The Lombards also were an unfragrant race, or so reputed among the Italians. 
witness Pope Stephen's letter to Charlemagne, dissuading him from marrying Bertha, daughter of Didier, king of Lombardy. The Lombards boasted of eastern descent and were noisome. The Cagos were noisome and therefore must be of eastern descent. What could be clearer? In addition, there was the proof to be derived from the name Cago, which those holding the opinion of their Saracen descent held to be Chien, or Chasseur des Gottes, because the Saracens chased the Goths out of Spain. Moreover, the Saracens were originally Mahometans, and as such obliged to bathe seven times a day, whence the badge of the duck's foot. A duck was a water bird, Mahometans bathed in the water, proof upon proof. In Brittany, the common idea was they were of Jewish descent. Their unpleasant smell was again pressed into the service. The Jews, it was well known, had this physical infirmity, which might be cured, either by bathing in a certain fountain in Egypt, which was a long way from Brittany, or by anointing themselves with the blood of a Christian child. Blood gushed out of the body of every cago on Good Friday. No wonder if they were of Jewish descent. It was the only way of accounting for so portentous a fact. Again, the cagos were capital carpenters, which gave the Bretons every reason to believe that their ancestors were the very Jews who made the cross. When first the tide of emigration set from Brittany to America, the oppressed cago crowded to the ports, seeking to go to some new country where their race might be unknown. Here was another proof of their descent from Abraham and his nomadic people, and the forty years wandering in the wilderness and the wandering Jew himself were pressed into the service to prove that the Cagos derived their restlessness and love of change from their ancestors, the Jews. The Jews also practised arts magic, and the Cagos sold bags of wind to the Breton sailors, enchanted maidens to love them, maidens who never would have cared to them unless they had been previously enchanted, made hollow rocks and trees give out strange and unearthly noises, and sold the magical herb called Bon Succès. It is true enough that in all the early acts of the 14th century, the same laws apply to Jews as to Cagos, and the appellations seem used indiscriminately. But their fair complexions, their remarkable devotion to all the ceremonies of the Catholic Church, and many other circumstances, conspire to forbid our believing them to be of Hebrew descent. Another very plausible idea is that they are the descendants of unfortunate individuals afflicted with goiters, which is, even to this day, not an uncommon disorder in the gorges and valleys of the Pyrenees. Some have even derived the word goiter from got or goth, but their name, crestia, is not unlike cretin, and the same symptoms of idiotism were not unusual among the cago, although sometimes, if old tradition is to be credited, their malady of the brain took rather the form of violent delirium, which attacked them at new and full moons. Then the workmen laid down their tools and rushed off from their labour to play mad pranks up and down the country. Perpetual motion was required to alleviate the agony of fury that seized upon the cagos at such times. In this desire for rapid movement, the attack resembled the Neapolitan Tarantella, while in the mad deeds they performed during such attacks, they were not unlike the northern berserker. In Bern, especially, those suffering from this madness were dreaded by the pure race. The Bernay, going to cut their wooden clogs in the great forests that lay around the base of the Pyrenees, feared above all things to go too near the periods when the Cagutel seized on the oppressed and accursed people from whom it was then the oppressor's turn to fly. A man was living with the memory of a man who had married a Cago wife. He used to beat her right soundly when he saw the first symptoms of the Cagutel, and having reduced her to a wholesome state of exhaustion and insensibility, he locked her up until the moon had altered her shape in the heavens. If he had not taken such decided steps, say the oldest inhabitants, there is no knowing what might have happened. 
From the 13th to the end of the 19th century, there are facts enough to prove the universal abhorrence in which this unfortunate race was held. Whether called Cago or Gahe in Pyrenean districts, Caco in Brittany, or Vaqueros in Asturias, the great French Revolution brought some good out of its fermentation of the people. The more intelligent among them tried to overcome the prejudice against the Cago. In 1718, there was a famous cause tried at Biarritz relating to Cago rights and privileges. There was a wealthy miller, Etienne Arnaud by name, of the race of Gots, Quagots, Bisigots, Astrogots or Gahets, as his people are described in the legal document. He married an heiress, a Got or Cago of Biarritz, and the newly married well-to-do couple saw no reason why they should stand near the door in the church, nor why he should not hold some civil office in the commune, of which he was the principal inhabitant. Accordingly, he petitioned the law that he and his wife might be allowed to sit in the gallery of the church, and that he might be relieved from his civil disabilities. This wealthy white miller, Etienne Arnaud, pursued his rights with some vigour against the bailey of Laborde, the dignitary of the neighbourhood, whereupon the inhabitants of Biarritz met in the open air on the 8th of May, to the number of 150, approved of the conduct of the bailey in rejecting Arnaud, made a subscription, and gave all power to their lawyers to defend the cause of the pure race against Etienne Arnaud, that stranger, who, having married a girl of Cago blood, ought also to be expelled from the holy places. This lawsuit was carried through all the local courts, and ended by an appeal to the highest court in Paris, where a decision was given against Basque superstitions, and Etienne Arnaud was thenceforward entitled to enter the gallery of the church. Of course, the inhabitants of Biarritz were all the more ferocious for having been conquered, and four years later, a carpenter, Miguel Legaret, suspected of Cago descent, having placed himself in church among other people, was dragged out by the abbé and two of the jurats of the parish. Legaret defended himself with a sharp knife at the time, and went to law afterwards, the end of which was that the abbé and his two accomplices were condemned to a public confession of penitence, to be uttered while on their knees at the church door, just after high mass. They appealed to the Parliament of Bordeaux against this decision, but met with no better success than the opponents of the Miller Arnaud. Legaret was confirmed in his right of standing where he would in the parish church. That a living Cago had equal rights with other men in the town of Biarritz seemed now ceded to them, but a dead Cago was a different thing. The inhabitants of pure blood struggled long and hard to be interred apart from the abhorred race. The Cagos were equally persistent in claiming to have a common burying ground. Again the texts of the Old Testament were referred to, and the pure blood quoted triumphantly the precedent of Uzziah the leper, 26th chapter of the second book of Chronicles, who was buried in the field of the sepulchres of the kings, not in the sepulchres themselves. The Cagos pleaded that they were healthy and able-bodied, with no taint of leprosy near them. They were met by the strong argument, so difficult to be refuted, which I have quoted before. Leprosy was of two kinds, perceptible and imperceptible. If the Cagos were suffering from the latter kind, who could tell whether they were free from it or not? That decision must be left to the judgment of others. One sturdy Cago family alone, Belon by name, kept up a lawsuit claiming the privilege of common sepulture for 42 years. Although the curé of Biarritz had to pay 100 livres for every Cago not interned in the right place. The inhabitants indemnified the curate for all these fines. Monsieur de Romagne, Bishop of Tarbes, who died in 1768, was the first to allow a cago to fill any office in the church. To be sure, some were so spiritless as to reject office when it was offered to them, because, by so claiming their equality, 
they had to pay the same taxes as other men, instead of the roncal, or poll tax levied on the cagos, the collector of which had also a right to claim a piece of bread of a certain size for his dog at every cago dwelling. Even in the present century, it has been necessary in some churches for the archdeacon of the district, followed by all his clergy, to pass out of the small door previously appropriated to the cagos, in order to mitigate the superstition which even so lately made the people refuse to mingle with them in the house of God. A cago once played the congregation at La Roque, tricks suggested by what I have just named. He slyly locked the great parish door of the church, while the greater part of the inhabitants were assisting at mass inside, put gravel in the lock itself, so as to prevent the use of any duplicate key, and had the pleasure of seeing the proud pure-blooded people file out with bended head through the small low door used by the abhorred cago. We are naturally shocked at discovering from facts such as these the causeless rancour with which innocent and industrious people were so recently persecuted. Gentle reader, am I not rightly representing your feelings? If so, perhaps the moral of the history of the accursed races may be best conveyed in the words of an epitaph on Mrs. Mary Hand, who lies buried in the churchyard of Stratford-on-Avon. What faults you saw in me, pray strive to shun, and look at home, there's something to be done. End of an Accursed Race by Elizabeth Gaskell Read by Phil Benson in Sydney, Australia Part 1 of Half a Lifetime Ago by Elizabeth Gaskell This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Household Words, a weekly journal, conducted by Charles Dickens. Number 289. Saturday, October the 6th, 1855. Chapter 1. Half a lifetime ago there lived a single woman, of the name of Susan Dixon, in one of the Westmoreland Dales. She was the owner of the small farmhouse where she resided, and of some thirty or forty acres of land by which it was surrounded. She had also an hereditary right to a sheep walk, extending the wild fells that overhang Blee Tarn. In the language of the country, she was a stateswoman, her house is yet to be seen on the Oxenfell Road, between Skelleth and Coniston. You go along a moorland track, made by the carts that occasionally come for turf from the Oxenfell. A brook babbles and brattles by the wayside, giving you a sense of companionship, which relieves the deep solitude in which this way is usually traversed. Some miles on this side of Coniston there is a farmstead, a grey stone house, and a square of farm buildings surrounding a green space of rough turf, in the midst of which stands a mighty funereal umbrageous yew, making a solemn shadow as of death in the very heart and centre of the light and heat of the brightest summer day. On the side away from the house, this yard slopes down to a dark brown pool, which is supplied with fresh water from the overflowings of a stone cistern, into which some rivulet of the brook before mentioned continuously and melodiously falls and bubbles. The cattle drink out of this cistern. The household bring their pitchers and fill them with drinking water by a dilatory yet pretty process. The water carrier brings with her a leaf of the hound's tongue fern, and, inserting it in the crevice of the grey rock, makes a cool green spout for the sparkling stream. The house is no specimen at the present day of what it was in the lifetime of Susan Dixon. Then every small diamond pane in the windows glittered with cleanliness. You might have eaten off the floor. You could see yourself in the pewter plates and the polished oaken ormery, or dresser, of the state kitchen into which you entered. Few strangers penetrated further than this room. Once or twice, 
wandering tourists, attracted by the lonely picturesqueness of the situation and the exquisite cleanliness of the house itself, made their way into this house-place and offered money enough, as they thought, to tempt the hostess to receive them as lodgers. They would give no trouble, they said, they would be out rambling or sketching all day long, would be perfectly content with a share of the food which she provided for herself, or would procure what they required from the waterhead inn at Coniston. But no liberal sum, no fair words, moved her from her stony manner, or her monotonous tone of indifferent refusal. No persuasion could induce her to show any more of the house than that first room. No appearance of fatigue procured for the weary an invitation to sit down and rest. And if one more bold and less delicate sat down without being asked, Susan stood by, cold and apparently deaf, or only replying by the briefest monosyllables, till the unwelcome visitor had departed. Yet those with whom she had dealings in the way of selling her cattle or her farm produce spoke of her as keen after a bargain a hard one to have to do with, and she never spared herself exertion or fatigue, at market or in the field, to make the most of her produce. She led the haymakers with her swift steady rake, and her noiseless evenness of motion. She was about among the earliest in the market, examining samples of oats, pricing them, and then turning with grim satisfaction to her own cleaner corn, she was served faithfully and long by those who were rather her fellow labourers than her servants. She was even and just in her dealings with them. If she was peculiar and silent, they knew her, and knew that she might be relied on. Some of them had known her from her childhood, and deep in their hearts was an unspoken, almost unconscious pity for her, for they knew her story, though they never spoke of it. Yes, the time had been when that tall, gaunt, hard-featured, angular woman, who never smiled and hardly ever spoke an unnecessary word, had been a fine-looking girl, bright-spirited and rosy, and when the hearth at the eunuch had been as bright as she, with family love and youthful hope and mirth. Fifty or fifty-one years ago, William Dixon and his wife Margaret were alive, and Susan, their daughter, was about eighteen years old ten years older than the only other child, a boy, named after his father. William and Margaret Dixon were rather superior people, of a character belonging, as far as I have seen, exclusively to the class of Westmoreland and Cumberland statesmen. Just, independent, upright, not given to much speaking, kind-hearted but not demonstrative, disliking change and new ways and new people, sensible and shrewd, each household self-contained, and having little curiosity as to their neighbours, with whom they rarely met for any social intercourse, save at the stated times of sheep-shearing and Christmas, having a certain kind of sober pleasure in amassing money, which occasionally made them miserable, as they call miserly people up in the north, in their old age, reading no light or ephemeral literature, but the grave solid books brought round by the peddlers, the paradise lost and regained, the death of Abel, the spiritual Quixote, and the pilgrim's progress, were to be found in nearly every house. The men occasionally going off laking, that is, playing, that is, drinking for days together, and having to be hunted up by anxious wives, who dared not leave their husbands to the chances of the wild precipitous roads, but walked miles and miles, lantern in hand, in the dead of night, to discover and guide the solemnly drunken husband home, who had a dreadful headache the next day, and the day after that, came forth this grave and sober and virtuous looking, as if there were no such things as malt and spiritous liquors in the world, and who were seldom reminded of their misdoings by their wives, to whom such occasional outbreaks were as things of course, when once the immediate anxiety produced by them was over. Such were, such are, the characteristics of a class now passing away from the face of the land, as their compeers, the yeomen, have done before. Of such was William Dixon. He was a shrewd, clever farmer in his day and generation, 
when shrewdness was rather shown in the breeding and rearing of sheep and cattle than in the cultivation of land. Owing to this character of his, statesmen from a distance from beyond Kendal or from Borrowdale of greater wealth than he would send their sons to be farm servants for a year or two with him in order to learn some of his methods before setting up on land of their own. When Susan, his daughter, was about seventeen, one Michael Hurst was farm servant at Eunuch. He worked with the master and lived with the family and was in all respects treated as an equal except in the field. His father was a wealthy statesman at Withburn up beyond Grasmere and through Michael's servitude the families had become acquainted and the Dixons went over to the Highbeck sheep shearing and the hearse came down by Red Bank and Luffrig Tarn and across the Oxenfell when there was the Christmas tide feasting at Eunuch. The fathers strolled round the fields together, examined cattle and sheep, and looked knowing over each other's horses. The mothers inspected the dairies and household arrangements, each openly admiring the plans of the other, but secretly preferring their own. Both fathers and mothers cast a glance from time to time at Michael and Susan, who were thinking of nothing less than farm or dairy, but whose unspoken attachment was in all ways so suitable and natural a thing that each parent rejoiced over it, although with characteristic reserve it was never spoken about, not even between husband and wife. Susan had been a strong, independent, healthy girl, a clever help to her mother, and a spirited companion to her father. More of a man in her, as he often said, than her delicate little brother ever would have. He was his mother's darling, although she loved Susan well. There was no positive engagement between Michael and Susan. I doubt if even plain words of love had been spoken, when one winter time Margaret Dixon was seized with inflammation consequent upon a neglected cold. She had always been strong and notable, and had been too busy to attend to the earliest symptoms of illness. It would go off, she said to the woman who helped in the kitchen, or if she did not feel better when they had got the hams and bacon out of hand, she would take some herb tea and nurse up a bit. But death could not wait till the hams and bacon were cured. He came on with rapid strides and shooting arrows of portentous agony. Susan had never seen illness, never knew how much she loved her mother till now when she felt a dreadful instinctive certainty that she was losing her. Her mind was thronged with recollections of the many times she had slighted her mother's wishes. Her heart was full of the echoes of careless and angry replies that she had spoken. What would she not now give to have opportunities of service and obedience, and trials of her patience and love for that dear mother who lay gasping in torture? And yet... Susan had been a good girl and an affectionate daughter. The sharp pain went off, and delicious ease came on, yet still her mother sunk. In the midst of this languid peace she was dying. She motioned Susan to her bedside, for she could only whisper, and then, while the father was out of the room, she spoke as much to the eager, hungering eyes of her daughter by the motion of her lips as by the slow, feeble sounds of her voice. Susan, lass, thou must not fret. It is God's will, and thou wilt have a deal to do. Keep father straight if thou canst, and if he goes out Ulverston ways, see that thou meet him before he gets to the old quarry. It's a dree bit for a man who has had a drop. As for Lyle Will... Here the poor woman's face began to work, and her fingers to move nervously as they lay on the bed quilt. Lyle Will will miss me most of all. Father's often vexed with him because he's not a quick, strong lad. He is not, me poor lyle chap. And father thinks he's saucy, because he cannot always stomach oat cake and porridge. There's better than three pound in the old black teapot on the top shelf of the cupboard. Just keep a piece of loaf bread by you, Susan dear for Will to come to when he's not taking his breakfast. I have, maybe, spoiled him, 
but there'll be no one to spoil him now. She began to cry, a low, feeble cry, and covered up her face that Susan might not see her, that dear face, those precious moments, while yet the eyes could look out with love and intelligence. Susan laid her head down close by her mother's ear. Mother, I'll take tent of will. Mother, do you hear? He shall not want aught I can give or get for him, least of all the kind words which you had ever ready for us both. Bless you, bless you, my own mother. Thou'lt promise me that, Susan, wilt thou? I could die easy if thou'lt take charge of him, but he's hardly like other folk. He tries father at times, though I think father'll be tender of him when I'm gone, for my sake. And Susan, there's one thing more. I never spoke on it for fear of the bairn being called a tell-tale, but I just comforted him up. He vexes Michael at times, and Michael has struck him before now. I did not want to make a stir, but he's not strong, and a word from thee, Susan, will go a long way with Michael. Susan was as red now as she had been pale before. It was the first time that her influence over Michael had been openly acknowledged by a third person, and a flash of joy came athwart the solemn sadness of the moment. Her mother had spoken too much, and now came on the miserable faintness. She never spoke again coherently, but when her children and her husband stood by her bedside, she took Lyle Will's hand and put it into Susan's, and looked at her with imploring eyes. Susan clasped her arms round Will, and leaned her head upon his curly pate, and vowed to herself to be as a mother to him. Henceforward she was all in all to her brother. She was a more spirited and amusing companion to him than his mother had been, from her greater activity, and perhaps also from her originality of character, which often prompted her to perform her habitual actions in some new and racy manner. She was tender to Lyle Will, when she was prompt and sharp with everybody else, with Michael most of all, for somehow the girl felt that unprotected by her mother, she must keep up her own dignity, and not allow her lover to see how strong a hold he had upon her heart. He called her hard and cruel, and left her so, and she smiled softly to herself when his back was turned, to think how little he guessed how deeply he was loved. For Susan was merely comely and fine-looking, Michael was strikingly handsome, admired by all the girls for miles around, and quite enough of a country coxcomb to know it and plume himself accordingly. He was the second son of his father. The eldest would have Highbeck Farm, of course, but there was a good penny in the Kendall Bank in store for Michael. When harvest was over, he went to Chapel Langdale to learn to dance, and at night, in his merry moods, he would do his steps on the flag floor of the eunuch kitchen, to the secret admiration of Susan, who had never learned dancing, but who flouted him perpetually, even while she admired, in accordance with the rule she seemed to have made to herself about keeping him at a distance, so long as he lived under the same roof with her. One evening he sulked at some saucy remark of hers, he sitting in the chimney corner with his arms on his knees and his head bent forwards, lazily gazing into the wood fire on the hearth, and luxuriating in rest after a hard day's labour, she sitting among the geraniums on the long low window seat, trying to catch the last slanting rays of the autumnal light to enable her to finish stitching a shirt collar for Will, who lounged full length on the flags at the other side of the hearth to Michael, poking the burning wood from time to time with a long hazel stick, to bring out the leap of glittering sparks. "'And if you can dance a threesome reel, what good does it do you?' asked Susan, looking askance at Michael, who had just been vaunting his proficiency. "'Does it help you plough or reap, or even climb the rocks to take a raven's nest? If I were a man, I'd be ashamed to give in to such softness. "'If you were a man,' You'd be glad to do anything which made the pretty girls stand round and admire. As they do to you, eh? Oh, Michael, that would not be my way of being a man. What would then? asked he, 
after a pause, during which he had expected in vain that she would go on with her sentence. No answer. I should not like you as a man, Susie. You'd be too hard and headstrong. Am I hard and headstrong? asked she, with as indifferent a tone as she could assume, but which yet had a touch of pique in it. His quick ear detected the inflection. No, Susie, you're willful at times, and that's right enough. I don't like a girl without spirit. There's a mighty pretty girl comes to the dancing class, but she's all milk and water. Her eyes never flash like yours when you put out. Why, I can see them flame across the kitchen like a cat's eyes in the dark. Now, if you were a man, I should feel queer before those looks of yours. As it is, I rather like them, because... Because what? asked she, looking up and perceiving that he had stolen close up to her. Because I can make all right in this way, said he, kissing her suddenly. Can you? said she, wrenching herself out of his grasp and panting, half with rage. Take that by way of proof that making right is not so easy, and she boxed his ears pretty sharply. He went back to his seat, discomfited and out of temper. She could no longer see to look, even if her face had not burnt and her eyes dazzled. But she did not choose to move her seat, so she still preserved her stooping attitude and pretended to go on sewing. Eleanor Hebthwaite may be milk and water, muttered he. But, confound thee, lad, what art doing? exclaimed Michael as a great piece of burning wood was cast into his face by an unlucky poke of Will's. "'Thou great, lounging, clumsy chap, I'll teach thee better!' And with one or two good round kicks, he sent the lad whimpering away into the back kitchen. When he had a little recovered himself from his passion, he saw Susan standing before him, her face looking strange and almost ghastly by the reversed position of the shadows, arising from the firelight shining upwards, right under it. "'I tell thee what, Michael,' said she, "'that lad's motherless, but not friendless. "'His own father leathers him, "'and why should not I, when he's given me such a burn on my face?' said Michael, putting up his hand to his cheek, as if in pain. "'His father's his father, and there is naught more to be said.' But if he did burn thee, it was by accident and not a purpose, as thou kicked him. It's a mercy if his ribs are not broken. He howls loud enough, I'm sure. I might have kicked many a lad twice as hard, and they'd ne'er have said aught but damn you. But yon lad must needs cry out like a stuck pig if one touches him, replied Michael sullenly. Susan went back to the window seat and looked absently out of the window at the drifting clouds for a minute or two, while her eyes filled with tears. Then she got up and made for the outer door which led into the back kitchen. Before she reached it, however, she heard a low voice whose music made her thrill say, Susan, Susan. Her heart melted within her, but it seemed like treachery to her poor boy like faithlessness to her dead mother to turn to her lover, while the tears which he had caused to flow were yet unwiped on Will's cheeks. So she seemed to take no heed, but passed into the darkness, and guided by the sobs, she found her way to where Willie sat crouched among disused tubs and churns. "'Come out with me, lad,' and they went into the orchard where the fruit trees were bare of leaves, but ghastly in the tattered coverings of grey moss, and the soughing November wind came with long sweeps over the fells, till it rattled among the crackling boughs, underneath which the brother and sister sat in the dark, he in her lap, and she hushing his head against her shoulder. Thou shouldst na play wi' fire, is a naughty trick. Thou'lt suffer for it in worse ways nor this before thou'st done, I'm afeard. I should have hit thee twice as lungeous kicks as Mike, if I'd been in his place. He didn't have hurt thee, I'm sure, she assumed, half as a question. Yes, but he did. He turned me quite sick, and he let his head fall languidly down on his sister's breast. Come, lad, come, lad, said she anxiously. Be a man. It was not much that I saw. Why, when the first red cow came, 
She kicks me far harder for offering to milk her before her legs were tied. See thee, here's a peppermint drop, and I'll make thee a pasty to-night. Only don't give way so, for it hurts me sore to think that Michael has done thee any harm, my pretty. Willie roused himself up and put back the wet and ruffled hair from his heated face, and he and Susan rose up and hand in hand went towards the house, walking slowly and quietly, except for a kind of sob which Willie could not repress. Susan took him to the pump and washed his tear-stained face till she thought she had obliterated all traces of the recent disturbance, arranging his curls for him, and then she kissed him tenderly and led him in, hoping to find Michael in the kitchen and make all straight between them. The blaze had dropped down into darkness. The wood was a heap of grey ashes in which the sparks ran hither and thither. But even in the groping darkness, Susan knew by the sinking of her heart that Michael was not there. She threw another brand on the hearth and lighted the candle and sat down to her work in silence. Willie cowered on his stool by the side of the fire, eyeing his sister from time to time, and sorry and oppressed, he knew not why, by the sight of her grave, almost stern face. No one came. They too were in the house alone. The old woman who helped Susan with the household work had gone out for the night to some friend's dwelling. William Dixon, the father, was up on the fells seeing after his sheep. Susan had no heart to prepare the evening meal. "'Susie, darling, are you angry with me?' said Willie, in his little piping gentle voice. He has stolen up to his sister's side. "'I won't never play with fire again, and I'll not cry if Michael does kick me. Only don't look so like dead mother. Don't, don't, please don't!' he exclaimed, hiding his face on her shoulder. "'I'm not angry, Willie,' said she. "'Don't be feared on me. "'You want your supper, and you shall have it. "'And don't you be feared on Michael. "'He shall give reason for every hair of your head that he touches. "'He shall.' "'When William Dixon came home, "'he found Susan and Willie sitting together, hand in hand, "'and apparently very cheerful. "'He bade them go to bed, for that he would sit up for Michael.' and the next morning, when Susan came down, she found that Michael had started an hour before with the cart for Lyme. It was a long day's work. Susan knew it would be late, perhaps later than on the preceding night before he returned. At any rate, past her usual bedtime, and on no account would she stop up a minute beyond that hour in the kitchen, whatever she might do in her bedroom. Here she sat and watched till past midnight, and when she saw him coming up the brow with the carts, she knew full well, even in that faint moonlight, that his gait was the gait of a man in liquor. But though she was annoyed and mortified to find in what way he had chosen to forget her, the fact did not disgust or shock her, as it would have done many a girl, even at that day, who had not been brought up as Susan had, among a class who considered it as no crime, but rather a mark of spirit in a man to get drunk occasionally. Nevertheless, she chose to hold herself very high all the next day, when Michael was perforce obliged to give up any attempt to do heavy work, and hung about the outbuildings and farm in a very disconsolate and sickly state. Willie had far more pity on him than Susan. Before evening, Willie and he were fast, and on his side, ostentatious friends. Willie rode the horses down to water. Willie helped him to chop wood. Susan sat gloomily at her work, hearing an indistinct but cheerful conversation going on in the shippen while the cows were being milked. She almost felt irritated with her little brother, as if he were a traitor and had gone over to the enemy in the very battle that she was fighting in his cause. She was alone with no one to speak to, while they prattled on regardless if she were glad or sorry. Soon Willie burst in. Susan, Susan, come with me. I've something so pretty to show you. Round the corner of the barn. Run, run. He was dragging her along, half reluctant, half desirous of some change in that weary day, round the corner of the barn, and caught hold of by Michael, 
who stood there awaiting her. "'Oh, Willie!' cried she. "'You naughty boy! There's nothing pretty. What have you brought me here for? Let me go. I won't be held.' "'Only one word. Nay, if you wish it so much you may go,' said Michael, suddenly loosing his hold as she struggled. But now she was free. She only drew off a step or two, murmuring something about Willie. "'You're going, then?' said Michael, with seeming sadness. "'You won't hear me say a word of what is in my heart.' "'How can I tell whether it is what I should like to hear?' replied she, still drawing back. "'That's just what I want you to tell me. I want you to hear it, and then to tell me if you like it or not.' "'Well, you may speak,' replied she, turning her back and beginning to plait the hem of her apron. He came close to her ear. "'I'm sorry I hurt Willie the other night. "'He has forgiven me. Can you?' "'You hurt him very badly,' she replied. "'But you're right to be sorry. I forgive you.' "'Stop, stop,' said he, laying his hand upon her arm. "'There is something more I've got to say. "'I want you to be my... "'What is it they call it, Susan?' "'I don't know,' said she, half laughing, "'but trying to get away with all her might now. "'And she was a strong girl, but she could not manage it.' "'You do. My, what is it I want you to be? "'I tell you, I don't know, "'and you had best be quiet and just let me go in, "'or I shall think you're as bad now as you were last night. "'And how did you know what I was last night? "'It was past twelve when I came home. "'Were you watching? "'Ah, Susan, be my wife, "'and you shall never have to watch for a drunken husband. "'If I were your husband,' I would come straight home and count every minute and hour till I saw your bonny face. Now you know what I want you to be. I ask you to be my wife. Will you? My own dear Susan. She did not speak for some time. Then she only said, Ask father. And now she was really off like a lapwing round the corner of the barn and up in her own little room, crying with all her might before the triumphant smile had left Michael's face where he stood. Ask father was a mere form to be gone through. Old Daniel Hurst and William Dixon had talked over what they could respectively give their children long before this, and that was the parental way of arranging such matters. When the probable amount of worldly gear that he could give his child had been named by each father, the young folk, as they said, might take their own time in coming to the point which the old men, with the prescience of experience, saw that they were drifting to. No need to hurry them, for they were both young, and Michael, though active enough, was too thoughtless, old Daniel said, to be trusted with the entire management of a farm. Meanwhile, his father would look about him and see after all the farms that were to be let. Michael had a shrewd notion of this preliminary understanding between the fathers, and so felt less daunted than he might otherwise have done at making the application for Susan's hand. It was all right, there was not an obstacle, only a deal of good advice which the lover thought might have as well been spared, and which, it must be confessed, he did not much attend to, although he assented to every proposition. Then Susan was called downstairs, and slowly came dropping into view down the steps which led from the two family apartments into the house-place. She tried to look composed and quiet, but it could not be done. She stood side by side with her lover, with her head drooping, her cheeks burning, not daring to look up or move, while her father made the newly betrothed a somewhat formal address, in which he gave his consent and many a piece of worldly wisdom beside. Susan listened as well as she could for the beating of her heart, but when her father solemnly and sadly referred to his own lost wife, she could keep from sobbing no longer, but throwing her apron over her face, she sat down on the bench by the dresser and fairly gave way to pent-up tears. Oh, how strangely sweet to be comforted as she was comforted by tender caress and many a low-whispered promise of love. Her father sat by the fire, thinking of the days that were gone. Willie was still out of doors, but Susan and Michael felt no one's presence or absence. They only knew they were together as betrothed husband and wife. 
in a week or two, they were formally told of the arrangements to be made in their favour. A small farm in the neighbourhood happened to fall vacant, and Michael's father offered to take it for him and be responsible for the rent for the first year, while William Dixon was to contribute a certain amount of stock, and both fathers were to help towards the furnishing of the house. Susan received all this information in a quiet, indifferent way. She did not care much for any of these preparations, which were to hurry her through the happy hours. She cared least of all for the money amount of dowry and of substance. It jarred on her to be made the confidant of occasional slight repinings of Michael's, as one by one his future father-in-law set aside a beast or a pig for Susan's portion which were not always the best animals of their kind upon the farm. But he also complained of his own father's stinginess, which somewhat, though not much, alleviated Susan's dislike of being awakened out of her pure dream of love to the consideration of worldly wealth. But in the midst of all this bustle, Willie moped and pined. He had the same cord of delicacy running through his mind, that made his body feeble and weak. He kept out of the way, and was apparently occupied in whittling and carving uncouth heads on hazel sticks in an outhouse. But he positively avoided Michael, and shrunk away even from Susan. She was much too occupied to notice this at first. Michael pointed it out to her, saying with a laugh, "'Look at Willie. He might be a cast-off lover and jealous of me.' He looks so dark and downcast at me. Michael spoke this jest out loud, and Willie burst into tears and ran out of the house. Let me go, let me go, said Susan, for her lover's arm was round her waist. I must go to him if he's fretting. I promised mother I would. She pulled herself away and went in search of the boy. She sought in a byre and a barn through the orchard, where indeed in this leafless winter time there was no great concealment, up into the room where the wool was usually stored in the later summer, and at last she found him, sitting at bay like some hunted creature, up behind the wood stack. "'What are ye gone for, lad, and me seeking you everywhere?' asked she breathless. "'I did not know you would seek me. I've been away many a time and no one has cared to seek me,' said he, crying afresh. "'Nonsense,' replied Susan. "'Don't be so foolish, ye little good for naught. But she crept up to him in the hole he had made, underneath the great brown sheafs of wood, and squeezed herself down by him. "'What for should folk seek after you, when you can get away from them whenever you can?' asked she. "'They don't want me to stay. Nobody wants me. If I go with father, he says I hinder more than I help.' You used to like to have me with you, but now you've taken up with Michael, and you'd rather I was away, and I can just bide away, but I cannot stand Michael jeering at me. He's got you to love him, and that might serve him. But I love you, too, dearly, lad, said she, putting her arm round his neck. Which honours do you like best? said he, wistfully, after a little pause putting her arm away so that he might look in her face and see if she spoke truth. She went very red. You should not ask such questions. They are not fit for you to ask, nor for me to answer. But mother bade you love me, said he plaintively, and so I do, and so I ever will do. Lover nor husband shall come betwixt thee and me, lad, ne'er a one of them. That I promise thee, as I promised mother before, in the sight of God, and her hearkening now, if ever she can hearken to earthly word again. Only I cannot abide to have thee fretting, just because my heart is large enough for two. And thou'lt love me always, always and ever, and the more, the more thou'lt love Michael, said she, dropping her voice. I'll try, said the boy, sighing, for he remembered many a harsh word and blow of which his sister knew nothing. She would have risen up to go away, but he held her tight, for here and now she was all his own, and he did not know when such a time might come again. So the two sat crouched up and silent, till they heard the horn blowing at the field gate, 
which was the summons home to any wanderers belonging to the farm, and at this hour of the evening signified that supper was ready. Then the two went in. Chapter 2 Susan and Michael were to be married in April. He had already gone to take possession of his new farm, three or four miles away from Yew Nock, but that is neighbouring, according to the acceptation of the word, in that thinly populated district, when William Dixon fell ill. He came home one evening, complaining of headache and pains in his limbs, but seemed to loathe the posset which Susan prepared for him. The treacle posset, which was the homely country remedy against an incipient cold. He took it to his bed with a sensation of exceeding weariness and an odd, unusual looking back to the days of his youth when he was a lad living with his parents in this very house. The next morning he had forgotten all his life since then and did not know his own children, crying like a newly weaned baby for his mother to come and soothe away his terrible pain. The doctor from Coniston said it was the typhus fever and warned Susan of its infectious character and shook his head over his patient. There were no friends near to come and share her anxiety, only good, kind old Peggy, who was faithfulness itself, and one or two labourers' wives who would fain have helped her had not their hands been tied by their responsibility to their own families. But somehow Susan neither feared nor flagged, As for fear, indeed, she had no time to give way to it, for every energy of both body and mind was required. Besides, the young have had too little experience of the danger of infection to dread it much. She did indeed wish from time to time that Michael had been at home to have taken Willie over to his father's at High Beck. But then again, the lad was docile and useful to her and his fecklessness in many things might make him be harshly treated by strangers. So perhaps it was as well that Michael was away at Appleby Fair, or even beyond that, gone into Yorkshire after horses. Her father grew worse, and the doctor insisted on sending over a nurse from Coniston, not a professed nurse, Coniston could not have supported such a one, but a widow who was ready to go where the doctor sent her for the sake of the payment. When she came, Susan suddenly gave way. She was felled by the fever herself and lay unconscious for long weeks. Her consciousness returned to her one spring afternoon, early spring, April, her wedding month. There was a little fire burning in the small corner grate and the flickering of the blaze was enough for her to notice in her weak state. She felt that there was someone sitting on the window side of her bed behind the curtain but she did not care to know who it was. It was even too great a trouble to her languid mind to consider who it was likely to be. She would rather shut her eyes and melt off again into the gentle luxury of sleep. The next time she wakened, the Coniston nurse perceived her movement and made her a cup of tea, which she drank with eager relish. But still they did not speak, and once more Susan lay motionless, not asleep, but strangely pleasantly conscious of all the small chamber and household sounds, the fall of a cinder on the hearth, the fitful singing of the half-empty kettle, the cattle tramping out to field again after they had been milked, the aged step on the creaking stair, old Peggy's as she knew. It came to her door, it stopped, the person outside listened for a moment, and then lifted the wooden latch and looked in. The watcher by the bedside arose and went to her, Susan would have been glad to see Peggy's face once more, but was far too weak to turn, so she lay and listened. "'How is she?' whispered one trembling, aged voice. "'Better,' replied the other. "'She's been awake and had a cup of tea. She'll do now. Has she asked after him?' "'Hush, no. She's not spoken a word. Poor lass, poor lass.' The door was shut. A weak feeling of sorrow and self-pity came over Susan. What was wrong? Whom had she loved? And dawning, dawning slowly, rose the sun of her former life, and all particulars were made distinct to her. She felt that some sorrow was coming to her, and cried over it before she knew what it was, or had strength enough to ask. 
in the dead of night, and she had never slept again, she softly called to the watcher and asked, Who? Who what? replied the woman, with a conscious affright, ill-veiled by a poor assumption of ease. Lie still, there's a darling, and go to sleep. Sleep's better for you than all the doctor stuff. Who? repeated Susan. Something is wrong. Who? Oh, dear, said the woman. There's nothing wrong. Willie has taken the turn and is doing nicely. Father? Well, he's all right now, she answered, looking another way, as if seeking for something. Then it's Michael. Oh, me. Oh, me. She set up a succession of weak, plaintive, hysterical cries before the nurse could pacify her by declaring that Sir Michael had been at the house not three hours before to ask after her and looked as well and as hearty as ever man did. "'And you heard of no harm to him since?' inquired Susan. "'Bless the lass, no, for sure. I've ne'er heard his name named since I saw him go out to the yard, a stouter man as ever trod shoe-leather.' It was well, as the nurse said afterwards to Peggy, that Susan had been so easily pacified by the equivocating answer in respect to her father. If she had pressed the questions home in his case, as she did in Michael's, she would have learnt that he was dead and buried more than a month before. It was well, too, that in her weak state of convalescence, which lasted long after this first day of consciousness, her perceptions were not sharp enough to observe the sad change that had taken place in Willie. His bodily strength returned, his appetite was something enormous, but his eyes wandered continually. His regard could not be arrested, his speech became slow, impeded and incoherent. People began to say that the fever had taken away the little wit Willie Dixon had ever possessed, and that they feared that he would end in being a natural as they call an idiot in the Dales. The habitual affection and obedience to Susan lasted longer than any other feeling that the boy had had previous to his illness, and perhaps this made her be the last to perceive what everyone else had long anticipated. She felt the awakening rude when it did come. It was in this wise. One June evening she sat out of doors under the yew tree knitting, she was pale still from her recent illness, and her languor, joined to the fact of her black dress, made her look more than usually interesting. She was no longer the buoyant, self-sufficient Susan, equal to every occasion. The men were bringing in the cows to be milked, and Michael was about in the yard, giving orders and directions with somewhat the air of a master, for the farm belonged of right to Willie and Susan had succeeded to the guardianship of her brother. Michael and she were to be married as soon as she was strong enough, so perhaps his authoritative manner was justified, but the labourers did not like it, although they said little. They remembered him as stripling on the farm, knowing far less than they did, and often glad to shelter his ignorance of all agricultural matters behind their superior knowledge. They would have taken orders from Susan with far more willingness. Nay, Willie himself might have commanded them, and for the old hereditary feeling towards the owners of land, they would have obeyed him with far greater cordiality than they now showed to Michael. But Susan was tired with even three rounds of knitting, and seemed not to notice or to care how things went on around her. And Willie, poor Willie, there he stood, lounging against the door sill, enormously grown and developed to be sure, but with restless eyes and ever open mouth, and every now and then setting up a strange kind of howling cry, and then smiling vacantly to himself at the sound he had made. As the two old labourers passed him, they looked at each other ominously and shook their heads. "'Willie, darling,' said Susan, "'don't make that noise. It makes me headache.' She spoke feebly, and Willie did not seem to hear. At any rate, he continued his howl from time to time. "'All the noise, will, sir,' said Michael roughly, as he passed near him, and threatening him with his fist. Susan's back was turned to the pair. The expression of Willie's face changed from vacancy to fear, 
and he came shambling up to Susan and put her arm round him, and, as if protected by that shelter, he began pulling faces at Michael. Susan saw what was going on, and, as if now first struck by the strangeness of her brother's manner, she looked anxiously at Michael for an explanation. Michael was irritated at Willie's defiance of him, and did not mince the matter. "'It's just that the fever has left him silly. He never was as wise as other folk, and now I doubt if he will ever get right.' Susan did not speak, but she went very pale, and her lip quivered. She looked long and wistfully at Willie's face, as he watched the motion of the ducks in the great stable pool. He laughed softly to himself from time to time. "'Willie likes to see the ducks go overhead,' said Susan, instinctively adopting the form of speech she would have used to a young child. "'Willie, boo! Willie, boo!' he replied clapping his hands and avoiding her eye. "'Speak properly, Willie,' said Susan, making a strong effort at self-control and trying to arrest his attention. "'You know who I am. Tell me my name.' She grasped his arm almost painfully tight to make him attend. Now he looked at her, and for an instant a gleam of recognition quivered over his face, but the exertion was evidently painful and he began to cry at the vainness of the effort to recall her name. He hid his face upon her shoulder with the old affectionate trick of manner. She put him gently away and went into the house into her own little bedroom. She locked the door and did not reply at all to Michael's calls for her, hardly spoke to old Peggy, who tried to tempt her out to receive some homely sympathy. And through the open casement there still came the idiotic sound of Willy, boo! Willy, boo! End of part one Part two of Half a Lifetime Ago by Elizabeth Gaskell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From Household Words, a weekly journal, conducted by Charles Dickens. Number 290 13th of October, 1855 Chapter 3 After the stun of the blow came the realisation of the consequences. Susan would sit for hours trying patiently to recall and piece together fragments of recollection and consciousness in her brother's mind. She would let him go and pursue some senseless bit of play and wait until she could catch his eye or his attention again when she would resume her self-imposed task. Michael complained that she never had a word for him, or a minute of time to spend with him now. But she only said she must try, while there was yet a chance to bring back her brother's lost wits. As for marriage in this state of uncertainty, she had no heart to think of it. Then Michael stormed, and absented himself for two or three days. But it was of no use. When he came back, he saw that she had been crying till her eyes were all swollen up, and he gathered from Peggy's scoldings, which she did not spare him, that Susan had eaten nothing since he went away. But she was as inflexible as ever. Not just yet, only not just yet, and don't say again that I do not love you, said she, suddenly hiding herself in his arms. And so matters went on through August. The crop of oats was gathered in. The wheat field was not ready as yet, when one fine day Michael drove up in a borrowed chandry and offered to take Willie a ride. His manner, when Susan asked him where he was going to, was rather confused, but the answer was straight and clear enough. He had business in Ambleside, he would never lose sight of the lad, and have him back safe and sound before dark. So Susan let him go. Before night they were at home again, Willie in high delight at a little rattling paper windmill that Michael had bought for him in the street, and striving to imitate this new sound with perpetual buzzings. Michael too looked pleased. Susan knew the look, although afterwards she remembered that he had tried to veil it from her, and had assumed a grave appearance of sorrow whenever he caught her eye. He put up his horse, for although he had three miles further to go, the moon was up, 
the bonny harvest moon, and he did not care how late he had to drive on such a road by such a light. After the supper which Susan had prepared for the travellers was over, Peggy went upstairs to see Willie safe in bed, for he had to have the same care taken of him that a little child of four years old requires. Michael drew near to Susan. Susan, said he, I took Will to see Dr. Preston at Kendal. He's the first doctor in the county. I thought it were better for us, for you, to know at once what chance there were for him. Well, said Susan, looking eagerly up. She saw the same strange glance of satisfaction, the same instant change to apparent regret and pain. What did he say? said she. Speak, can't you? He said he would never get better of his weakness. Never? No, never. It is a long word and hard to bear, and there's worse to come, dearest. The doctor thinks he will get worse from year to year, and he said if he was us, you, he would send him off in time to Lancaster Asylum. They've ways there both of keeping such people in order and making them happy. I only tell you what he said, continued he, seeing the gathering storm in her face. There was no harm in his saying it, she replied, with great self-constraint, forcing herself to speak coldly, instead of angrily. Folk is welcome to their opinions. They sat silent for a minute or two, her breast heaving with suppressed feeling. He's counted a very clever man, said Michael at length. He may be. He's none of my clever men, nor am I going to be guided by him, whatever he may think and I don't thank them that went and took my poor lad to have such harsh notions formed about him. If I'd been there, I could have called out the sense that is in him. Well, I'll not say more tonight, Susan. You're not taking it rightly, and I'd best be gone and leave you to think it over. I'll not deny they are hard words to hear, but there's sense in them as I take it, and I reckon you'll have to come to em. Anyhow, it's a bad way of thanking me for me pains, and I don't take it well in you, Susan, said he, getting up as if offended. Michael, I'm beside myself with sorrow. Don't blame me if I speak sharp. He and me is the only ones, you see, and mother did so charge me to have a care of him, and this is what he's come to, poor loud chap. She began to cry, and Michael to comfort her with caresses. Don't, said she, it's no use trying to make me forget poor Willie as a natural. I could hate myself for being happy with you, even for just a little minute. Go away and leave me to face it out. And you'll think it's over, Susan, and remember what the doctor says. I can't forget it, said she. She meant she could not forget what the doctor had said about the hopelessness of her brother's case. He had referred to the plan of sending Willie away to an asylum or madhouse, as they were called in that day and place. The idea had been gathering force in Michael's mind for long. He had talked it over with his father, and secretly rejoiced over the possession of the farm and land, which would then be his in fact, if not in law, by right of his wife. He had always considered the good penny her father could give her in his catalogue of Susan's charms and attractions but of late he had grown to esteem her as the heiress of Eunuch. He too should have land like his brother, land to possess, to cultivate, to make profit from, to bequeath. For some time he had wondered that Susan had been too much absorbed in Willie's present, that she had never seemed to look forward to his future state. Michael had long felt the boy to be a trouble, but of late he had absolutely loathed him his gibbering, his uncouth gestures, his loose, shambling gait, all irritated Michael inexpressibly. He did not come near the eunuch for a couple of days. He thought that he would leave her time to become anxious to see him and reconcile to his plan. They were strange, lonely days to Susan. They were the first she had spent face to face with the sorrows that had turned her from a girl into a woman for hitherto Michael had never let twenty-four hours pass by without coming to see her since she had had the fever. Now that he was absent, it seemed as though some cause of irritation was removed from Will, who was much more gentle and tractable than he had been for many weeks. 
Susan thought that she observed him making efforts at her bidding, and there was something piteous in the way in which he crept up to her and looked wistfully in her face, as if asking her to restore him the faculties that he felt to be wanting. "'I never will let thee go, lad, never. There's no knowing where they would take thee to, or what they would do with thee. As they say in the Bible, naught but death shall part thee and me.' The countryside was full in those days of stories of the brutal treatment offered to the insane, stories that were in fact only too well founded, and the truth of one of which only would have been a sufficient reason for the strong prejudice existing against all such places. Each succeeding hour that Susan passed, alone or with the poor affectionate lad for her sole companion, served to deepen her solemn resolution never to part with him. So, when Michael came, he was annoyed and surprised by the calm way in which she spoke, as if following Dr. Preston's advice was utterly and entirely out of the question. He had expected nothing less than a consent, reluctant it might be, but still a consent, and he was extremely irritated. He could have repressed his anger, but he chose rather to give way to it, thinking that he could so best work upon Susan's affection to gain his point. But somehow he overreached himself, and now he was astonished in his turn at the passion of indignation that she burst into. Thou wilt not bide in the same house with him, sayest thou? There's no need for thy biding as far as I can tell. The solemn reason why I should bide with my own flesh and blood and keep to the word I pledge my mother on her deathbed but as for thee, there's no tie that I know on to keep thee from going to America, a botany bay, this very night, if that's with thy inclination. I will have no more of your threats to make me send me bairn away. If thou marry me, thou'lt help me to take charge of Willie. If thou doesn't choose to marry me on those terms, why, I can snap me fingers at thee. Never fear, I'm not so far gone in love as that but I will not have thee if thou sayest in such a hectoring way that Willie must go out of the house, and the house is own too, before thou'lt set foot in it. Willie bides here, and I bide with him. Thou hast maybe spoken a word too much, said Michael, pale with rage. If I am free as thou sayest to go to Canada or Botany Bay, I reckon I'm free to live where I like, and that will not be with a natural who may turn into a madman some day for aught I know. Choose between him and me, Susie, for I swear to you, you shan't have both. I have chosen, said Susan, now perfectly composed and still. Whatever comes of it, abide with Willie. Very well, replied Michael, trying to assume an equal composure of manner. Then I wish you a very good night. He went out of the house door, half expecting to be called back again, but instead He heard a hasty step inside, and a bolt drawn. Phew, he said to himself, I think I must leave me lady alone for a week or two, and give her time to come to her senses. She'll not find it so easy as she thinks to let me go. So he went past the kitchen window in nonchalant style, and was not seen again at Eunuch for several weeks. How did he pass the time? For the first day or two he was unusually cross with all things and people that came across him. Then wheat harvest began, and he was busy and exultant about his heavy crop. Then a man came from a distance to bid for the lease of his farm, which had been offered for sale by his father's advice, as he himself was so soon likely to remove to the eunuch. He had so little idea that Susan would really remain firm to her determination, that he at once began to haggle with the man who came after his farm, showed him the crop just got in, and managed skilfully enough to make a good bargain for himself. Of course, the bargain had to be sealed at the public house, and the companions he met with there soon became friends enough to tempt him into Langdale, where again he met with Eleanor Hebthwaite. How did Susan pass the time? For the first day or so she was too angry and offended to cry. She went about her household duties in a quick, sharp, jerking, yet absent way, shrinking one moment from Will, overwhelming him with remorseful caresses the next. The third day of Michael's absence, 
she had the relief of a good fit of crying, and after that she grew softer and more tender. She felt how harshly she had spoken to him, and remembered how angry she had been. She made excuses for him. It was no wonder, she said to herself, that he had been vexed with her, and no wonder he would not give in when she had never tried to speak gently or to reason with him. She was to blame, and she would tell him so, and tell him once again, all that her mother had bade her to be to Willie, and all the horrible stories she had heard about madhouses, and he would be on her side at once. And so she watched for his coming, intending to apologise as soon as ever she saw him. She hurried over her household work, in order to sit quietly at her sewing, and hear the first distant sound of his well-known step or whistle, but even the sound of her flying needle seemed too loud. Perhaps she was losing an exquisite instant of anticipation. So she stopped sewing and looked longingly out through the geranium leaves, so that her eye might catch the first stir of the branches in the wood path by which he generally came. Now and then a bird might spring out of the covert. Otherwise the leaves were heavily still in the sultry weather of early autumn. Then she would take up her sewing, and with a spasm of resolution, she would determine that a certain task should be fulfilled before she would again allow herself the poignant luxury of expectation. Sick at heart was she when the evening closed in, and the chances of that day diminished. Yet she stayed up longer than usual, thinking that if he were coming, if he were only passing along the distant road, the sight of a light in the window might encourage him to make his appearance, even at that late hour, while seeing the house all darkened and shut up might quench any such intention. Very sick and weary at heart, she went to bed, too desolate and despairing to cry or make any moan. But in the morning hope came afresh, another day, another chance, and so it went on for weeks. Peggy understood her young mistress's sorrow full well, and respected it by her silence on the subject. Willie seemed happier now that the irritation of Michael's presence was removed, for the poor idiot had a sort of antipathy to Michael, which was a kind of heart's echo to the repugnance in which the latter held him. Altogether, just at this time, Willie was the happiest of the three. As Susan went into Coniston to sell her butter one Saturday, some inconsiderate person told her that they had seen Michael Hurst the night before. I said inconsiderate, but I might rather have said unobservant, for anyone who had spent half an hour in Susan Dixon's company might have seen that she disliked having any reference made to the subjects nearest to her heart, were they joyous or grievous. Now she went a little paler than usual, and she had never recovered her colour since she had had the fever, and tried to keep silence. But an irrepressible pang forced out the question, Where? At Thomas Applethwaite's in Langdale. They had a kind of harvest home, and they were there among the young folk, and very thick with Nelly Epthwaite, old Thomas's niece. Thou was have to look after him a bit, Susan. She neither smiled nor sighed. The neighbour who had been speaking to her was struck with the grey stillness of her face. Susan herself felt how well her self-command was obeyed by every little muscle, and said to herself, in her Spartan manner, I can bear it without either wincing or blenching. She went home early, at a tearing, passionate pace, trampling and breaking through all obstacles of briar or bush. Willie was moping in her absence, hanging listlessly on the farmyard gate to watch for her. When he saw her, he set up one of his strange inarticulate cries, of which he was now learning the meaning, and came towards her with his loose, galloping run, head and limbs all shaking and wagging with pleasant excitement. Suddenly she turned from him and burst into tears. She sat down on a stone by the wayside, not a hundred yards from home, and buried her face in her hands, and gave way to a passion of pent-up sorrow. So terrible and full of agony were her low cries, that the idiot stood by her, aghast and silent, all his joy gone for the time, 
but not, like her joy, turned into ashes. Some thought struck him. Yes, the sight of her woe made him think, great as the exertion was. He ran and stumbled and shambled home, buzzing with his lips all the time. She never missed him. He came back in a trice, bringing with him his cherished paper windmill, bought on that fatal day when Michael had taken him into Kendall, to have his doom of perpetual idiotcy pronounced. He thrust it into Susan's face, her hands, her lap, regardless of the injury his frail plaything thereby received. He leapt before her to think how he had cured all heart sorrow, buzzing louder than ever. Susan looked up at him, and that glance of her sad eyes sobered him. He began to whimper, he knew not why, and she, now, comforter in her turn, tried to soothe him by twirling his windmill. But it was broken, it made no noise, it would not go round. This seemed to afflict Susan more than him. She tried to make it right, although she saw the task was hopeless, and while she did so, the tears rained down unheeded from her bent head on the paper toy. "'It won't do,' said she at last. "'It will never do again.' And somehow she took the accidents and her words as omens of the love that was broken and that she feared could never be pieced together again. She rose up and took Willie's hand, and the two went in slowly to the house. To her surprise, Michael Hurst sat in the house place. House place is a sort of better kitchen, where no cookery is done, but which is reserved for state occasions. Michael had gone in there because he was accompanied by his only sister, a woman older than himself, who was well married beyond Keswick, and who now came for the first time to make acquaintance with Susan. Michael had primed his sister with his wishes with regard to Will, and the position in which he stood with Susan, and arriving at Eunuch in the absence of the latter, he had not scrupled to conduct his sister into the guest room, as he held Mrs. Gale's worldly position in respect and admiration, and therefore wished her to be favourably impressed with all the signs of property which he was beginning to consider as Susan's greatest charms. He had secretly said to himself that if Eleanor Hepthwaite and Susan Dixon were equal as to riches, he would sooner have Eleanor by far. He had begun to consider Susan as a termagant, and when he thought of his intercourse with her, Recollections of her somewhat warm and hasty temper came far more readily to his mind than any remembrance of her generous, loving nature. And now she stood face to face with him, her eyes tear-swollen, her garments dusty, and here and there torn in consequence of her rapid progress through the bushy bypaths. She did not make a favourable impression on the well-clad Mrs. Gale, dressed in her best silk gown, and therefore unusually susceptible to the appearance of another. Nor were her manners gracious or cordial. How could they be, when she remembered what had passed between Michael and herself the last time they met? For her penitence had faded away under the daily disappointment of those last weary weeks. But she was hospitable in substance. She bade Peggy hurry on the kettle and busied herself among the teacups, thankful that the presence of Mrs. Gale as a stranger would prevent the immediate recurrence to the one subject which he felt must be present in Michael's mind, as well as in her own. But Mrs. Gale was withheld by no such feelings of delicacy. She had come ready primed with the case, and had undertaken to bring the girl to reason. There was no time to be lost. It had been prearranged between the brother and sister that he was to stroll out into the farmyard before his sister introduced the subject. But she was so confident in the success of her arguments that she must needs have the triumph of a victory as soon as possible, and accordingly she brought a hailstorm of good reasons to bear upon Susan's. Susan did not reply for a long time. She was so indignant at this intermeddling of a stranger in the deep family sorrow and shame. Mrs. Gale thought she was gaining the day, and urged her arguments more pitilessly. Even Michael winced for Susan, and wondered at her silence. He shrunk out of sight, and into the shadow, 
hoping that his sister might prevail, but annoyed at the hard way in which she kept putting the case. Suddenly Susan turned round from the occupation she had pretended to be engaged in, and said to him in a low voice, which yet not only vibrated itself, but made its hearers vibrate through all their obtuseness. Michael Hurst, does your sister speak truth, think you? Both women looked at him for his answer, Mrs. Gale without anxiety, for had she not said the very words they had spoken together before, had she not used the very arguments that he himself had suggested? Susan, on the contrary, looked to his answer as settling her doom for life, and in the gloom of her eyes you might have read more despair than hope. He shuffled his position, he shuffled in his words. What is it you ask? My sister has said many things. I ask you, said Susan, trying to give a crystal clearness both to her expressions and her pronunciation, if, knowing as you do, how Will is afflicted, you will help me to take that charge of him that I promised my mother on her deathbed that I would do, and which means that I shall keep him always with me, and do all in my power to make his life happy. If you will do this, I will be your wife. If not, I remain unwed. But he may get dangerous. He can be but a trouble. His being here is a pain to you, Susan, not a pleasure. I ask you for either yes or no, said she, a little contempt at his evading her question mingling with her tone. He perceived it, and it nettled him. And I have told you. I answered your question the last time I was here. I said I would ne'er keep house with an idiot. No more I will. So now you've gotten your answer. I have, said Susan, and she sighed deeply. Come now, said Mrs Gale, encouraged by the sigh. One would think you don't love Michael, Susan, to be so stubborn in yielding to what I'm sure would be best for the lad. Oh, she does not care for me, said Michael. I don't believe she ever did. Don't I? Have not I? asked Susan, her eyes blazing out fire. She left the room directly and sent Peggy in to make the tea, and catching at Will, who was lounging about in the kitchen, she went upstairs with him, and bolted herself in, straining the boy to her heart, and keeping almost breathless, lest any noise she made should cause him to break out into the howls and sounds which she could not bear that those below should hear. A knock at the door. It was Peggy. He wants for to see you, to wish you good-bye. I cannot come. Oh, Peggy, send them away. It was her only cry for sympathy, and the old servant understood it. She sent them away somehow, not politely as I have been given to understand. Good, go with them, said Peggy, as she grimly watched their retreating figures. We're rid of bad rubbish anyhow. And she turned into the house with the intention of making ready some refreshments for Susan after her hard day at the market and her harder evening. But in the kitchen, to which she passed through the empty house place, making a face of contemptuous dislike at the used teacups and fragments of a meal yet standing there, she found Susan with her sleeves tucked up and her working apron on, busied in preparing to make clapbread one of the hardest and hottest domestic tasks of a daleswoman. She looked up and first met, and then avoided, Peggy's eye. It was too full of sympathy. Her own cheeks were flushed, and her own eyes were dry and burning. "'Where's the board, Peggy? We need clapbread, and I reckon I've time to get through with it tonight.' Her voice had a sharp, dry tone in it, and her motions had a jerking angularity in them. Peggy said nothing, but fetched her all that she needed. Susan beat her cakes thin with vehement force. As she stooped over them, regardless even of the task in which she seemed so much occupied, she was surprised by a touch on her mouth of something, what she did not see at first. It was a cup of tea, delicately sweetened and cooled, and held to her lips when exactly ready by the faithful old woman. Susan held it off a hand's breadth and looked into Peggy's eyes while her own filled with the strange relief of tears. Lass, said Peggy solemnly, 
thou hast done well. It's not long to bide, and then the end will come. But you are very old, Peggy, said Susan, quivering. It is but a day sin I were young, replied Peggy. But she stopped the conversation by again pushing the cup with gentle force to Susan's dry and thirsty lips. When she had drunken, she fell again to her labour, Peggy heating the hearth, and doing all that she knew would be required, but never speaking another word. Willie basked close enough to the fire, enjoying the animal luxury of warmth, for the autumn evenings were beginning to be chilly. It was one o'clock before they thought of going to bed on that memorable night. End of part two Part three of Half a Lifetime Ago by Elizabeth Gaskell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From Household Words, a weekly journal, conducted by Charles Dickens. Number 291, 20th of October, 1855. Chapter 4 The vehemence with which Susan Dixon threw herself into occupation could not last for ever. Times of languor and remembrance would come, times when she recurred with a passionate yearning to past days, the recollection of which was so vivid and delicious that it seemed as though it were the reality and the present bleak bareness the dream. She smiled anew at the magical sweetness of some touch or tone which in memory she felt and heard, and drank the delicious cup of poison, although at the very time she knew what the consequence of racking pain would be. This time last year, thought she, we went nutting together, this very day last year, just such a day as today, purple and gold were the lights on the hills. The leaves were just turning brown, here and there on the sunny slopes, the stubble fields looked tawny. Down in a cleft of yon purple slate rock, the beck fell like a silver glancing thread, all just as it is today, and he climbed the slender swaying nut trees, and bent the branches for me to gather, or made a passage through the hazel copses, from time to time claiming a toll. Who could have thought he loved me so little? Who? Who? Or, as the evening closed in, she would allow herself to imagine that she heard his coming step, just that she might recall the feeling of exquisite delight which had passed by without the due and passionate relish at the time. Then she would wonder how she could have had strength, the cruel self-piercing strength to say what she had done, to stab herself with that stern resolution of which the scar would remain till her dying day. It might have been right, but, as she sickened, she wished she had not instinctively chosen the right. How luxurious a life haunted by no stern sense of duty must be, and many led this kind of life, why could not she? Oh, for one hour again of his sweet company. If he came now, she would agree to whatever he proposed. It was a fever of the mind. She passed through it and came out healthy, if weak. She was capable once more of taking pleasure in following an unseen guide through briar and brake. She returned with tenfold affection to her protecting care of Willie. She acknowledged to herself that he was to be her all in all in life. She made him her constant companion. For his sake, as the real owner of Eunook, and she as his steward and guardian, she began that course of careful saving and that love of acquisition which afterwards gained for her the reputation of being miserly. She still thought that she might regain a scanty portion of sense, enough to require some simple pleasures and excitements which would cost money, and money should not be wanting. Peggy rather assisted her in the formation of her parsimonious habits than otherwise. Economy was the order of the district, and a certain degree of respectable avarice the characteristic of age. Only Willie was never stinted or hindered of anything that the two women thought could give him pleasure for want of money. There was one gratification which Susan felt was needed for the restoration of her mind to its more healthy state, after she had passed through the whirling fever 
when duty was as nothing and anarchy reigned, a gratification that somehow was to be her last burst of unreasonableness, of which she knew and recognised pain as the sure consequence. She must see him once more, herself unseen. The week before the Christmas of this memorable year, she went out into the dusk of the early winter evening, wrapped up close in shawl and cloak. She wore her dark shawl under her cloak, putting it over her head in lieu of a bonnet, for she knew that she might have to wait long in concealment. Then she tramped over the wet fell path, shut in by misty rain for miles and miles, till she came to the place where he was lodging, a farmhouse in Langdale with a steep stony lane leading up to it. This lane was entered by a gate out of the main road, and by the gate were a few bushes, thorns, but of them the leaves had fallen, and they offered no concealment. An old wreck of a yew tree grew among them, however, and underneath that Susan cowered down, shrouding her face, of which the colour might betray her, with a corner of her shawl. Long did she wait, cold and cramped she became, too damp and stiff to change her posture readily, and after all he might never come. But she would wait till daylight if need were, and she pulled out a crust with which she had providently supplied herself. The rain had ceased, a dull still brooding weather had succeeded, it was a night to hear distant sounds. She heard horses' hoofs striking and plashing in the stones and in the pools of the road at her back. Two horses, not well ridden or evenly guided, as she could tell. Michael Hurst and a companion drew near, not tipsy, but not sober. They stopped at the gate to bid each other a maudlin farewell. Michael stooped forward to catch the latch with the hook of the stick which he carried. He dropped the stick, and it fell with one end close to Susan. Indeed, with the slightest change of posture, she could have opened the gates for him. He swore a great oath, and struck his horse with his closed fist, as if that animal had been to blame. Then he dismounted, opened the gate, and fumbled about for his stick. When he had found it, Susan had touched the other end. His first use of it was to flog his horse well and she had much ado to avoid its kicks and plunges. Then, still swearing, he staggered up the lane, for it was evident he was not sober enough to remount. By daylight Susan was back, and at her daily labours at Eunook. When the spring came, Michael Hurst was married to Eleanor Hebthwaite. Others too were married, and christenings made their firesides merry and glad or they travelled and came back after long years with many wondrous tales. More rarely, perhaps, a dalesman changed his dwelling, but to all households more change came than to Eunook. There the seasons came round with monotonous sameness, or if they brought mutation it was of a slow and decaying and depressing kind. Old Peggy died, her silent sympathy concealed under much roughness, was a loss to Susan Dixon. Susan was not yet thirty when this happened, but she looked a middle-aged, not to say an elderly woman. People affirmed that she had never recovered her complexion since that fever a dozen years ago, which killed her father and left Will Dixon an idiot. But besides her grey sallowness, the lines in her face were strong and deep and hard. The movements of her eyeballs were slow and heavy. The wrinkles at the corners of her mouth and eyes were planted firm and sure. Not an ounce of unnecessary flesh was there on her bones. Every muscle started strong and ready for use. She needed all this bodily strength to a degree that no human creature, now Peggy was dead, knew of. For Willie had grown up, large and strong in body, and in general docile enough in mind. But, every now and then, he became first moody, and then violent. These paroxysms lasted but a day or two, and it was Susan's anxious care to keep their very existence hidden and unknown. It is true that occasional passers-by on that lonely road heard sounds at night of knocking about of furniture, blows and cries as of some tearing demon within the solitary farmhouse. 
but these fits of violence usually occurred in the night, and whatever had been their consequence, Susan had tidied and read up all signs of aught unusual before the morning. For, above all, she dreaded lest someone might find out in what danger and peril she occasionally was, and might assume a right to take away her brother from her care. The one idea of taking charge of him had deepened and deepened with the years. It was graven into her mind as the object for which she lived. The sacrifice she had made for this object only made it more precious to her. Besides, she separated the idea of the docile, affectionate, loutish, indolent will and kept it distinct from the terror which that demon that occasionally possessed him inspired her with. The one was her flesh and her blood, the child of her dead mother, the other was some fiend who came to torture and convulse the creature she so loved. She believed that she fought her brother's battle in holding down those tearing hands, in binding whenever she could those uplifted restless arms, prompt and prone to do mischief. All the time she subdued him with her cunning or her strength, she spoke to him in pitying murmurs, or abused the third person, the fiendish enemy, in no unmeasured tones. Towards morning the paroxysm was exhausted, and he would fall asleep, perhaps only to waken with evil and renewed vigour. But when he was laid down, she would sally out to taste the fresh air, and to work off her wild sorrow in cries and mutterings to herself. The early labourers saw her gestures at a distance, and thought her as crazed as the idiot's brother who made the neighbourhood a haunted place. But did any chance person call at Eunuch later, or in the day, he would find Susan Dixon cold, calm, collected, her manner curt, her wits keen. Once this fit of violence lasted longer than usual, Susan's strength, both of mind and body, was nearly worn out. She wrestled in prayer, that somehow it might end before she too was driven mad, or worse, might be obliged to give up life's aim and consign Willie to a madhouse. From that moment of prayer, as she afterwards superstitiously thought, Willie calmed, and then he drooped, and then he sank, and last of all, he died, in reality, from physical exhaustion but he was so gentle and tender as he lay on his dying bed. Such strange childlike gleams of returning intelligence came over his face long after the power to make his dull inarticulate sounds had departed that Susan was attracted to him by a stronger tie than she had ever felt before. It was something to have even an idiot loving her with dumb, wistful animal affection, something to have any creature looking at her with such beseeching eyes, imploring protection from the insidious enemy stealing on. And yet she knew that to him death was no enemy, but a true friend, restoring light and health to his poor clouded mind. It was to her that death was an enemy, to her, the survivor when Willie died. There was no one to love her. Worse doom still, there was no one left on earth for her to love. You now know why no wandering tourist could persuade her to receive him as a lodger, why no tired traveller could melt her heart to give him rest and refreshment, why long habits of seclusion had given her a moroseness of manner and care for the interests of another had rendered her keen and miserly. But there was a third act in the drama of her life, Chapter 5 In spite of Peggy's prophecy that Susan's life should not seem long, it did seem wearisome and endless as year by year slowly uncoiled their monotonous circles. To be sure, she might have made change for herself, but she did not care to do it. It was indeed more than not caring, which merely implies a certain degree of vis inertiae to be subdued before an object can be obtained and that the object itself does not seem to be of sufficient importance to call out the requisite energy. On the contrary, Susan exerted herself to avoid change and variety. 
she had a morbid dread of new faces, which originated in her desire to keep poor dead Willie's state a profound secret. She had a contempt for new customs, and indeed her old ways prospered so well under her active hand and vigilant eye that it was difficult to know how they could be improved upon. She was regularly present in Coniston Market with the best butter and the earliest chickens of the season. Those were the common farm produce that every farmer's wife about had to sell. But Susan, after she had disposed of the more feminine articles, turned to on the man's side. A better judge of a horse or cow there was not in all the country round. Yorkshire itself might have attempted to jockey her and would have failed. Her corn was sound and clean, her potatoes well preserved to the latest spring. People began to talk of the hoards of money Susan Dixon must have laid up somewhere, and one young ne'er-do-well of a farmer's son undertook to make love to the woman of forty, who looked fifty-five if a day. He made up to her by opening a gate on the road-path home, as she was riding on a bare-backed horse, her purchase not an hour ago. She was off before him, refusing his civility, but the remounting was not so easy, and rather than fail she did not choose to attempt it. She walked, and he walked alongside, improving his opportunity, which, as he vainly thought, had been consciously granted to him. As they drew near Eunuch, he ventured on some expression of a wish to keep company with her. His words were vague and clumsily arranged, Susan turned round and coolly asked him to explain himself. He took courage, as he thought, of her reputed wealth, and expressed his wishes, this second time pretty plainly. To his surprise, the reply she made was in a series of smart strokes across his shoulders, administered through the medium of a supple hazel switch. "'Take that,' said she, almost breathless, "'to teach thee how thou darest make a fool of an honest woman.' "'Old enough to be thy mother. "'If thou comest a step nearer the house, "'there's a good horse-pool, "'and there's two stout fellows "'who'll like no better fun than ducking thee. "'Be off with thee.' "'And she strode into her own premises, "'never looking round to see "'whether he obeyed her injunction or not. "'Sometimes three or four years would pass over "'without her hearing Michael Hurst's name mentioned.' She used to wonder at such times whether he were dead or alive. She would sit for hours by the dying embers of her fire on a winter's evening, trying to recall the scenes of her youth, trying to bring up living pictures of the faces she had then known, Michael's most especially. She thought that it was possible, so long had been the lapse of the years, that she might now pass by him in the street, unknowing and unknown. His outward form she might not recognise, but himself she should feel in the thrill of her whole being. He could not pass her unawares. What little she did hear about him all testified a downwards tendency. He drank, not at stated times when there was no other work to be done, but continually, whether it was seed time or harvest. His children were ill at one time, then one died while the others recovered, but were poor sickly things. No one dared to give Susan any direct intelligence of her former lover. Many avoided all mention of his name in her presence, but a few spoke out, either in indifference to or ignorance of those bygone days. Susan heard every word, every whisper, every sound that related to him, but her eye never changed, nor did a muscle of her face move. Late one November night, she sat over her fire, not a human being besides herself in the house. None but she had ever slept there since Willie's death. The farm labourers had foddered the cattle and gone home hours before. There were crickets chirping all round the warm hearthstones. There was the clock ticking with the peculiar beat Susan had known ever since childhood, and which then and ever since she had oddly associated with the idea of a mother and child talking together, one loud tick, and a quick, a feeble, sharp one following. The day had been keen and piercingly cold. The whole lift of heaven seemed a dome of iron. 
Black and frost-bound was the earth under the cruel east wind. Now the wind had dropped, and as the darkness had gathered in, the weather-wise old labourers prophesied snow. The sounds in the air arose again as Susan sat still and silent. They were of a different character to what they had been during the prevalence of the east wind. Then they had been shrill and piping, now they were like low distant growling, not unmusical but strangely threatening. Susan went to the window and drew aside the little curtain. The whole world was white, the air was blinded with the swift and heavy downfall of snow. At present it came down straight, but Susan knew those distant sounds in the hollows and gullies of the hills pretended a driving wind and a more cruel storm. She thought of her sheep, were they all folded, the newborn calf, was it bedded well? Before the drifts were formed too deep for her to pass in and out, and by the morning she judged that they would be six or seven feet deep, she would go out and see after the comfort of her beasts. She took a lantern and tied a shawl over her head, and went out into the open air. She cared tenderly for all her animals, and was returning, when borne on the blast as if some spirit cry, for it seemed to come rather down from the skies than from any creature standing on earth's level, she heard a voice of agony. She could not distinguish words. It seemed rather as if some bird of prey was being caught in the whirl of the icy wind and torn and tortured by its violence. Again, up high above, Susan put down her lantern and shouted loud in return, it was an instinct, for if the creature were not human, which she had doubted but a moment before, what good could her responding cry do? And her cry was seized on by the tyrannous wind, and borne farther away in the opposite direction to that from which that call of agony had proceeded. Again she listened, no sound, then again it rang through space, and this time she was sure it was human, she turned into the house and heaped turf and wood on the fire, which, careless of her own sensations, she had allowed to fade and almost die out. She put a new candle in her lantern, she changed her shawl for a maud, and leaving the door unlatched, she sallied out. Just at that moment when her ear first encountered the weird noises of the storm, on issuing forth into the open air, she thought she heard the words, Oh God! Oh, help! They were a guide to her, if words they were, for they came straight from a rock not a quarter of a mile from Yew Nook, but only to be reached, on account of its precipitous character, by a roundabout path. Thither she steered, defying wind and snow, guided by here a thorn tree, there an old dodded oak which had not quite lost their identity under the overwhelming mask of snow. Now and then she stopped to listen, but never a word or sound heard she, till right from where the copsewood grew thick and tangled at the base of the rock round which she was winding, she heard a moan. Into the break, all snow in appearance, almost a plain of snow looked on from the little eminence where she stood, she plunged, breaking down the bush, stumbling, bruising herself, fighting her way, her lantern held between her teeth, and she herself using head as well as hands to butt away a passage at whatever cost of bodily injury. As she climbed or staggered, owing to the unevenness of the snow-covered ground where the briars and weeds of years were tangled and matted together, her foot felt something strangely soft and yielding. She lowered her lantern. There lay a man, prone on his face, nearly covered by the fast-falling flakes. He must have fallen from the rock above, as not knowing of the circuitous path, he had tried to descend its steep, slippery face. Who could tell? It was no time for thinking. Susan lifted him up with her wiry strength. He gave no help, no sign of life, but for all that he might be alive. He was still warm, she tied her maud round him, she fastened the lantern to her apron string, she held him tight half dragging, half carrying. What did a few bruises signify to him compared to dear life, to precious life? She got him through the brake and down the path. There for an instant she stopped to take breath, but, as if stung by the furies, 
she pushed on again with almost superhuman strength. Clasping him round the waist and leaning his dead weight against the lintel of the door, she tried to undo the latch, but just now, just at this moment, a trembling faintness came over her, and a fearful dread took possession of her, that here, on the very threshold of her home, she might be found dead and buried under the snow when the farm servants came in the morning. This terror stirred her up to one more effort. She and her companion were in the warmth of the quiet haven of that kitchen. She laid him on the settle and sank on the floor by his side. How long she remained in this swoon, she could not tell. Not very long she judged by the fire which was still red and sullenly glowing when she came to herself. She lighted the candle and bent over her late burden to ascertain if indeed he were dead. She looked long, gazing. The man lay dead, there could be no doubt about it. His filmy eyes glared at her, and shut, but Susan was not one to be affrighted by the stony aspect of death. It was not that, it was the bitter, woeful recognition of Michael Hurst. She was convinced he was dead, but after a while she refused to believe in her conviction. She stripped off his wet outer garments with trembling, hurried hands. She brought a blanket down from her own bed. She made up the fire. She swathed him up in fresh, warm wrappings and laid him on the flags before the fire, sitting herself at his head and holding it in her lap while she tenderly wiped his loose, wet hair, curly still, although its colour had changed from nut-brown to iron-grey since she had seen it last. From time to time she bent over the face afresh, sick and fain to believe that the flicker of the firelight was some slight convulsive motion. But the dim staring eyes struck chill to her heart. At last she ceased her delicate busy cares, but she still held the head softly as if caressing it. She thought over all the possibilities and chances in the mingled yarn of their lives that might, by so slight a turn, have ended far otherwise. If her mother's cold had been early tended, so that the responsibility as to her brother's weal or woe had not fallen upon her, if the fever had not taken such rough, cruel hold on Will, nay, if Mrs. Gale, that hard worldly sister, had not accompanied him on his last visit to Eunuch, his very last before this fatal stormy night. If she had heard his cry, cry uttered by those pale dead lips, with such wild despairing agony, not yet three hours ago, oh, if she had but heard it sooner, he might have been saved before that blind false step had precipitated him down the rock, in going over this weary chain of unrealised possibilities, Susan learnt the force of Peggy's words. Life was short, looking back upon it. It seemed but yesterday since all the love of her being had been poured out and run to waste. The intervening years, the long monotonous years that had turned her into an old woman before her time, were but a dream. The labourers, coming in the dawn of the winter's day, were surprised to see the firelight through the low kitchen window. They knocked, and hearing a moaning answer, they entered, fearing that something had befallen their mistress. For all explanation, they got these words. It is Michael Hurst. He was belated, and fell down the raven's crag. Where does Eleanor, his wife, live? How Michael Hurst got to Eunuch, no one but Susan ever knew. They thought he had dragged himself there with some sore internal bruise, sapping away his minuted life. They could not have believed the superhuman exertion which had first sought him out, and then dragged him hither. Only Susan knew of that. She gave him into the charge of her servants, and went out and saddled her horse. Where the wind had drifted the snow on one side, and the road was clear and bare, she rode and rode fast. Where the soft, deceitful heaps were massed up, she dismounted and led her steed, plunging in deep with fierce energy 
the pain at her heart urging her onwards with a sharp digging spur. The grey solemn winter's noon was more night-like than the depth of summer's night. Dim purple brooded the low skies over the white earth as Susan rode up to what had been Michael Hurst's abode while living. It was a small farmhouse, carelessly kept outside, slatternly tended within. The pretty Nellie Hepthwaite was pretty still. Her delicate face had never suffered from any long-enduring feeling. If anything, its expression was that of plaintive sorrow. But the soft light hair had scarcely a tinge of grey. The wood-rose tint of the complexion yet remained, if not so brilliant as in youth. The straight nose, the small mouth were untouched by time. Susan felt the contrast even at that moment. She knew that her own skin was weather-beaten, furrowed, brown, that her teeth were gone, and her hair grey and ragged. And yet she was not two years older than Nelly. She had not been in youth when she took account of these things. Nelly stood wondering at the strange enough horsewoman, who stood and panted at the door, holding her horse's bridle and refusing to enter. "'Where is Michael Hurst?' asked Susan at last. "'Well, I can't rightly say. He should have been at home last night, but he was off seeing after a public house to be let at Ulverston, for our farm does not answer, and we were thinking—' "'He did not come home last night,' said Susan, cutting short the story, and half affirming, half questioning, by way of letting in a ray of the awful light before she let it fall in in its consuming wrath. "'No, he'll be stopping somewhere out Ulverston ways. I'm sure we've need of him at home, for I've no one but Lyle Tommy to help me tend the beasts. Things have not gone well with us, and we don't keep a servant now, but you're trembling all over, ma'am. You'd better come in and take something warm while your horse rests. That's the stable door to your left. Susan took her horse there, loosened his girths, and rubbed him down with a wisp of straw. Then she looked about her for hay, but the place was bare of food and smelt damp and unused. She went to the house, thankful for the respite, and got some clapbread, which she mashed up in a pailful of lukewarm water. Every moment was a respite, and yet every moment made her dread the more the task that lay before her. It would be longer than she thought at first. She took the saddle off and hung about her horse, which seemed somehow more like a friend than anything else in the world. She laid her cheek against its neck and rested there before returning to the house for the last time. Eleanor had brought down one of her own gowns which hung on a chair against the fire and had made her unknown visitor a cup of hot tea. Susan could hardly bear all these little attentions. They choked her, and yet she was so wet, so weak with fatigue and excitement, that she could neither resist by word or by action. Two children stood awkwardly about, puzzled at the scene, and even Eleanor began to wish for some explanation of who her strange visitor was. "'You've maybe heard him speak of me. I'm called Susan Dixon.' Nellie coloured and avoided meeting Susan's eyes. "'I've heard other folk speak of you. He never named your name.' This respect of silence came like balm to Susan, balm not felt or heeded at the time it was applied, but very grateful in its effects for all that. "'He's at my house,' continued Susan, determined not to stop or quaver in the operation, the pain which must be inflicted. "'At your house? You nook?' questioned Eleanor, surprised. "'How came he there?' half jealously. "'Did he take shelter from the coming storm? "'Tell me. There is something. Tell me, woman.' "'He took no shelter. Would to God he had.' "'Oh, would to God! Would to God!' shrieked out Eleanor, "'learning all from the woeful import of those dreary eyes. "'Her cries thrilled through the house.' the children's piping wailings and passionate cries on Daddy! Daddy! pierced into Susan's very marrow, but she remained as still and tearless as the great round face upon the clock. At last, in a lull of crying, she said, not exactly questioning, 
but as if partly to herself. You loved him, then? Love him? He was my husband. He was the father of three bonny bairns that lie dead in Grassmere churchyard. I wish you'd go, Susan Dixon, and let me weep without you watching me. I wish you'd never come near the place. Alas, alas, it would not have brought him to life. I would have laid down my own to save his. My life has been so very sad. No one would have cared if I had died. Alas, alas. The tone in which she said this was so utterly mournful and despairing that it awed Nelly into quiet for a time. But by and by, she said, I would not turn a dog out to do it harm, but the night is clear, and Tommy shall guide you to the red cow. But, oh, I want to be alone. If you'll come back tomorrow, I'll be better, and I'll hear all, and thank you for every kindness you have shown him, and I do believe you've showed him kindness, though I don't know why. Susan moved heavily and strangely. She said something. Her words came, thick and unintelligible. She had had a paralytic stroke since she had last spoken. She could not go, even if she would. Nor did Eleanor, when she became aware of the state of the case, wish her to leave. She had laid on her own bed, and weeping silently all the while for her lost husband, she nursed Susan like a sister. She did not know what her guest's worldly position might be, and she might never be repaid but she sold many a little trifle to purchase such small comforts as Susan might need. Susan, lying still and motionless, learnt much. It was not a severe stroke. It might be the forerunner of others yet to come, but at some distance of time. But for the present she recovered and regained much of her former health. On her sick bed she matured her plans. When she returned to Eunuch, she took Michael Hurst's widow and children with her to live there and fill up the haunted hearth with living forms that should banish the ghosts. And so it fell out that the latter days of Susan Dixon's life were better than the former. End of Part 3 End of Half a Lifetime Ago by Elizabeth Gaskell Read by Phil Benson in Sydney, Australia Chapter One of The Poor Clare by Elizabeth Gaskell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Household Words, a weekly journal conducted by Charles Dickens, number 351, Saturday, 13th of December, 1856. December 12th, 1747 My life has been strangely bound up with extraordinary incidents, some of which occurred before I had any connection with the principal actors in them, or, indeed, before I even knew of their existence. I suppose most old men are like me, more given to look back upon their own career with a kind of fond interest and affectionate remembrance than to watch the events though these may have far more interest for the multitude, immediately passing before their eyes. If this should be the case with the generality of old people, how much more so with me? If I am to enter upon that strange story connected with poor Lucy, I must begin a long way back. I myself only came to the knowledge of her family history after I knew her, but to make the tale clear to anyone else, I must arrange events in the order in which they occurred not that in which I became acquainted with them. There is a great old hall in the north-east of Lancashire, in a part they call the Trough of Boland, adjoining that other district named Craven. Starkey Manor House is rather like a number of rooms clustered round a grey massive old keep than a regularly built hall. Indeed, I suppose that the house only consisted of the great tower in the centre in the days when the Scots made their raids, terrible as far south as this, and that after the Stuarts came in, and there was a little more security of property in those parts, the Starkies of that time added the lower building, which runs two stories high, all round the base of the keep. There has been a grand garden laid out in my days on the southern slope near the house, 
but when I first knew the place, the kitchen garden at the farm was the only piece of cultivated ground belonging to it. The deer used to come within sight of the drawing-room windows, and might have browsed close up to the house, if they had not been too wild and shy. Starkey Manor House itself stood on a projection or peninsula of high land, jutting out from the abrupt hills that formed the sides of the Trough of Boland. These hills were rocky and bleak enough towards their summit, lower down they were clothed with tangled copsewood and green depths of fern, out of which a grey giant of an ancient forest tree would tower here and there, throwing up its ghastly white branches, as if in imprecation to the sky. These trees, they told me, were the remnants of that forest which existed in the days of the Heptarchy, and were even then noted as landmarks. No wonder that their upper and more exposed branches were leafless, and that the dead bark had peeled away from sapless old age. Not far from the house there were a few cottages, apparently of the same date as the keep, probably built for some retainers of the family who sought shelter, they and their families and their small flocks and herds, at the hands of their feudal lord. Some of them had pretty much fallen to decay, They were built in a strange fashion. Strong beams had been sunk firm in the ground at the requisite distance, and their other ends had been fastened together, two and two, so as to form the shape of one of those rounded wagon-headed gypsy tents, only very much larger. The spaces between were filled with mud, stones, osiers, rubbish, mortar, anything to keep out the weather. The fires were made in the centre of these rude dwellings, a hole in the roof forming the only chimney. No highland hut, no Irish cabin, could be of rougher construction. The owner of this property at the beginning of the present century was a Mr. Patrick Byrne Starkey. His family had kept to the old faith and were staunch Roman Catholics, esteeming it even a sin to marry anyone of Protestant descent, however willing he or she might have been to embrace the Romish religion. Mr. Patrick Starkey's father had been a follower of James II, and during the disastrous Irish campaign of that monarch, he had fallen in love with an Irish beauty, a Miss Byrne, as zealous for her religion and for the Stuarts as himself. He had returned to Ireland after his escape to France and married her, bearing her back to the court at Saint-Germain. But some licence on the part of the disorderly gentleman who surrounded King James in his exile had insulted his beautiful wife and disgusted him. So he removed from Saint-Germain to Antwerp in Belgium, whence, in a few years' time, he quietly returned to Starkey Manor House, some of his Lancashire neighbours having lent their good offices to reconcile him to the powers that were. He was as firm a Roman Catholic as ever, and as staunch an advocate for the Stuarts and the divine rights of kings, but his religion almost amounted to asceticism, and the conduct of those with whom he had been brought in such close contact at Saint-Germain would little bear the inspection of a stern moralist. So he gave his allegiance where he could not give his esteem, and learned to respect sincerely the upright and moral character of one whom he yet regarded as an usurper. King William's government had little need to fear such an one, so he returned, as I have said, with a sobered heart and impoverished fortunes, to his ancestral house, which had fallen sadly to ruin, while the owner had been a courtier, a soldier, and an exile. The roads into the Trough of Boland were little more than cart ruts. Indeed, the way up to the house lay along a ploughed field, before you came to the deer park. Madam, as the country folk used to call Mrs. Starkey, rode on a pillion behind her husband, holding on to him with a light hand by his leather riding belt. Little Master, he that was afterwards Squire Patrick Byrne Starkey, was held on to his pony by a serving man. A woman past middle age walked with a firm and strong step by the cart that held much of the baggage, and high up on the mails and boxes sat a girl of dazzling beauty, perched lightly on the topmost trunk, and swaying herself fearlessly to and fro, as the cart rocked and shook in the heavy roads of late autumn. The girl wore the Antwerp fail, 
or black Spanish mantle over her head, and altogether her appearance was such that the old cottager who described the procession to me many years after said that all the country folk took her for a foreigner. Some dogs and the boy who held them in charge made up the company. They rode silently along, looking with grave, serious eyes at the people who came out of the scattered cottages to bow or curtsy to the real squire, come back at last, and gazed after them with gaping wonder, not deadened by the sound of the foreign language in which the few necessary words that passed among them were spoken. One lad, called from his staring by the squire to come and help about the cart, accompanied them to the manor-house. He said that when the lady had descended from her pillion, the middle-aged woman whom I have described as walking while the others rode, stepped quickly forward, and taking Madame Starkey, who was of a slight and delicate figure, in her arms, she lifted her over the threshold and sat her down in her husband's house at the same time uttering a passionate and outlandish blessing. The squire stood by, smiling gravely at first, but when the words of blessing were pronounced, he took off his fine feathered hat and bent his head. The girl with the black mantle stepped onward into the shadow of the dark hall and kissed the lady's hand, and that was all the lad could tell to the group that gathered round him on his return, eager to hear all and to know how much the squire had given him for his services. From all I could gather, the manor-house was in the most dilapidated state at the time of the squire's return. The stout grey walls remained firm and entire, but the inner chambers had been used for all kinds of purposes. The great withdrawing-room had been a barn, the state tapestry chamber had held wool and so on, but by and by they were cleared out and if the squire had no money to spend on new furniture, he and his wife had the knack of making the best of the old. He was no despicable joiner. She had a kind of grace in whatever she did, and imparted an air of elegant picturesqueness to whatever she touched. Besides, they had brought many rare things from the continent. Perhaps I should rather say things that were rare in that part of England, carvings and crosses and beautiful pictures. And then again, wood was plentiful in the trough of Boland, and great log fires danced and glittered in all the dark old rooms, and gave a look of home and comfort to everything. Why do I tell you all this? I have little to do with the squire and Madame Starkey, and yet I dwell upon them as if I were unwilling to come to the real people with whom my life was so strangely mixed up. Madam had been nursed in Ireland by the very woman who took her up and welcomed her to her husband's home in Lancashire. Excepting for the short period of her own married life, Bridget Fitzgerald had never left her nursling. Her marriage to one above her in rank had been unhappy. Her husband had died and left her in even greater poverty than that in which she was when he had met with her at first. She had one child, the beautiful daughter who came riding on the wagon-load of furniture that was brought to the manor-house. Madame Starkey had taken her again into her service when she became a widow. She and her daughter had followed the mistress in all her fortunes. They had lived at Saint-Germain and at Antwerp, and were now come to her home in Lancashire. As soon as Bridget had arrived there, the squire gave her a cottage of her own, and took more pains in furnishing it for her than he did in anything else out of his own house. It was only nominally her residence. She was constantly up at the great house. Indeed, it was only a short cut across the woods from her own home to the home of her nursling. Her daughter Mary, in like manner, moved from one house to another at her own will. Madame loved both mother and child dearly. They had great influence over her and, through her, over her husband. Whatever Bridget or Mary willed was sure to come to pass. They were not disliked, for though wild and passionate, they were also generous by nature, but the other servants were afraid of them, as being in secret the ruling spirits of the household. The squire had lost his interest in all secular things. 
Madame was gentle, affectionate and yielding. Both husband and wife were tenderly attached to each other and to their boy. But they grew more and more to shun the trouble of decision on any point, and hence it was that Bridget could exert such despotic power. But if everyone else yielded to her magic of a superior mind, her daughter not unfrequently rebelled. She and her mother were too much alike to agree. There were wild quarrels between them, and wilder reconciliations. There were times when, in the heat of passion, they could have stabbed each other. At all other times, they both, Bridget especially, would have willingly laid down their lives for one another. Bridget's love for her child lay very deep, deeper than that the daughter ever knew, or I should think she would never have wearied of home as she did, and prayed her mistress to obtain for her some situation as waiting-maid, beyond the seas, in that more cheerful continental life, among the scenes of which so many of her happiest years had been spent. She thought, as youth thinks, that life would last for ever, and that two or three years were but a small portion of it to pass away from her mother, whose only child she was. Bridget thought differently, but was too proud to ever show what she felt. If her child wished to leave her, why, she should go. But people said Bridget became ten years older in the course of two months at this time. She took it that Mary wanted to leave her. The truth was that Mary wanted for a time to leave the place and to seek some change, and would thankfully have taken her mother with her. Indeed, when Madame Starkey had gotten her a place with some grand lady abroad, and the time drew near for her to go, it was Mary who clung to her mother with passionate embrace, and with floods of tears declared that she would never leave her. And it was Bridget who at last loosened her arms, and grey and tearless herself, bade her keep her word, and go forth into the wide world. Sobbing aloud and looking back continually, Mary went away. Bridget was as still as death, scarcely drawing her breath or closing her stony eyes, till at last she turned back into her cottage and heaved a ponderous old settle against the door. There she sat, motionless over the grey ashes of her extinguished fire, deaf to Madame's sweet voice as she begged leave to enter and comfort her nurse. Deaf, stony and emotionless she sat for more than twenty hours, till, for the third time, Madame came across the snowy path from the great house, carrying with her a young spaniel which had been Mary's pet up at the hall, and which had not ceased all night long to seek for its absent mistress, and to whine and moan after her. With tears, Madame told this story through the closed door, tears excited by the terrible look of anguish, so steady, so immovable, so the same today as it was yesterday on her nurse's face. The little creature in her arms began to utter its piteous cry as it shivered with the cold. Bridget stirred, she moved, she listened. Again, that long whine. She thought it was for her daughter, and what she had denied to her nursling and mistress she granted to the dumb creature that Mary had cherished. She opened the door and took the dog from Madame's arms. Then Madame came in and kissed and comforted the old woman, who took but little notice of her or anything, and sending up Master Patrick to the hall for fire and food, the sweet young lady never left her nurse all that night. Next day the squire himself came down, carrying a beautiful foreign picture, Our Lady of the Holy Heart, the papists call it. It is a picture of the Virgin, her heart pierced with arrows, each arrow representing one of her greatest woes. That picture hung in Bridget's cottage when I first saw her. I have that picture now. Years went on. Mary was still abroad. Bridget was still and stern, instead of active and passionate. The little dog, Mignon, was indeed her darling. I have heard that she talked to it continually, although to most people she was so silent. The squire and madam treated her with the greatest consideration, and well they might, 
for to them she was as devoted and faithful as ever. Mary wrote pretty often, and seemed satisfied with her life, but at length the letters ceased. I hardly know whether before or after a great and terrible sorrow came upon the house of the Starkies. The squire sickened of a putrid fever, and madam caught it in nursing him, and died. You may be sure, Bridget let no other woman tend her but herself, and in the very arms that had received her at her birth, that sweet young woman laid her head down, and gave up her breath. The squire recovered in a fashion. He was never strong. He had never the heart to smile again. He fasted and prayed more than ever, and people did say that he tried to cut off the entail and leave all the property away to found a monastery abroad, of which he prayed that some day little Squire Patrick might be the Reverend Father. But he could not do this, for the strictness of the entail and the laws against the Papists, so he could only appoint gentlemen of his own faith as guardians to his son, with many charges about the lad's soul, and a few about the land, and the way it was to be held while he was a minor. Of course, Bridget was not forgotten. He sent for her as he lay on his deathbed, and asked her if she would rather have a sum down, or have a small annuity settled upon her. She said at once she would have a sum down, for she thought of her daughter, and how she could bequeath the money to her, whereas an annuity would have died with her. So the squire left her her cottage for life, and a fair sum of money, and then he died with as ready and willing a heart as, I suppose, ever any gentleman took out of this world with him. The young squire was carried off by his guardians, and Bridget was left alone. I have said that she had not heard from Mary for some time. In her last letter she had told of travelling about with her mistress, who was the English wife of some great foreign officer, and had spoken of her chances of making a good marriage, without naming the gentleman's name, keeping it rather back as a pleasant surprise to her mother, his station and fortune being, as I had afterwards reason to know, far superior to anything she had a right to expect. Then came a long silence, and Madam was dead, and the squire was dead, and Bridget's heart was gnawed by anxiety, and she knew not whom to ask for news of her child. She could not write, and the squire had managed her communication with her daughter. She walked off to Hurst, and got a good priest there, one whom she had known at Antwerp, to write for her, but no answer came. It was like crying into the awful stillness of night. One day Bridget was missed by those neighbours who had been accustomed to mark her outgoings and incomings. She had never been sociable with any of them, but the sight of her had become part of their daily lives, and slow wonder arose in their minds, as morning after morning came, and her house door remained closed her window dead from any glitter or light of fire within. At length, someone tried the door. It was locked. Two or three laid their heads together, before daring to look in through the blank unshuttered window, but at last they summoned up courage, and then saw that Bridget's absence from their little world was not the result of accident or death, but of premeditation. Such small articles of furniture as could be secured from the effects of time and damp by being packed up were stowed away in boxes. The picture of the Madonna was taken down and gone. In a word, Bridget had stolen away from her home and left no trace where she was departed. I knew afterwards that she and her little dog had wandered off on the long search for her lost daughter. She was too illiterate to have faith in letters even had she had the means of writing and sending many, but she had faith in her own strong love and believed that her passionate instincts would guide her to her child. Besides, foreign travel was no new thing to her, and she could speak enough of French to explain the object of her journey, and had, moreover, the advantage of being from her faith, a welcome object of charitable hospitality at many a distant convent but the country people round Starkey Manor House knew nothing of all this. They wondered what had become of her, 
in a torpid, lazy fashion, and then left off thinking of her altogether. Several years passed. Both manor house and cottage were deserted. The young squire lived far away under the direction of his guardians. There were inroads of wool and corn into the sitting rooms of the hall, and some low talk from time to time among the hinds and country people, whether it would not be as well to break into old Bridget's cottage and save such of her goods as were left from the moth and rust which must be making sad havoc. But this idea was always quenched by the recollection of her strong character and passionate anger, and tales of her masterful spirit and vehement force of will were whispered about till the very thought of offending her by touching any article of hers became invested with a kind of horror. It was believed that dead or alive she would not fail to avenge it. Suddenly she came home, with as little noise or note of preparation as she had departed. One day, someone noticed a thin blue curl of smoke ascending from her chimney. Her door stood open to the noonday sun, and ere many hours had elapsed, someone had seen an old travel and sorrow-stained woman dipping her pitcher in the well, and said that the dark solemn eyes that looked up at him were more like Bridget Fitzgerald's than anyone else's in this world, and yet... If it were she, she looked as if she had been scorched in the flames of hell, so brown and seared and fierce a creature did she seem. By and by many saw her, and those who met her eye once cared not to be caught looking at her again. She had got into the habit of perpetually talking to herself, nay, more, answering herself and varying her tones according to the side she took at the moment. It was no wonder that those who dared to listen outside her door at night believed that she held converse with some spirit. In short, she was unconsciously earning for herself the dread reputation of a witch. Her little dog, which had wandered half over the continent with her, was her only companion, a dumb remembrancer of happy days. Once he was ill, as she carried him more than three miles to ask about his management from one who had been groomed to the last squire and had then been noted for his skill in all diseases of animals. Whatever this man did, the dog recovered, and they who heard her thanks intermingled with blessings that were rather promises of good fortune than prayers, looked grave at his good luck when, next year, his ewes twinned and his meadow grass was heavy and thick. Now it so happened that about the year 1711, one of the guardians of the young squire, a certain Sir Philip Tempest, bethought him of the good shooting there must be on his ward's property, and in consequence he brought down four or five gentlemen of his friends to stay for a week or two at the hall. From all accounts they roistered and spent pretty freely. I never heard any of their names but one, and that was Squire Gisborne's. He was hardly a middle-aged man then. He had been much abroad, and there, I believe, he had known Sir Philip Tempest and done him some service. He was a daring and dissolute fellow in those days, careless and fearless, and one who would rather be in a quarrel than out of it. He had his fits of ill-temper beside, when he would spare neither man nor beast. Otherwise those who knew him well used to say he had a good heart, when he was neither drunk nor angry, nor in any way vexed. He had altered much when I came to know him. One day the gentlemen had all been out shooting, and with but little success, I believe. Anyhow, Mr. Gisborne had had none, and was in a black humour accordingly. He was coming home, having his gun loaded, sportsmanlike, when little Mignon crossed his path, just as he turned out of the wood by Bridget's cottage. Partly for wantonness, partly to vent his spleen upon some living creature, Mr. Gisborne took his gun and fired. He had better have never fired gun again than aimed that unlucky shot. He hit Mignon, and at the creature's sudden cry, Bridget came out and saw at a glance what had been done. 
She took Mignon up in her arms and looked hard at the wound. The poor dog looked at her with his glazing eyes and tried to wag his tail and lick her hand, all covered with blood. Mr. Gisborne spoke in a kind of sullen penitence. You should have kept that dog out of my way, a little poaching varmint. At this very moment, Mignon stretched out his legs and stiffened in her arms. Her lost Mary's dog, who had wandered and sorrowed with her for years. She walked right into Mr. Gisborne's path and fixed his unwilling sullen look with her dark and terrible eye. Those never throve that did me harm, said she. I'm alone in the world and helpless. The more do the saints in heaven hear my prayers. Hear me, blessed ones. Hear me, while I ask for sorrow on this bad, cruel man. He has killed the only creature that loved me, the dumb beast that I loved. Bring down heavy sorrow on his head for that deed, O ye saints. He thought that I was helpless because he saw me lonely and poor, but are not the armies of heaven for such a one as me? Come, come, said he, half remorseful, but not one whit afraid. Here's a crown to buy thee another dog. Take it and leave off cursing. I care none for thy threats. Don't you, said she, coming a step closer and changing her imprecatory cry for a whisper which made the gamekeeper's lad following Mr. Gisborne creep all over. You shall live to see the creature you love best and who alone loves you, a human creature, but as innocent and fond as my poor dead darling. You shall see this creature, for whom death would be too happy, become a terror and a loathing to all for this blood's sake. Hear me, O holy saints, who never fail them that have no other help. She threw up her right hand, filled with poor Mignon's life drops. They spurted, one or two of them, on his shooting dress, an ominous sight to the follower. But the master only laughed a little forced, scornful laugh, and went on to the hall. Before he got there, however, he took out a gold piece, and bade the boy carry it to the old woman on his return to the village. The lad was afeard, as he told me in after years. He came to the cottage and hovered about, not daring to enter. He peeped through the window at last, and by the flickering wood flame he saw Bridget kneeling before the picture of Our Lady of the Holy Heart, with dead Mignon lying between her and the Madonna. She was praying wildly as her outstretched arms betokened. The lad shrank away in redoubled terror and contented himself with slipping the gold piece under the ill-fitting door. The next day it was thrown out upon the midden and there it lay, no one daring to touch it. Meanwhile, Mr. Gisborne, half curious, half uneasy, thought to lessen his uncomfortable feelings by asking Sir Philip who Bridget was. He could only describe her, he did not know her name. Sir Philip was equally at a loss. But an old servant of the Starkies who had resumed his livery at the hall on this occasion, a scoundrel whom Bridget had saved from dismissal more than once during her palmy days, said, It will be the old witch that his worship means. She needs a ducking, if ever woman did. Does that Bridget Fitzgerald? Fitzgerald, said both the gentlemen at once. But Sir Philip was the first to continue. I must have no talk of ducking her, Dickon. Why, she must be the very woman poor Starkey bade me to have a care of. But when I came here last, she was gone. No one knew where. I'll go and see her tomorrow. But mind you, sirrah, if any harm comes to her, or any more talk of her being a witch, I've a pack of hounds at home who can follow the scent of a lying knave as well as ever they followed a dog fox. So take care how you talk about ducking a faithful old servant of your dead master's. Had she ever a daughter? asked Mr. Gisborne after a while. I don't know. Yes, I've a notion she had. A kind of waiting woman to Madam Starkey. Please, your worship, said humble Dickon. Mistress Bridget had a daughter, one Mistress Mary, who went abroad and has never been heard on since. 
and folk do say that has crazed her mother. Mr. Gisborne shaded his eyes with his hand. I could wish she had not cursed me, he muttered. She may have power. No one else could. After a while he said aloud, no one understanding rightly what he meant. Tush! It's impossible! And called for claret. And he and the other gentlemen set to to a drinking bout. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two of the Poor Clare by Elizabeth Gaskell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From Household Words, a weekly journal conducted by Charles Dickens. Number three hundred and fifty two, Saturday, twentieth of December, eighteen fifty six. I now come to the time in which I myself was mixed up with the people that I have been writing about and to make you understand how I became connected with them, I must give you some little account of myself. My father was the younger son of a Devonshire gentleman of moderate property. My eldest uncle succeeded to the estate of his forefathers. My second became an eminent attorney in London, and my father took orders. Like most poor clergymen, he had a large family, and I have no doubt was glad enough when my London uncle, who was a bachelor, offered to take charge of me and bring me up to be his successor in business. In this way I came to live in London, in my uncle's house not far from Gray's Inn, and to be treated and esteemed as his son, and to labour with him in his office. I was very fond of the old gentleman. He was the confidential agent of many country squires, and had attained to his present position as much by knowledge of human nature as by knowledge of law, though he was learned enough in the latter. He used to say his business was law, his pleasure heraldry. With his intimate acquaintance with family history, and all the tragic courses of life therein involved, to hear him talk at leisure times about any coat of arms that came across his path was as good as a play or a romance. Many cases of disputed property dependent on a love of genealogy were brought to him, as to a great authority on such points. If the lawyer who came to consult him was young, he would take no fee, only give him a long lecture on the importance of attending to heraldry. If the lawyer was of mature age and good standing, he would mulk him pretty well, and abuse him to me afterwards as negligent of one great branch of the profession. His house was in a stately new street called Ormond Street, and in it he had a handsome library, but all the books in it treated of things that were past. None of them planned or looked forward into the future. I worked away, partly for the sake of my family at home, partly because my uncle had really taught me to enjoy the kind of practice in which he himself took such a delight. I suspect I work too hard. At any rate... In 1718, I was far from well, and my good uncle was disturbed by my ill looks. One day he rang the bell twice into the clerk's room at the dingy office in Gray's Inn Lane. It was the summons for me, and I went into his private room, just as a gentleman, whom I knew well enough by sight as an Irish lawyer of more reputation than he deserved, was leaving. My uncle was slowly rubbing his hands together and considering. I was there two or three minutes before he spoke. Then he told me that I must pack up my portmanteau that very afternoon and start that night by post-horse for Westchester. I should get there, if all went well, at the end of five days' time and must then wait for a packet to cross over to Dublin. From thence I must proceed to a certain town named Kildoon and in that neighbourhood I was to remain, making certain inquiries as to the existence of any descendants of the younger branch of a family to whom some valuable estates had descended in the female line. The Irish lawyer whom I had seen was weary of the case and would willingly have given up the property without further ado to a man who appeared to claim them, but on laying his tables and trees before my uncle, the latter had foreseen so many possible prior claimants that the lawyer had begged him to undertake the management of the whole business. 
In his youth my uncle would have liked nothing better than going over to Ireland himself, and ferreting out every scrap of paper or parchment, and every word of tradition respecting the family. As it was, old and gouty, he deputed me. Accordingly, I went to Kildoon. I suspect I had something of my uncle's delight in following up a genealogical scent, for I very soon found out, when on the spot, that Mr. Rooney, the Irish lawyer, would have got both himself and the first claimant into a terrible scrape if he had pronounced his opinion that the estates ought to be given up to him. There were three poor Irish fellows, each nearer of kin to the last possessor, but a generation before there was a still nearer relation who had never been accounted for, nor his existence ever discovered by the lawyers, I venture to think, till I routed him out from the memory of some of the old dependents of the family. What had become of him? I travelled backwards and forwards, I crossed over to France and came back again with a slight clue which ended in my discovering that, wild and dissipated himself, he had left one child, a son, of yet worse character than his father, that this same Hugh Fitzgerald had married a very beautiful serving woman of the Burns, a person below him in hereditary rank, but above him in character, that he had died soon after his marriage, leaving one child, whether a boy or a girl I could not learn, and that the mother had returned to live in the family of the Burns. Now the chief of this latter family was serving in the Duke of Berwick's regiment, and it was long before I could hear from him. It was more than a year before I got a short, haughty letter. I fancy he had a soldier's contempt for a civilian, an Irishman's hatred for an Englishman, an exiled Jacobite's jealousy of one who prospered and lived tranquilly under the government he looked upon as an usurpation. Bridget Fitzgerald, he said, had been faithful to the fortunes of his sister, had followed her abroad into England when Mrs. Starkey had thought fit to return. Both his sister and her husband were dead. He knew nothing of Bridget Fitzgerald at the present time, Probably Sir Philip Tempest, his nephew's guardian, might be able to give me some information. I have not given the little contemptuous terms, the way in which faithful service was meant to imply more than it said. All that has nothing to do with my story. Sir Philip, when applied to, told me that he paid an annuity regularly to an old woman named Fitzgerald, living at Coldhome, the village near Starkey Manor House. Whether she had any descendants, he could not say. One bleak March evening, I came in sight of the places described in the beginning of my story. I could hardly understand the rude dialect in which the direction to old Bridget's house was given. You see, yon furleats, all run together, gave me no idea that I was to guide myself by the distant lights that shone in the windows of the hall, occupied for the time by a farmer who held the post of steward, while the squire, now four or five and twenty, was making the grand tour. However, at last I reached Bridget's cottage, a low moss-grown place. The palings that had once surrounded it were broken and gone, and the underwood of the forest came up to the walls, and must have darkened the windows. It was about seven o'clock, not late to my London notions, but after knocking for some time at the door and receiving no reply, I was driven to conjecture that the occupant of the house was gone to bed, so I betook myself to the nearest church I had seen, three miles back on the road I had come, sure that close to that I should find an inn of some kind. And early the next morning I set off back to Coldhome by a field path which my host assured me I should find a shorter cut than the road I had taken the night before. It was a cold, sharp morning. My feet left prints in the sprinkling of hoar-frost that covered the ground. Nevertheless, I saw an old woman, whom I instinctively suspected to be the object of my search, in a sheltered covert on one side of my path. I lingered and watched her. She must have been considerably above the middle size in her prime, for when she raised herself from the stooping position in which I first saw her, there was something fine and commanding in the first erectness of her figure. She drooped again in a minute or two, and seemed looking for something on the ground, as, with bent head, 
she turned off from the spot where I gazed upon her and was lost to my sight. I fancy I missed my way and made a round in spite of the landlord's directions, for by the time I had reached Bridget's cottage she was there, with no semblance of hurried walk or discomposure of any kind. The door was slightly ajar. I knocked, and the majestic figure stood before me, silently awaiting the explanation of my errand. Her teeth were all gone, so the nose and chin were brought near together. The grey eyebrows were straight and almost hung over her deep, cavernous eyes, and the thick white hair lay in silvery masses over the low, wide, wrinkled forehead. For a moment I stood uncertain how to shape my answer to the solemn questioning of her silence. "'Your name is Bridget Fitzgerald, I believe?' She bowed her head in assent. "'I have something to say to you. May I come in? I am unwilling to keep you standing.' "'You cannot tire me,' she said, and at first she seemed inclined to deny me the shelter of her roof. But the next moment she had searched the very soul in me with her eyes during that instant. She led me in, and dropped the shadowing hood of her grey draping cloak, which had previously hid part of the character of her countenance. The cottage was rude and bare enough, but before that picture of the Virgin, of which I have made mention, there stood a little cup, filled with fresh primroses. While she paid her reverence to the Madonna, I understood why she had been out seeking through the clumps of green in the sheltered copse. Then she turned round and bade me be seated. The expression of her face, which all this time I was studying, was not bad, as the stories of my last night's landlord had led me to expect. It was a wild, stern, fierce, indomitable countenance, seamed and scarred by agonies of solitary weeping, but it was neither cunning nor malignant. "'My name is Bridget Fitzgerald,' said she, by way of opening our conversation. "'And your husband was Hugh Fitzgerald of Knockmarn, near Kildoon in Ireland?' A faint light came in the dark gloom of her eyes. "'He was. May I ask if you had any children by him?' The light in her eyes grew quick and red. She tried to speak. I could see but something rose in her throat and choked her, and until she could speak calmly, she would fain not speak at all before a stranger. In a minute or so she said, I had a daughter, one Mary Fitzgerald. Then her strong nature mastered her strong will, and she cried out with a trembling, wailing cry, Oh, man, what of her, what of her? She rose from her seat and came and clutched at my arm, and looked in my eyes. There she read, as I suppose, my utter ignorance of what had become of her child, for she went blindly back to her chair, and sat rocking and softly moaning to herself, as if I were not there, I not daring to speak to the lone and awful woman. After a little pause, she knelt down before the picture of Our Lady of the Holy Heart, and spoke to her by all the fanciful and poetic names of the litany, O oh, Rose of Sharon, O oh, Tower of David, O oh, Star of the Sea, have you no comfort for my sore heart? Am I for ever to hope? Grant me at least despair. And so on she went, heedless of my presence. Her prayers grew wilder and wilder till they seemed to me to touch on the borders of madness and blasphemy. Almost involuntarily I spoke as if to stop her. "'Have you any reason to think that your daughter is dead?' She rose from her knees and came and stood before me. "'Mary Fitzgerald is dead,' said she. "'We shall never see her again in the flesh. "'No tongue ever told me, but I know she is dead. "'I have yearned so to see her, and my heart's will is fearful and strong. "'It would have drawn her to me before now if she had been a wanderer on the other side of the world.' I wonder often it has not drawn her out of the grave to come and stand before me, and hear me tell her how I loved her, for, sir, we parted unfriends. I knew nothing but the dry particulars needed for my lawyer's quest, but I could not help feeling for the desolate woman, and she must have read the unusual sympathy with her wistful eyes. Yes, sir, we did, 
she never knew how I loved her, and we parted on friends, and I fear me that I wished her voyage might not turn out well, only meaning, oh, blessed virgin, you know, I only meant that she should come home to her mother's arms, as to the happiest place on earth, but my wishes are terrible. Their power goes beyond my thought, and there is no hope for me if my words brought Mary harm. But, I said, you do not know that she is dead. Even now you hoped she might be alive. Listen to me. And I told her the tale I have already told you, giving it all in the driest manner, for I wanted to recall the clear sense that I felt almost sure she had possessed in her younger days and by keeping up her attention to details, restrain the vague wildness of her grief. She listened with deep attention, putting from time to time such questions as convinced me I had to do with no common intelligence, however dimmed and shorn by solitude and mysterious sorrow. Then she took up her tale, and in few brief words told me of her wanderings abroad, in vain search after her daughter, sometimes in the wake of armies, sometimes in camp, sometimes in city. The lady whose waiting woman Mary had gone to be had died soon after the date of her last letter home. Her husband, the foreign officer, had been serving in Hungary, whither Bridget had followed him, but too late to find him. Vague rumours reached her that Mary had made a great marriage, and this sting of doubt was added whether the mother might not be close to her child under her new name, and even hearing of her every day, and yet never recognising the lost one under the appellation she then bore. At length the thought took possession of her that it was possible that all this time Mary might be at home at cold home in the trough of Boland in Lancashire in England, and home came Bridget in that vain hope to her desolate hearth and empty cottage. Here she had thought it safest to remain. If Mary was in life, it was here she would seek for her mother. I noted down one or two particulars out of Bridget's narrative that I thought might be of use to me, for I was stimulated to further search in a strange and extraordinary manner. It seemed as if it were impressed upon me that I must take up the quest where Bridget had laid it down, and this for no reason that had previously influenced me, such as my uncle's anxiety on the subject, my own reputation as a lawyer, and so on, but from some strange power which had taken possession of my will only that very morning, and which forced it in the direction it chose. "'I will go,' said I. "'I will spare nothing in the search. Trust to me. I will learn all that can be learnt.' you shall know all that money or pains or wit can discover. It is true, she may be long dead, but she may have left a child. A child? she cried, as if for the first time this idea had struck her mind. Hear him, blessed virgin, he says she may have left a child, and you have never told me, though I have prayed so for a sign, waking or sleeping. Nay, said I, I know nothing but what you tell me. You say you heard of her marriage. But she caught nothing of what I said. She was praying to the Virgin in a kind of ecstasy, which seemed to render her unconscious of my very presence. From Coldholm I went to Sir Philip Tempest's. The wife of the foreign officer had been a cousin of his father's, and from him I thought I might gain some particulars as to the existence of the Count de la Tour d'Auvergne, and where I could find him, for I knew how questions de vive voix aid the flagging recollection, and I was determined to lose no chance for want of trouble, but Sir Philip had gone abroad, and it would be some time before I could receive an answer. So I followed my uncle's advice, to whom I had mentioned how wearied I felt, both in body and mind, by my will-o'-the-wisp search. He immediately told me to go to Harrogate, there to await Sir Philip's reply. I should be near to one of the places connected with my search, Coldholm, not far from Sir Philip Tempest, in case he returned, and I wished to ask him any further questions. And, in conclusion, my uncle bade me try to forget all about my business for a time. 
This was far easier said than done. I have seen a child on a common blown along by a high wind, without power of standing still, and resisting the tempestuous force. I was somewhat in the same predicament as regarded my mental state. Something resistless seemed to urge my thoughts on through every possible course by which there was a chance of attaining to my object. I did not see the sweeping moors when I walked out. When I held a book in my hand and read the words, their sense did not penetrate to my brain. If I slept, I went on with the same ideas, always flowing in the same direction. This could not last long without having a bad effect on the body. I had an illness which, although I was racked with pain, was a positive relief to me, as it compelled me to live in the present suffering, and not in the visionary researches I had been continually making before. My kind uncle came to nurse me, and after the immediate danger was over, my life seemed to slip away in delicious languor for two or three months. I did not ask, so much did I dread falling into the old channel of thought, whether any reply had been received to my letter to Sir Philip. I turned my whole imagination right away from all that subject. My uncle remained with me until nigh summer, and then returned to his business in London, leaving me perfectly well, although not completely strong. I was to follow him in a fortnight, when, as he said, we would look over letters and talk about several things. I knew what this little speech alluded to, and shrank from the train of thought it suggested, which was so intimately connected with my first feelings of illness. However, I had a fortnight more to roam on those invigorating Yorkshire moors. In those days there was one large, rambling inn at Harrogate, close to the medicinal spring, but it was already becoming too small for the accommodation of the influx of visitors, and many lodged round about in the farmhouses of the district. It was so early in the season that I had the inn pretty much to myself, and indeed felt rather like a visitor in a private house, so intimate had the landlord and landlady become with me during my long illness. She would chide me for being out so late on the moors, or for having been too long without food, quite in a motherly way, while he consulted me about vintages and wines, and taught me many a Yorkshire wrinkle about horses. In my walks I met other strangers from time to time. Even before my uncle had left me, I had noticed with half-torpid curiosity a young lady of very striking appearance, who went about always accompanied by an elderly companion. Hardly a gentlewoman, but with something in her look that prepossessed me in her favour. The younger lady always put her veil down when any one approached, so it had been only once or twice when I had come upon her at a sudden turn in the path that I had even a glimpse of her face. I am not sure if it was beautiful, though in after life I grew to think it so, but it was at this time overshadowed by a sadness that never varied a pale, quiet, resigned look of intense suffering that irresistibly attracted me, not with love, but with a sense of infinite compassion for one so young, yet so hopelessly unhappy. The companion wore something of the same look, quiet, melancholy, hopeless, yet resigned. I asked my landlord who they were. He said they were called Clark, and wished to be considered as mother and daughter, but that for his part he did not believe that to be their right name, nor that there was any such relationship between them. They had been in the neighbourhood of Harrogate for some time, lodging in a remote farmhouse. The people there would tell nothing about them, saying that they paid handsomely and never did any harm, so why should they be speaking of any strange things that might happen? That, as the landlord shrewdly observed, showed there was something out of the common way. He had heard that the elderly woman was a cousin of the farmers where they lodged, and so the regard existing between relations might help to keep them quiet. What did he think, then, was the reason for their extreme seclusion? asked I. Nay, he could not tell, not he. He had heard that the young lady, for all as quiet as she seemed, played strange pranks at times. 
He shook his head when I asked him for more particulars, and refused to give them, which made me doubt if he knew any, for he was, in general, a talkative and communicative man. In default of other interests, after my uncle left, I set myself to watch these two people. I hovered about their walks, drawn towards them with a strange fascination, which was not diminished by their evident annoyance at so frequently meeting me. One day I had the sudden good fortune to be at hand when they were alarmed by the attack of a bull, which, in those unenclosed grazing districts, was a particularly dangerous occurrence. I have other and more important things to relate than to tell of the accident which gave me an opportunity of rescuing them. It is enough to say that this event was the beginning of an acquaintance, reluctantly acquiesced in by them, but eagerly prosecuted by me. I can hardly tell when intense curiosity became merged in love, but in less than ten days after my uncle's departure, I was passionately enamoured of Mistress Lucy, as her attendant called her. Carefully, for this I noted well, avoiding any address which appeared as if there was an equality of station between them. I noticed also that Mrs. Clark, the elderly woman, after her first reluctance to allow me to pay them any attentions was overcome, was cheered by my evident attachment to the young girl. It seemed to lighten her heavy burden of care, and she evidently favoured my visits to the farmhouse where they lodged. It was not so with Lucy, a more attractive person I never saw, in spite of her depression of manner and shrinking avoidance of me. I felt sure at once that whatever was the source of her grief, it arose from no fault of her own. It was difficult to draw her into conversation, but when at times for a moment or two I beguiled her into talk, I could see a rare intelligence in her face, and a grave trusting look in the soft grey eyes that were raised for a minute to mine. I made every excuse I possibly could for going there. I sought wild flowers for Lucy's sake. I planned walks for Lucy's sake. I watched the heavens by night in hopes that some unusual beauty of sky would justify me in tempting Mrs. Clark and Lucy forth upon the moors to gaze at the great purple dome above. It seemed to me that Lucy was aware of my love, but that for some motive which I could not guess, she would fain have repelled me. But then again I saw, or fancied I saw, that her heart spoke in my favour, and that there was a struggle going on in her mind, which at times, I loved so dearly, I could have begged her to spare herself, even though the happiness of my whole life should have been the sacrifice. For her complexion grew paler, her aspect of sorrow more hopeless, her delicate frame yet slighter. During this period I had written, I should say, to my uncle to beg to be allowed to prolong my stay at Harrogate, not giving any reason. But such was his tenderness towards me, that in a few days I heard from him, giving me a willing permission, and only charging me to take care of myself, and not use too much exertion during the hot weather. One sultry evening I drew near the farm. The windows of their parlour were open, and I heard voices as I turned the corner of the house, as I passed the first window. There were two windows in their little ground-floor room. I saw Lucy distinctly, but when I had knocked at their door, the house-door stood always ajar. She was gone, and I only saw Mrs. Clark turning over the work-things lying on the table in a nervous and purposeless manner. I felt by instinct that a conversation of some importance was coming on, in which I should be expected to say what was my object in paying these frequent visits. I was glad of the opportunity. My uncle had several times alluded to the pleasant possibility of my bringing home a young wife to cheer and adorn the old house in Ormond Street. He was rich, and I was to succeed him, and had, as I knew, a fair reputation for so young a lawyer so on my side I saw no obstacle. It was true that Lucy was shrouded in mystery. Her name, I was convinced it was not Clark, birth, parentage and previous life were unknown to me, but I was sure of her goodness and sweet innocence, and although I knew that there must be something painful to be told 
to account for her mournful sadness. Yet I was willing to bear my share in her grief, whatever it was. Mrs. Clark began as if it was a relief for her to plunge into the subject. We have thought, sir, at least I have thought, that you know very little of us, nor we of you indeed, not enough to warrant the intimate acquaintance we have fallen into. I beg your pardon, sir, she went on nervously. I am but a plain kind of woman, and I mean to use no rudeness, but I must say straight out that I, we, think it would be better for you not to come so often to see us. She is very unprotected, and... Why should I not come to see you, dear madam? asked I, eagerly, glad of the opportunity of explaining myself. I come, I own, because I have learnt to love Mistress Lucy, and wish to teach her to love me. Mistress Clark shook her head and sighed. Don't, sir, neither love her, nor for the sake of all you hold sacred, teach her to love you. If I am too late, and you love her already, forget her, forget these last few weeks. Oh, I should never have allowed you to come, she went on passionately. But what am I to do? We are forsaken by all except the great God, and even he permits a strange and evil power to afflict us. What am I to do? Where is it to end? She wrung her hands in her distress, then she turned to me. Go away, sir, go away, before you learn to care any more for her. I ask it for your own sake. I implore. You have been good and kind to us, and we shall always recollect you with gratitude. But go away now, and never come back to cross our fatal path. Indeed, madam, said I, I shall do no such thing. You urge it for my own sake. I have no fear, so urged, nor wish except to hear more, all. I cannot have seen Mistress Lucy in all the intimacy of this last fortnight, without acknowledging her goodness and innocence, and without seeing... Pardon me, madam, that for some reason you are two very lonely women in some mysterious sorrow and distress. Now, though I am not powerful myself, yet I have friends who are so wise and kind that they may be said to possess power. Tell me some particulars. Why are you in grief? What is your secret? Why are you here? I declare solemnly that nothing you have said has daunted me in my wish to become Lucy's husband, nor will I shrink from any difficulty that, as such an aspirant, I may have to encounter. You say you are friendless. Why cast away an honest friend? I will tell you of people to whom you may write, and who will answer any questions as to my character and prospects. I do not shun inquiry. She shook her head again. You'd better go away, sir. You know nothing about us. I know your names, said I, and I have heard you allude to the part of the country from which you came which I happen to know as a wild and lonely place, and not many people living there. If I chose to go there, I could easily ascertain all about you, but I would rather hear it from you yourself. You see, I wanted to pique her into telling me something definite. You do not know our true names, sir, said she hastily. Well, I may have conjectured as much, but tell me then, I conjure you. Give me your reasons for distrusting my willingness to stand by what I have said with regard to Mistress Lucy. Oh, what can I do? exclaimed she, if I am turning away a true friend as he says. Stay, coming to a sudden decision. I will tell you something. I cannot tell you all. You would not believe it. But perhaps I can tell you enough to prevent your going on in your hopeless attachment. I am not Lucy's mother. So I conjectured. I said, go on. I do not even know if she is the legitimate or illegitimate child of her father, but he is cruelly turned against her, and her mother is long dead, and for a terrible reason she has no other creature to keep constant to her but me. She, only two years ago, such a darling and such a pride in her father's house. Why, sir, there is a mystery that might happen in connection with her any moment and then you would go away like all the rest, and when you next heard her name, you would loathe her. Others who have loved her longer have done so before now. My poor child, whom neither God nor man has mercy upon, or surely she would die. The good woman was stopped by her crying. I confess I was a little stunned by her last words, 
but only for a moment, at any rate, till I knew definitely what was this mysterious stain upon one so simple and pure as Lucy seemed, I would not desert her, and so I said. And she made answer, If you are daring in your heart to think harm of my child, sir, after knowing her as you have done, you are no good man yourself. But I am so foolish and helpless in my great sorrow that I would fain hope to find a friend in you. I cannot help trusting that, although you may no longer feel towards her as a lover, you will have pity upon us, and perhaps by your learning you can tell us where to go for aid. I implore you to tell me, I cried, almost maddened by this suspense. I cannot, said she solemnly. I am under a deep vow of secrecy. If you are to be told, it must be by her. She left the room, and I remained to ponder over this strange interview. I mechanically turned over the few books, and, with eyes that saw nothing at the time, examined the tokens of Lucy's frequent presence in that room. When I got home at night, I remembered how all these trifles spoke of a pure and tender heart and innocent life. Mistress Clark returned. She had been crying sadly. Yes, said she, it is as I feared. She loves you so much that she is willing to run the fearful risk of telling you all herself. She acknowledges it is but a poor chance, but your sympathy will be a balm if you give it. Tomorrow, come here at ten in the morning, and, as you hope for pity in your hour of agony, repress all show of fear or repugnance you may feel towards one so grievously afflicted. I half smiled. Have no fear, I said. It seemed too absurd to imagine my feeling dislike to Lucy. Her father loved her well said she, gravely, yet he drove her out like some monstrous thing. Just at this moment came a peal of ringing laughter from the garden. It was Lucy's voice. It sounded as if she were standing just on one side of the open casement. It sounded as though she were suddenly stirred to merriment, merriment verging on boisterousness by the doings or sayings of some other person. I can scarcely say why, but the sound jarred on me inexpressibly. She knew the subject of our conversation, and must have been at least aware of the state of agitation her friend was in, she herself usually so gentle and quiet. I half rose to go to the window and satisfy my instinctive curiosity as to what had provoked this burst of ill-timed laughter, but Mrs. Clark threw her whole weight and power upon the hand with which she pressed and kept me down. For God's sake, she said, white and trembling all over. Sit still, be quiet, or be patient. Tomorrow you will know all. Leave us, for we are sorely afflicted. Do not seek to know more about us. Again that laugh, so musical in sound, yet so discordant to my heart. She held me tight, tighter. Without positive violence I could not have risen. I was sitting with my back to the window, but I felt a shadow pass between the sun's warmth and me, and a strange shudder ran through my frame. In a minute or two she released me. Go, repeated she. Be warned. I ask you once more. I do not think you can stand this knowledge that you seek. If I had my own way, Lucy should never have yielded and promised to tell you all. Who knows what may come of it? I am firm in my wish to know all. I return at ten tomorrow morning, and then expect to see Mistress Lucy herself. I turned away, having my own suspicions, I confess, as to Mistress Clark's sanity. Conjectures as to the meaning of her hints and uncomfortable thoughts connected with that strange laughter filled my mind. I could hardly sleep. I arose early, and long before the hour I had appointed, I was on the path over the common that led to the old farmhouse where they lodged. I supposed that Lucy had passed no better a night than I, for there she was also, slowly pacing with her even step, her eyes bent down, her whole look most saintly and pure. She started when I came close to her, and grew paler as I reminded her of my appointment, and spoke with something of the impatience of obstacles that, seeing her once more, 
had called up afresh in my mind. All strange and terrible hints and giddy merriments were forgotten. My heart gave forth words of fire, and my tongue uttered them. Her colour went and came as she listened. But when I had ended my passionate speeches, she lifted her soft eyes to me and said, "'But you know that you have something to learn about me yet. I only want to say this. I shall not think less of you, less well of you, I mean, if you too fall away from me when you know all.' "'Stop,' said she, as if fearing another burst of mad words. "'Listen to me. My father is a man of great wealth. I never knew my mother. She must have died when I was very young. When first I remember anything, I was living in a great lonely house with my dear and faithful Mistress Clark. My father even was not there. He was, he is, a soldier, and his duties lay abroad. But he came from time to time, and every time I think he loved me more and more. He brought me rarities from foreign lands, which prove to me now how much he must have thought of me during his absences. I can sit down and measure the depth of his lost love now by such standards as these. I never thought whether he loved me or not then. It was so natural that it was like the air I breathed. Yet he was an angry man at times, even then, but never with me. He was reckless too, and once or twice I heard a whisper among the servants that a doom was over him, and that he knew it and tried to drown his knowledge in wild activity and even sometimes, sir, in wine. So I grew up in this grand mansion, in that lonely place. Everything around me seemed at my disposal, and I think everyone loved me. I am sure I loved them. Till about two years ago, I remember it well, my father had come to England, to us, and he seemed so proud and so pleased with me and all I had done, and one day his tongue seemed loosened with wine and he told me much that I had not known till then. How dearly he had loved my mother, yet how his willful usage had caused her death, and then he went on to say how he loved me better than any creature on earth, and how some day he hoped to take me to foreign places, for that he could hardly bear these long absences from his only child. Then he seemed to change suddenly, and said, in a strange wild way, that I was not to believe what he said, that there was many a thing he loved better, his horse, his dog, I know not what. And it was only the next morning that, when I came into his room to ask his blessing, as was my wont, he received me with fierce and angry words. Why had I, so he asked, be delighting myself in such wanton mischief, dancing all over the tender plants in the flower-beds, all set with the famous Dutch bulbs he had brought from Holland. I had never been out of doors that morning, sir, and I could not conceive what he meant, and so I said. And then he swore at me for a liar, and said I was of no true blood, for he had seen me doing all that mischief himself, with his own eyes. What could I say? He would not listen to me, and even my tears seemed only to irritate him. That day was the beginning of my great sorrows. Not long after, he reproached me for my undue familiarity, all unbecoming a gentlewoman, with his grooms. I had been in the stable-yard, laughing and talking, he said. Now, sir, I am something of a coward by nature, and I had always dreaded horses. Besides that, my father's servants, those whom he brought with him from foreign parts, were wild fellows whom I had always avoided, and to whom I had never spoken except as a lady must needs from time to time speak to her father's people. Yet my father called me by names of which I hardly know the meaning, but my heart told me they were such a shame any modest woman. And from that day he turned quite against me. Nay, sir, not many weeks after that, he came in with a riding whip in his hand, and accusing me harshly of evil doings, of which I knew no more than you, sir. He was about to strike me, and I, all in bewildering tears, was ready to take his stripes as great kindness compared to his harder words, when suddenly he stopped his arm midway, gasped and staggered, crying out, The curse! 
the curse. I looked up in terror. In the great mirror opposite, I saw myself, and right behind, another wicked, fearful self, so like me, that my soul seemed to quiver within me, as though not knowing to which similitude of body it belonged. My father saw my double at the same moment, either in its dreadful reality, whatever that might be, or in the scarcely less terrible reflection in the mirror. But what came of it at that moment I cannot say, for I suddenly swooned away, and when I came to myself, I was lying in my bed and my faithful clerk sitting by me. I was in my bed for days, and even while I lay there, my double was seen by all, flitting about the house and gardens, always about some mischievous or detestable work. What wonder that everyone shrank from me in dread, that my father drove me forth at length, when the disgrace of which I was the cause was past his patience to bear. Mistress Clark came with me, and here we try to live such a life of piety and prayer as may in time set me free from the curse. All the time she had been speaking, I had been weighing her story in my mind. I had hitherto put cases of witchcraft on one side as mere superstitions, and my uncle and I had had many an argument, he supporting himself by the opinion of his good friend Sir Matthew Hale, yet this sounded like the tale of one bewitched, or was it merely the effect of a life of extreme seclusion telling on the nerves of a sensitive girl? My scepticism inclined me to the latter belief, and when she paused, I said, I fancy that some physician could have disabused your father of his belief in visions. Just at that instant, standing as I was opposite to her in the full and perfect morning light, I saw behind her another figure, a ghastly resemblance, complete in likeness so far as form and feature and minutest touch of dress could go, but with a loathsome demon soul looking out of the grey eyes that were in turns mocking and voluptuous. My heart stood still within me, every hair rose up erect, my flesh crept with horror. I could not see the grave and tender Lucy, my eyes were fascinated by the creature beyond. I know not why, but I put out my hand to clutch it. I grasped nothing but empty air, and my whole blood curdled to ice. For a moment I could not see, then my sight came back, and I saw Lucy standing before me alone, deathly pale, and I could have fancied, almost, shrunk in size. It has been near me, she said, as if asking a question. The sound seemed taken out of her voice. It was husky as the notes on an old harpsichord when the strings have ceased to vibrate. She read her answer in my face, I suppose, for I could not speak. Her look was one of intense fear, but that died away into an aspect of most humble patience. At length, she seemed to force herself to face behind and around her. She saw the purple moors, the blue distant hills, quivering in the sunlight, but nothing else. "'Will you take me home?' she said meekly. I took her by the hand and led her silently through the budding heather. We dared not speak, for we could not tell, but that the dread creature was listening, although unseen, but that it might appear and push us asunder. I never loved her more fondly than now when, and that was the unspeakable misery, the idea of her was becoming so inextricably blended with the shuddering thought of it. She seemed to understand what I must be feeling. She let go my hand which she had kept clasped until then, when we reached the garden gate and went forwards to meet her anxious friend who was standing by the window looking for her. I could not enter the house. I needed silence, society, leisure, change, I knew not what, to shake off the sensation of that creature's presence. Yet I lingered about the garden. I hardly know why. I suppose partly because I feared to encounter the resemblance again on the solitary common where it had vanished, and partly from a feeling of inexpressible compassion for Lucy. 
In a few minutes, Mistress Clark came forth and joined me. We walked some paces in silence. "'You know all now,' said she, solemnly. "'I saw it,' said I, below my breath. "'And you shrink from us now,' she said, with a hopelessness which stirred up all that was brave or good in me. "'Not a whit,' said I. "'Human flesh shrinks from an encounter with the powers of darkness, "'and for some reason unknown to me, "'the pure and holy Lucy is their victim. "'The sins of the fathers shall be visited upon the children.' she said. Who is her father? asked I. Knowing as much as I do, I may surely know more, know all. Tell me, I entreat you, madam, all that you can conjecture, respecting this demoniac persecution of one so good. I will, but not now. I must go to Lucy now. Come this afternoon. I will see you alone. And oh, sir, I will trust that you may yet find some way to help us in our sore trouble." I was miserably exhausted by the swooning of fright which had taken possession of me. When I reached the inn, I staggered in like one overcome by wine. I went to my own private room. It was some time before I saw that the weekly post had come in and brought me my letters. There was one from my uncle, one from my home in Devonshire, and one, redirected over the first address, sealed with a great coat of arms, it was from Sir Philip Tempest. My letter of inquiry respecting Mary Fitzgerald had reached him at Liège, where it so happened that the Count de la Tour d'Auvergne was quartered at the very time. He remembered his wife's beautiful attendant. She had had high words with the deceased Countess respecting her intercourse with an English gentleman of good standing who was also in the foreign service. The Countess augured evil of his intentions while Mary, proud and vehement, asserted that he would soon marry her, and resented her mistress's warnings as an insult. The consequence was that she had left Madame de la Tour d'Auvergne's service, and, as the Count believed, had gone to live with the Englishman. Whether he had married her or not, he could not say. But, added Sir Philip Tempest, you may easily hear what particulars you wish to know respecting Mary Fitzgerald, from the Englishman himself. If, as I suspect, he is no other than my neighbour and former acquaintance, Mr. Gisborne, of Skipford Hall in the West Riding. I am led to the belief that he is no other, by several small particulars, none of which are in themselves conclusive, but which, taken together, make a mass of presumptive evidence. As far as I could make out from the Count's foreign pronunciation, Gisborne was the name of the Englishman. I know that Gisborne of Skipford was abroad and in the foreign service at that time. He was a likely fellow enough for such an exploit. And, above all, certain expressions recur to my mind which he used in reference to old Bridget Fitzgerald of Coldholm, whom he once encountered while staying with me at Starkey Manor House. I remember that the meeting seemed to have produced some extraordinary effect upon his mind as though he had suddenly discovered some connection which he might have had with his previous life. I beg you to let me know if I can be of any further service to you. Your uncle once rendered me a good turn, and I would gladly repay it, so far as in me lies, to his nephew. I was now apparently close on the discovery which I had striven so many months to attain, but success had lost its zest. I put my letters down and seemed to forget them, all in thinking of the morning I had passed that very day. Nothing was real but the unreal presence which had come like an evil blast across my bodily eyes and burnt itself down upon my brain. Dinner came and went away untouched. Early in the afternoon I walked to the farmhouse. I found Mistress Clark alone and I was glad and relieved. She was evidently prepared to tell me all I might wish to hear. You asked me for Mistress Lucy's true name. It is Gisborne, she began. Not Gisborne of Skipford, I exclaimed, breathless with anticipation. The same, said she quietly, not regarding my manner. Her father is a man of note, although, 
being a Roman Catholic, he cannot take that rank in this country to which his station entitles him. The consequence is he lives much abroad, has been a soldier, I am told. And Lucy's mother? I asked. She shook her head. I never knew her, said she. Lucy was about three years old when I was engaged to take charge of her. Her mother was dead. But do you know her name? You can tell if it was Mary Fitzgerald. She looked astonished. That was a name. But, sir, how came you to be so well acquainted with it? It was a mystery to the whole household at Skipford Court. She was some beautiful young woman whom he had lured away from her protectors while he was abroad. I've heard said he practised some terrible deceit upon her, and when she came to know it, she was neither to have nor to hold, but rushed off from his very arms and threw herself into a rapid stream and was drowned. It stung him deep with remorse, but I used to think the remembrance of the mother's cruel death made him love the child yet dearer. I told her as briefly as might be of my researches after the descendant and heir of the Fitzgerald of Kildoon, and added, something of my old lawyer spirit returning into me for the moment, that I had no doubt but that we should prove Lucy to be of right possessed of large estates in Ireland. No flush came over her grey face, no light into her eyes. And what is all the wealth in the world to that poor girl? she said. It will not free her from the ghastly bewitchment which persecutes her. As for money, what a pitiful thing it is. It cannot touch her. No more can the evil creature harm her, I said. Her holy nature dwells apart and cannot be defiled or stained by all the devilish arts in the whole world. True, but it is a cruel fate to know that all shrink from her, sooner or later, as from one possessed, accursed. How came it to pass? I asked. Nay, I know not. Old rumours there are that were bruited through the household at Skipford. Tell me, I demanded. They came from servants, it would fain account for everything. They say that many years ago Mr. Gisborne killed a dog belonging to an old witch at Coldholm that she cursed with a dreadful and mysterious curse, the creature, whatever it might be, that he should love best, and that it struck so deeply into his heart that for years he kept himself aloof from any temptation to love aught. But who could help loving Lucy? You'd never heard the witch's name? I gasped. Yes, they called her Bridget. They said he would never go near the spot again for terror of her, yet he was a brave man. Listen, said I, taking hold of her arm, the better to arrest her full attention. If what I suspect holds true, that man stole Bridget's only child, the very Mary Fitzgerald who was Lucy's mother. If so, Bridget cursed him in ignorance of the deeper wrong he had done her. To this hour she yearns after her lost child, and questions the saints whether she be living or not. The roots of that curse lie deeper than she knows. She unwittingly banned him for a deeper guilt than that of killing a dumb beast. The sins of the fathers are indeed visited upon the children. But, said Mistress Clark eagerly, she would never let evil rest on her own grandchild. Surely, sir, if what you say be true, there are hopes for Lucy. Let us go, go at once, and tell this fearful woman all that you suspect, and beseech her to take off the spell that she has put upon her innocent grandchild. It seemed to me, indeed, that something like this was the best course we could pursue but first it was necessary to ascertain more than what mere rumour or careless hearsay could tell. My thoughts turned to my uncle. He could advise me wisely. He ought to know all. I resolved to go to him without delay, but I did not choose to tell Mistress Clark of all the visionary plans that flitted through my mind. I simply declared my intention of proceeding straight to London on Lucy's affairs. I bade her believe that my interest on the young lady's behalf was greater than ever, and that my whole time should be given up to her cause. I saw that Mistress Clark distrusted me, 
because my mind was too full of thoughts for my words to flow freely. She sighed and shook her head and said, Well, it was all right, in such a tone that it was an implied reproach. But I was firm and constant in my heart, and I took confidence from that. I rode to London. I rode long days drawn out into the lovely summer nights. I could not rest. I reached London. I told my uncle all, though in the stir of the great city the horror had faded away, and I could hardly imagine that he would believe the tale I told him of the fearful double of Lucy which I had seen on the lonely moorside. But my uncle had lived many years, and learnt many things, and in the deep secrets of family history that had been confided to him, he had heard of cases of innocent people, bewitched and taken possession of by evil spirits, yet more fearful than Lucy's. For, as he said, to judge from all I told him, that resemblance had no power over her. She was too pure and good to be tainted by its evil, haunting presence. It had, in all probability, so my uncle conceived, tried to suggest wicked thoughts and to tempt to wicked actions. But she, in her saintly maidenhood, had passed on undefiled by evil thought or deed. It could not touch her soul, but true, it set her apart from all sweet love or common human intercourse. My uncle threw himself with an energy more like six and twenty than sixty into the consideration of the whole case. He undertook the proving Lucy's descent and volunteered to go and find out Mr. Gisborne and obtain, firstly, the legal proofs of Lucy's descent from the Fitzgeralds of Kildoon, and secondly, he would try to hear all that he could respecting the working of the curse, and whether any and what means had been taken to exercise that terrible appearance. For he told me of instances where, by prayers and long fasting, the evil possessor had been driven forth with howling and many cries from the body which it had come to inhabit. He spoke of those strange New England cases which had happened not so long before, of Mr. Defoe, who had written a book, wherein he had named many modes of subduing apparitions and sending them back whence they came, and lastly he spoke low of dreadful ways of compelling witches to undo their witchcraft. But I could not endure to hear of those tortures and burnings. I said that Bridget was rather a wild and savage woman than a malignant witch, and above all that Lucy was of her kith and kin, and that in putting her to the trial by water or by fire, we should be torturing, it might be to the death, the ancestress of her we sought to redeem. My uncle thought a while, and then said that in this last matter I was right. At any rate, it should not be tried, with his consent, till all other modes of remedy had failed, and assented to my proposal that I should go myself and see Bridget, and tell her all. In accordance with this, I went down once more to the wayside inn near Coldholme. It was late at night when I arrived there, and while I supped, I inquired of the landlord more particulars as to Bridget's ways. Solitary and savage had been her life for many years. Wild and despotic were her words and manner to those few people who came across her path. The country folk did her imperious bidding because they feared to disobey. If they pleased her, they prospered. If, on the contrary, they neglected or traversed her behests, misfortunes, small or great, fell on them and theirs. It was not detestation so much as an indefinable terror that she excited. In the morning I went to see her. She was standing on the green outside her cottage and received me with the sullen grandeur of a throneless queen. I read in her face that she recognised me, and that I was not unwelcome, but she stood silent till I had opened my errand. "'I have news of your daughter,' said I, resolved to speak straight to all that I knew she felt of love, and not to spare her. "'She is dead!' The stern figure scarcely trembled, but her hand sought the support of the doorpost. "'I knew that she was dead,' said she, deep and low 
and then was silent for an instant. My tears that should have flowed for her were burnt up long years ago. Young man, tell me about her. Not yet, said I, having a strange power given me of confronting one whom, nevertheless, in my secret soul I dreaded. You had once a little dog, I continued. The words called out in her more show of emotion than the intelligence of her daughter's death. She broke in upon my speech. I had. It was hers. The last thing I had of hers. And it was shot for wantonness. It died in my arms. The man who killed that dog rues it to this day. For that dumb beast's blood, his best beloved stands accursed. Her eyes distended as if she were in a trance and I saw the working of her curse. Again I spoke. O oh, woman, I said, that best beloved standing accursed before men is your dead daughter's child. The life, the energy, the passion came back to the eyes with which she pierced through me to see if I spoke the truth. Then, without another question or word, she threw herself on the ground with fearful vehemence, and clutched at the innocent daisies with convulsed hands. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, have I cursed thee, and art thou accursed? So she moaned, as she lay prostrate in her great agony. I stood aghast at my own work. She did not hear my broken sentences. She asked no more but the dumb confirmation of my sad looks had given of that one fact, that her curse rested on her own daughter's child. The fear grew on me lest she should die in her strife of body and soul, and then would not Lucy remain under the spell as long as she lived. Even at this moment I saw Lucy coming through the woodland path that led to Bridget's cottage. Mistress Clark was with her, I felt at my heart that it was her, by the balmy peace that the look of her sent over me as she slowly advanced, a glad surprise shining out of her soft, quiet eyes. That was as her gaze met mine, as her looks fell on the woman lying stiff, convulsed on the earth, they became full of tender pity, and she came forward to try and lift her up. Seating herself on the turf, she took Bridget's head into her lap, and with gentle touches she arranged the dishevelled grey hair streaming thick and wild from beneath her much. "'God help her!' murmured Lucy. "'How she suffers!' At her desire we sought for water, but when we returned Bridget had recovered her wandering senses and was kneeling with clasped hands before Lucy, gazing at that sweet sad face as though her troubled nature drank in health and peace from every moment's contemplation. A faint tinge on Lucy's pale cheeks showed me that she was aware of our return. Otherwise it appeared as if she was conscious of her influence for good over the passionate and troubled woman kneeling before her, and would not willingly avert her grave and loving eyes from that wrinkled and careworn countenance. Suddenly, in the twinkling of an eye, the creature appeared there behind Lucy, fearfully, the same as to outward semblance, but kneeling exactly as Bridget knelt, and clasping her hands in jesting mimicry, as Bridget clasped hers in her ecstasy that was deepening into a prayer. Mistress Clark cried out. Bridget arose slowly, her gaze fixed on that creature beyond drawing her breath with a hissing sound, never moving her terrible eyes that were steady as stone, she made a dart at the phantom and caught, as I had done, a mere handful of empty air. We saw no more of the creature. It vanished as suddenly as it came, but Bridget looked slowly on, as if watching some receding form. Lucy sat still, white, trembling, drooping, I think she would have swooned if I had not been there to uphold her. While I was attending to her, Bridget passed us without a word to anyone, and entering her cottage, she barred herself in and left us without. 
All our endeavours were now directed to get Lucy back to the house where she had tarried the night before. Mistress Clark told me that not hearing from me, some letter must have miscarried. She had grown impatient and despairing, and had urged Lucy to the enterprise of coming to seek her grandmother, not telling her indeed of the dread reputation she possessed, or how we suspected her of having so fearfully blighted that innocent girl, but at the same time, hoping much from the mysterious stirring of blood which Mistress Clark trusted in for the removal of the curse. They had come by a different route from that which I had taken to a village inn not far from Coldholm, only the night before. This was the first interview between ancestress and descendant. All through the sultry noon I wandered along the tangled woodpaths of the old neglected forest, thinking where to turn for remedy in a matter so complicated and mysterious. Meeting a countryman, I asked my way to the nearest clergyman, and went, hoping to obtain some counsel from him. But he proved to be a coarse and common-minded man, giving no time or attention to the intricacies of a case, but dashing out a strong opinion involving immediate action. For instance, as soon as I named Bridget Fitzgerald, he exclaimed, The cold horn witch, the Irish papist, I'd have had a duct long since, but for that other papist, Sir Philip Tempest, he has had to threaten honest folk about here over and over again, or they'd have had her up before the justices for her black doings. And it's the law of the land that witches should be burnt. Aye, and of scripture too, sir. Yet, you see, a papist, if he's a rich squire, can overrule both law and scripture. I'd carry a faggot to myself to rid the country of her. Such an one could give me no help. I rather drew back what I had already said, and tried to make the parson forget it, by treating him to several pots of beer in the village inn, to which we had adjourned for our conference at his suggestion. I left him as soon as I could, and returned to Coldhome, shaping my way past deserted Starkey Manor House, and coming upon it by the back. At that side were the oblong remains of the old moat, the waters of which lay placid and motionless under the crimson rays of the setting sun, with the forest trees lying straight along each side, and their deep green foliage mirrored to blackness in the burnished surface of the moat below. And the broken sundial at the end nearest the hall, and the heron standing on one leg at the water's edge, lazily looking down for fish, the lonely and desolate house scarce needed the broken windows, the weeds on the door sill, the broken shutter softly flapping to and fro in the twilight breeze, to fill up the picture of desertion and decay. I lingered about the place until the growing darkness warned me on, and then I passed along the path, cut by the orders of the last lady of Starkey Manor House, that's led me to Bridget's cottage. I suddenly resolved to see her, and in spite of closed doors, it might be of resolved will, she should see me. So I knocked at her door, gently, loudly, fiercely. I shook it so vehemently that at length the old hinges gave way, and with a crash it fell inwards, leaving me suddenly face to face with Bridget. I, red, heated, agitated with my so long baffled efforts, she, stiff as any stone, standing right facing me, her eyes dilated with terror, her ashen lips trembling, but her body motionless. In her hands she held her crucifix, as if by that holy symbol she sought to oppose my entrance. At sight of me her whole frame relaxed, and she sank back upon a chair. Some mighty tension had given way. Still, her eyes looked fearfully into the gloom of the outer air, made more opaque by the glimmer of the lamp inside, which she had placed before the picture of the Virgin. "'Is she there?' asked Bridget, hoarsely. "'No. Who? I am alone. You remember me?' "'Yes,' replied she, still terror-stricken. "'But she, that creature, has been looking in upon me through that window all the day long.' I have closed it up with my shawl, and then I saw her feet below the door, 
as long as it was light, and I knew she heard my very breathing, nay, worse, my very prayers, and I could not pray, for her listening choked the words ere they rose to my lips. Tell me, who is she? What means that double girl I saw this morning? One had the look of my dead Mary, but the other curdled my blood, and yet it was the same. She had taken a hold of my arm as if to secure herself some human companionship. She shook all over with the slight, never-ceasing tremor of intense terror. I told her my tale as I have told it you, sparing none of the details. How Mistress Clark had told me that the resemblance had driven Lucy forth from her father's house, how I had disbelieved until, with mine own eyes, I had seen another Lucy standing behind my Lucy, the same in form and feature, but with the demon soul looking out of the eyes. I told her all, I say, believing that she, whose curse was working so upon the life of her innocent grandchild, was the only person who could find the remedy and the redemption. When I had done, she sat silent for many minutes. "'You love Mary's child?' she asked. "'I do. In spite of the fearful working of the curse, I love her, yet I shrink from her ever since that day on the moorside, and men must shrink from one so accompanied. Friends and lovers must stand afar off. Oh, Bridget Fitzgerald, loosen the curse, set her free. Where is she?' I eagerly caught at the idea that her presence was needed, in order by some strange prayer or exorcism the spell might be reversed. "'I will go and bring her to you,' I exclaimed. But Bridget tightened her hold upon my arm. "'Not so,' said she, in a low, hoarse voice. "'It would kill me to see her again, as I saw her this morning, and I must live till I have worked my work. Leave me,' said she, suddenly and again taking up the cross. I defy the demon I have called up. Leave me to wrestle with it. She stood up as if in an ecstasy of inspiration from which all fear was banished. I lingered, why I can hardly tell, until once more she bade me be gone. As I went along the forest way, I looked back and saw her planting the cross in the empty threshold where the door had been. The next morning Lucy and I went to seek her, to bid her join her prayers with ours. The cottage stood open and wide to our gaze. No human being was there. The cross remained on the threshold, but Bridget was gone. End of chapter the second Chapter the third of the Poor Clare by Elizabeth Gaskell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From Household Words, a weekly journal conducted by Charles Dickens, number three hundred and fifty three, Saturday, the twenty seventh of December, eighteen fifty six. What was to be done next was the question that I asked myself. As for Lucy, she would fain have submitted to the doom that lay upon her. Her gentleness and piety, under the pressure of so horrible a life, seemed over-passive to me. She never complained. Mrs. Clark complained more than ever. As for me, I was more in love with the real Lucy than ever, but I shrunk from the false similitude with an intensity proportioned to my love. I found out by instinct that Mrs. Clark had occasional temptations to leave Lucy. The good lady's nerves were shaken, and, from what she said, I could almost have concluded that the object of the double was to drive away from Lucy this last and almost earliest friend. At times I could scarcely bear to own it, but I myself felt inclined to turn recreant, and I would accuse Lucy of being too patient, too resigned. One after another she won the little children of Coldhome. Mrs. Clark and she had resolved to stay there, for was it not as good a place as any other to such as they, and did not all our faint hopes rest on Bridget, never seen or heard of now, but still we trusted to come back or give some token. So, as I say, 
One after another, the little children came about my Lucy, won by her soft tones and her gentle smiles and kind actions. Alas, one after another, they fell away and shrunk from her path with blanching terror, and we too surely guessed the reason why. It was the last drop. I could bear it no longer. I resolved no more to linger around the spot, but to go back to my uncle, and among the learned divines of the City of London, seek for some power whereby to annul the curse. My uncle, meanwhile, had obtained all the requisite testimonials relating to Lucy's descent and birth, from the Irish lawyers, and from Mr. Gisborne. The latter gentleman had written from abroad. He was again serving in the Austrian army, a letter alternately passionately self-reproachful and stoically repellent. It was evident that when he thought of Mary, her short life, how he had wronged her, and of her violent death, he could hardly find words severe enough for his own conduct, and from this point of view, the curse that Bridget had laid upon him and his was regarded by him as a prophetic doom, to the utterance of which she was moved by a higher power, working for the fulfilment of a deeper vengeance than for the death of the poor dog. But then, again, when he came to speak of his daughter, the repugnance which the conduct of the demoniac creature had produced in his mind was but ill disguised under a show of profound indifference as to Lucy's fate. One almost felt as if he would have been as content to put her out of existence as he would have been to destroy some disgusting reptile that had invaded his chamber or his couch. The great Fitzgerald property was Lucy's, and that was all, was nothing. My uncle and I sat in the gloom of a London November evening in our house in Ormond Street. I was out of health and felt as if I were in an inextricable coil of misery. Lucy and I wrote to each other, but that was little, and we dared not see each other for dread of the fearful third, who had more than once taken her place at our meetings. My uncle had, on the day I speak of, bidden prayers to be put up on the ensuing Sabbath in many a church and meeting-house in London, for one grievously tormented by an evil spirit. He had faith in prayers, I had none. I was fast losing faith in all things. So we sat, he trying to interest me in the old talk of other days, I oppressed by one thought, when our old servant, Antony, opened the door, and without speaking, showed in a very gentlemanly and prepossessing man, who had something remarkable about his dress, betraying his profession to be that of the Roman Catholic priesthood. He glanced at my uncle first, then at me. It was to me he bowed. "'I did not give my name,' said he, "'because you would hardly have recognised it, "'unless, sir, when in the north you heard of Father Bernard, "'the chaplain at Stonyhurst. "'I remembered afterwards that I had heard of him, "'but at the time I had utterly forgotten it. "'So I professed myself a complete stranger to him, "'while my ever-hospitable uncle, although hating a papist as much as it was in his nature to hate anything, placed a chair for the visitor, and bade Antony bring glasses and a fresh jug of claret. Father Bernard received this courtesy with the graceful ease and pleasant acknowledgement which belongs to the man of the world. Then he turned to scan me with his keen glance. After some slight conversation, entered into on his part, I'm certain with an intention of discovering on what terms of confidence I stood with my uncle, he paused and said gravely, I'm sent here with a message to you, sir, from a woman to whom you have shown kindness, and who is one of my penitents in Antwerp, one Bridget Fitzgerald. Bridget Fitzgerald! exclaimed I. In Antwerp! Tell me, sir, all that you can about her. There is much to be said, he replied. But may I inquire if this gentleman, if your uncle is acquainted with the particulars of which you and I stand informed? All that I know he knows, said I, eagerly, laying my hand on my uncle's arm, as he made a motion as if to quit the room. Then I have to speak before two gentlemen, who, however they may differ from me in faith, are yet fully impressed with the fact that there are evil powers going about, 
continually to take cognizance of our evil thoughts, and if their master gives them power, to bring them into overt action. Such is my theory of the nature of that sin, of which I dare not disbelieve, as some sceptics would have us do, the sin of witchcraft. Of this deadly sin, you and I are aware Bridget Fitzgerald has been guilty. Since you saw her last, many prayers have been offered in our churches, many masses sung, many penances undergone, in order that, if God and the holy saints so willed it, her sin might be blotted out. But it has not been so willed. Explain to me, said I, who you are and how you come connected with Bridget. Why is she at Antwerp? I pray you, sir, tell me more. If I am impatient, excuse me. I am ill and feverish, and in consequence bewildered. There was something to me inexpressibly soothing in the tone of voice with which he began to narrate, as it were from the beginning, his acquaintance with Bridget. I had known Mr. and Mrs. Starkey during their residence abroad, and so it fell out, naturally, that when I came as chaplain to the Sherburns at Stonyhurst, our acquaintance was renewed, and thus I became the confessor of the whole family, isolated as they were from the offices of the church, Sherburn being their nearest neighbour who professed the true faith. Of course, you are aware that facts revealed in confession are sealed as in the grave, but I learnt enough of Bridget's character to be convinced that I had to do with no common woman, one powerful for good as for evil. I believe that I was able to give her spiritual assistance from time to time, and that she looked upon me as a servant of that holy church, which had such wonderful power of moving men's hearts, and relieving them of the burden of their sins. I have known her cross the moors on the wildest nights of storm, to confess and be absolved, and then she would return, calmed and subdued to her daily work about her mistress, no one wotting where she had been during the hours that most passed in sleep upon their beds. After her daughter's departure, after Mary's mysterious disappearance, I had to impose many a long penance to wash away the sin of impatient repining that was fast leading her into the deeper guilt of blasphemy. She set out on that long journey, of which you have possibly heard, that fruitless journey in search of Mary, and during her absence my superiors ordered my return to my former duties at Antwerp, and for many years I heard no more of Bridget. Not many months ago, as I was passing homewards in the evening, along one of the streets, near St. Jack, leading into Mare Street, I saw a woman sitting crouched up under the shrine of the Holy Mother of Sorrows. Her hood was drawn over her head, so that the shadow caused by the light of the lamp above fell deep over her face. Her hands were clasped around her knees. It was evident that she was someone in hopeless trouble, and as such it was my duty to stop and speak. I naturally addressed her first in Flemish, believing her to be one of the lower class of inhabitants. She shook her head, but did not look up. Then I tried French, and she replied in that language, but speaking it so indifferently, that I was sure she was either English or Irish, and consequently spoke to her in my own native tongue. She recognised my voice, and starting up, caught at my robes, dragging me before the blessed shrine, and throwing herself down, and forcing me, as much by her evident desire as by her action, to kneel beside her, she exclaimed, "'O oh, holy virgin, you will never hearken to me again, but hear him, for you know him of old, that he does your bidding, and strives to heal broken hearts. Hear him!' She turned to me. "'She will hear you if you will only pray. She never hears me. She and all the saints in heaven cannot hear my prayers, for the evil one carries them off, as he carried that first away. O oh, Father Bernard, pray for me. I prayed for one in sore distress, of what nature I could not say, but the Holy Virgin would know. Bridget held me fast, gasping with eagerness at the sound of my words. When I had ended, I rose, and making the sign of the cross over her, I was going to bless her in the name of the Holy Church, when she shrunk away like some terrified creature, and said, 
I am guilty of deadly sin, and I am not shriven. Arise, my daughter, said I, and come with me. And I led the way into one of the confessionals of St. Jack. She knelt, I listened, no words came. The evil powers had struck and her dumb, as I heard afterwards they had many a time before when she approached confession. She was too poor to pay for the necessary forms of exorcism, and hitherto those priests to whom she had addressed herself were either so ignorant of the meaning of her broken French, or her Irish English, or else esteemed her to be one crazed, as indeed her wild and excited manner might easily have led anyone to think that they had neglected the sole means of loosening her tongue, so that she might confess her deadly sin, and, after due penance, obtain absolution. But I knew Bridget of old, and felt that she was a penitent sent to me. I went through those holy offices appointed by our church for the relief of such a case. I was the more bound to do this, as I found that she had come to Antwerp for the sole purpose of discovering me, and making confession to me. Of the nature of that fearful confession I am forbidden to speak. Much of it you know, possibly all. It now remains for her to free herself from mortal guilt, and to set others free from the consequences thereof. No prayers, no masses will ever do it, although they may strengthen her with that strength by which alone acts of deepest love and purest self-devotion may be performed. Her words of passion and cries for revenge, her unholy prayers, could never reach the ears of the holy saints. Other powers intercepted them and wrought, so that the curses thrown up to heaven have fallen on her own flesh and blood, and so, through her very strength of love, have bruised and crushed her heart. Henceforward, her former self must be buried, yea, buried quick if need be, but never more to make sign or utter cry on earth. She has become a poor Clare, in order, if, by perpetual penance and constant service of others, she may at length so act as to obtain final absolution and rest for her soul. Until then, the innocent must suffer. It is to plead for the innocent that I come to you, not in the name of the witch, Bridget Fitzgerald, but of the penitent and servant of all men, the poor Clare, Sister Magdalen. Sir, said I, I listen to your request with respect, only I may tell you it is not needed to urge me to do all that I can on behalf of one love for whom is part of my very life. If for a time I have absented myself from her, it is to think and work for her redemption. I, a member of the English church, my uncle, a Puritan, pray morning and night for her by name. The congregations of London on the next Sabbath will pray for one unknown, that she may be set free from the powers of darkness. Moreover, I must tell you, sir, that those evil ones touch not the great calm of her soul. She lives her own pure and loving life, unharmed and untainted, though all men fall off from her. I wish I could have her faith. My uncle now spoke. Nephew, said he, it seems to me that this gentleman, although professing what I consider an erroneous creed, has touched upon the right point in exhorting Bridget to acts of love and mercy, whereby to wipe out her sin of hate and vengeance. Let us strive, after our fashion, by almsgiving and visiting of the needy and fatherless, to make our prayers acceptable. Meanwhile, I myself will go down into the north and take charge of the maiden, I am too old to be daunted by man or demon. I will bring her to this house as to a home, and let the double come if it will. A company of godly divines shall give it to the meeting, and we will try issue. The kindly, brave old man. But Father Bernard sat on musing. All hate, said he, cannot be quenched in her heart. All Christian forgiveness cannot have entered into her soul or the demon would have lost its power. You said, I think, that her grandchild was still tormented. Still tormented, I replied, sadly thinking of Mistress Clark's last letter. He rose to go. 
We afterwards heard that the occasion of his coming to London was a secret political mission on behalf of the Jacobites. Nevertheless, he was a good and a wise man. Months and months passed away without any change. Lucy entreated my uncle to leave her where she was, dreading as I learnt, lest if she came with her fearful companion to dwell in the same house with me, that my love could not stand the repeated shocks to which I should be doomed. And this she thought, from no distrust of the strength of my affection, but from a kind of pitying sympathy for the terror to the nerves which she observed that the demoniac visitation caused in all. I was restless and miserable. I devoted myself to good works, but I performed them from no spirit of love, but solely from the hope of reward and payment, and so the reward was never granted. At length I asked my uncle's leave to travel, and I went forth, a wanderer, with no distincter end than that of many another wanderer, to get away from myself. A strange impulse led me to Antwerp, in spite of the wars and commotions then raging in the Low Countries, or rather, perhaps, the very craving to become interested in something external led me into the thick of the struggle then going on with the Austrians. The cities of Flanders were all full at that time of civil disturbances and rebellions, only kept down by force and the presence of an Austrian garrison in every place. I arrived in Antwerp and made inquiry for Father Bernard. He was away in the country for a day or two. Then I asked my way to the convent of poor Clares, but being healthy and prosperous, I could only see the dim, pent-up grey walls, shut closely in by narrow streets in the lowest part of the town. My landlord told me that had I been stricken by some loathsome disease, or in desperate case of any kind, the poor Clares would have taken me and tended me. He spoke of them as an order of mercy of the strictest kind, dressing scantily in the coarsest materials, going barefoot, living on what the inhabitants of Antwerp chose to bestow, and sharing even those fragments and crumbs with the poor and helpless that swarmed all around, receiving no letters or communication with the outer world, utterly dead to everything but the alleviation of suffering. He smiled at my inquiring whether I could get speech of one of them, and told me they were even forbidden to speak for the purposes of begging their daily food, while yet they lived and fed others upon what was given in charity. But, exclaimed I, supposing all men forgot them, would they quietly lie down and die without making sign of their extremity? If such were their rule, the poor Clares would willingly do it, but their founder appointed a remedy for such extreme case as you suggest. They have a bell. Tis but a small one, as I have heard, and has never yet been rung in the memory of man. When the poor Clares have been without food for twenty-four hours, they may ring this bell, and then trust to our good people of Antwerp for rushing to the rescue of the poor Clares, who have taken such blessed care of us in all our straits. It seemed to me that such rescue would be rather late in the day, but I did not say what I thought. I rather turned the conversation by asking my landlord if he knew or had ever heard anything of a certain sister Magdalen. Yes, said he, rather under his breath. News will creep out, even from a convent of poor Clares. Sister Magdalen is either a great sinner or a great saint. She does more, as I have heard, than all the other nuns put together. Yet, when last month they would fain have made her mother superior, she begged rather that they would place her below all the rest and make her the meanest servant of all. You never saw her? asked I. Never, he repeated. I was weary of waiting for Father Bernard, and yet I lingered in Antwerp. The political state of things became worse than ever, increased to its height by the scarcity of food consequent on many deficient harvests. I saw groups of fierce squalid men at every corner of the street, glaring out with wolfish eyes at my sleek skin and handsome clothes. At last Father Bernard returned. We had a long conversation in which he told me that, curiously enough, Mr. Gisborne, Lucy's father, 
was serving in one of the Austrian regiments then in garrison at Antwerp. I asked Father Bernard if he would make us acquainted, which he consented to do. But a day or two afterwards he told me that on hearing my name, Mr. Gisborne had declined responding to any advances on my part, saying he had abjured his country and hated his countrymen. Probably he recollected my name in connection with that of his daughter Lucy. Anyhow, it was clear enough that I had no chance of making his acquaintance. Father Bernard confirmed me in my suspicions of the hidden fermentation for some coming evil working among the blouses of Antwerp, and he would fain have had me depart from out of the city, but I rather craved the excitement of danger and stubbornly refused to leave. One day, when I was walking with him in the Place Verte, he bowed to an Austrian officer who was crossing towards the cathedral. "'That is Mr. Gisborne,' said he, as soon as the gentleman was passed. I turned to look at the tall, slight figure of the officer. He carried himself in a stately manner, although he was past middle age, and, from his years, might have had some excuse for a slight stoop. As I looked at the man, he turned round, his eyes met mine, and I saw his face. Deeply lined, sallow, and scathed was that countenance, scarred by passion as well as by the fortunes of war. "'Twas but for a moment our eyes met. "'We each turned round and went on our separate way, "'but his whole appearance was not one to be easily forgotten. "'The thorough appointment of the dress "'and evident thought bestowed on it "'made but an incongruous whole "'with the dark, gloomy expression of his countenance. "'Because he was Lucy's father, "'I sought instinctively to meet him everywhere. "'At last he must have become aware of my pertinacity.' for he gave me a haughty scowl whenever I passed him. In one of these encounters, however, I chanced to be of some service to him. He was turning the corner of a street and came suddenly on one of the groups of discontented Flemings of whom I have spoken. Some words were exchanged when my gentleman out with his sword and with a slight but skilful cut he drew blood from one of those who had insulted him as he fancied though I was too far off to hear the words. They would all have fallen upon him had I not rushed forward and raised the cry, then well known in Antwerp, of rally, to the Austrian soldiers who were perpetually patrolling the streets and who came in numbers to the rescue. I think that neither Mr. Gisborne nor the mutinous group of plebeians owed me much gratitude for my interference. He had planted himself against a wall in a skilful attitude of fence, ready with his bright glancing rapier to do battle with all the heavy, fierce, unarmed men, some six or seven in number. But when his own soldiers came up, he sheathed his sword, and giving some careless word of command, sent them away again, and continued his saunter all alone down the street, the workmen snarling in his rear and more than half inclined to fall on me for my cry of rescue. I cared not if they did, my life seemed so dreary a burden just then, and perhaps it was this daring loitering among them that prevented their attacking me. Instead, they suffered me to fall into conversation with them, and I heard some of their grievances. Sore and heavy to be borne were they, and no wonder the sufferers were savage and desperate. The man whom Gisborne had wounded across his face would fain have got out of me the name of his aggressor, but I refused to tell it. Another of the group heard his inquiry and made answer, I know the man. He's one Gisborne, aide de camp to the general commandant. I know him well. He began to tell some story in connection with Gisborne in a low and muttering voice, and while he was relating a tale which I saw excited their evil blood, and which they evidently wished me not to hear, I sauntered away and back to my lodgings. That night Antwerp was in open revolt. The inhabitants rose in rebellion against their Austrian masters. The Austrians, holding the gates of the city, remained at first pretty quiet in the citadel. Only from time to time the boom of a great cannon swept sullenly over the town but if they expected the disturbance to die away and spend itself in a few hours' fury, they were mistaken. 
In a day or two, the rioters held possession of the principal municipal buildings. Then the Austrians poured forth in bright, flaming array, calm and smiling, as they marched to the posts assigned, as if the fierce mob were no more to them than the swarms of buzzing summer flies. Their practised manoeuvres, their well-aimed shot, told with terrible effect. But in the place of one slain rioter, three sprang up of his blood, to avenge his loss. But a deadly foe, a ghastly ally of the Austrians, was at work. Food, scarce and dear for months, was now hardly to be obtained at any price. Desperate efforts were being made to bring provisions into the city, for the rioters had friends without. Close to the city port, nearest to the Schelt, a great struggle took place. I was there, helping the rioters whose cause I had adopted. We had a savage encounter with the Austrians. Numbers fell on both sides. I saw them lie bleeding for a moment. Then a volley of smoke obscured them, and when it cleared away they were dead, trampled upon or smothered, pressed down and hidden by the freshly wounded whom those last guns had brought low. And then a grey-robed and grey-veiled figure came right across the flashing guns and stooped over someone whose life-blood was ebbing away. Sometimes it was to give him drink from cans which they carried, slung at their sides. Sometimes I saw the cross held above a dying man, and rapid prayers were being uttered, unheard by men in that hellish din and clangour, but listened to by one above. I saw all this as in a dream. The reality of that stern time was battle and carnage but I knew that these grey figures, their bare feet all wet with blood and their faces hidden by their veils, were the poor Clares sent forth now because dire agony was abroad and imminent danger at hand. Therefore they left their cloistered shelter and came into that thick and evil melee. Close to me, driven past me by the struggle of many fighters, came the Antwerp Burgess with the scarce-heeled scar upon his face, and in an instant more he was thrown by the press upon the Austrian officer Gisborne, and ere either had recovered the shock, the Burgess had recognised his opponent. Ah, the Englishman Gisborne, he cried, and threw himself upon him with redoubled fury. He had struck him hard, the Englishman was down, when out of the smoke came a dark grey figure and threw herself right under the uplifted flashing sword. The Burgess's arm stood arrested. Neither Austrians nor Enversois willingly harmed the poor Clares. Leave him to me, said a low stern voice. He is mine enemy, mine for many years. Those words were the last I heard. I myself was struck down by a bullet. I remember nothing more for days. When I came to myself, I was at the extremity of weakness and was craving for food to recruit my strength. My landlord sat watching me. He too looked pinched and shrunken. He had heard of my wounded state and had sought me out. Yes, the struggle still continued, but the famine was sore, and some he had heard had died for lack of food. The tears stood in his eyes as he spoke, but soon he shook off his weakness and his natural cheerfulness returned. Father Bernard had been to see me, no one else, who should indeed. Father Bernard would come back that afternoon, he had promised, but Father Bernard never came, although I was up and dressed and looking eagerly for him. My landlord brought me a meal which he had cooked himself. Of what it was composed he would not say, but it was most excellent, and with every mouthful I seemed to gain strength. The good man sat looking at my evident enjoyment with a happy smile of sympathy, but, as my appetites became satisfied, I began to detect a certain wistfulness in his eyes, as if craving for the food I had so nearly devoured for indeed at that time I was hardly aware of the extent of the famine. Suddenly there was a sound of many rushing feet past our window. My landlord opened one of the sides of it, the better to learn what was going on. Then we heard a faint, cracked, tinkling bell, 
coming shrill upon the air, clear and distinct from all other sounds. "'Holy mother!' exclaimed my landlord. "'The poor Clares!' He snatched up the fragments of my meal and crammed them into my hands, bidding me follow. Downstairs he ran, clutching at more food as the women of his house eagerly held it out to him, and in a moment we were in the street, moving along with the great current, all tending towards the convent of the poor Clares. And still, as if piercing our ears with its inarticulate cry, came the shrill tinkle of the bell. In that strange crowd were old men, trembling and sobbing as they carried their little pittance of food, women with the tears running down their cheeks, who had snatched up what provisions they had in the vessels in which they stood, so that the burden of these was in many cases much greater than that which they contained. Children with flushed faces, grasping tight the morsel of bitten cake or bread, in their eagerness to carry it safe to the help of the poor Clares. Strong men, yea, both Enversois and Austrians, pressing onwards with set teeth, and no words spoken, and over all and through all came that sharp tinkle, that cry for help in extremity. We met the first torrent of people returning with blanched and piteous faces. They were issuing out of the convent to make way for the offerings of others. Haste, haste, said they, a poor Clare is dying, a poor Clare is dead for hunger, God forgive us and our city. We pressed on, the stream bore us along where it would. We were carried through refectories, bare and crumbless, into cells over whose doors the conventual name of the occupants was written. Thus it was that I, with others, was forced into Sister Magdalen's cell. On her couch lay Gisborne, pale unto death, but not dead. By his side was a cup of water and a small morsel of mouldy bread, which he had pushed out of his reach, and could not move to obtain. Over his bed were these words, copied in the English version, Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him, if he thirst, give him drink. Some of us gave him of our food, and left him eating greedily, like some famished wild animal, for now it was no longer the sharp tinkle, but that one solemn toll, which in all Christian countries tells of the passing of the spirit out of earthly life into eternity. And again a murmur gathered and grew, as of many people speaking with awed breath. Poor Clare is dying, a poor Clare is dead. Borne along once more by the motion of the crowd, we were carried into the chapel belonging to the poor Clares. On a bier before the high altar lay a woman, lay Sister Magdalene, lay Bridget Fitzgerald. By her side stood Father Bernard in his robes of office, and holding the crucifix on high, while he pronounced the solemn absolution of the church, as to one who had newly confessed herself of deadly sin. I pushed on with passionate force, till I stood close to the dying woman, as she received extreme unction, amid the breathless and awed hush of the multitude around. Her eyes were glazing, her limbs were stiffening, but when the rite was over and finished, she raised her gaunt figure slowly up, and her eyes brightened to a strange intensity of joy, as with the gesture of her finger and the trance-like gleam of her eye, she seemed like one who watched the disappearance of some loathed and fearful creature. She is freed from the curse, said she, as she fell back dead. End of chapter the third. End of the poor Clare by Elizabeth Gaskell. Read by Phil Benson in Sydney, Australia. The Sin of a Father by Elizabeth Gaskell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From Household Words, a weekly journal, conducted by Charles Dickens. Number 453. Saturday, the 27th of November, 1858.
Dr. Brown was poor and had to make his way in the world. He had gone to study his profession in Edinburgh, and his energy, ability and good conduct had entitled him to some notice on the part of the professors. Once introduced to the ladies of their families, his prepossessing appearance and pleasing manners made him a universal favourite, and perhaps no other student received so many invitations to dances, evening parties, or was so often singled out to fill up an odd vacancy at the last moment at the dinner table. No one knew particularly who he was, or where he sprang from, but then he had no near relations, as he had once or twice observed, so he was evidently not hampered with low-born or low-bred connections. He had been in mourning for his mother when he first came to college. All this much was recalled to the recollection of Professor Fraser by his niece, Margaret, as she stood before him one morning in his study, telling him in a low but resolute voice that the night before Dr. James Brown had offered her marriage, that she had accepted him, and that he was intending to call on Professor Fraser, her uncle and natural guardian, that very morning to obtain his consent to their engagement. Professor Fraser was perfectly aware from Margaret's manner that his consent was regarded by her as a mere form, for that her mind was made up and he had more than once had occasion to find out how inflexible she could be. Yet he too was of the same blood, and held to his own opinions in the same obdurate manner, the consequence of which frequently was that uncle and niece had argued themselves into mutual bitterness of feeling, without altering each other's opinions one jot. But Professor Fraser could not restrain himself on this occasion of all others, "'Then, Margaret, you will just quietly settle down to be a beggar, "'for that lad Brown has little or no money to think of marrying upon, "'you that might be my Lady Kennedy, if you would.' "'I could not, uncle. "'Nonsense, child. "'Sir Alexander is a personable and agreeable man, "'middle-aged, if you will. "'Well, a wilful woman mourn have her way, "'but if I had had a notion that youngster was sneaking into my house,' To cajole you into fancying him, I would have seen him far enough before I had ever let your aunt invite him to dinner. Aye, you may mutter, but I say no gentleman would ever have come into my house to seduce my niece's affections without first informing me of his intentions and asking my leave. Dr. Brown is a gentleman, Uncle Fraser, whatever you may think of him. So you think, so you think. "'but who cares for the opinion of a lovesick girl? "'He is a handsome, plausible young fellow of good address, "'and I don't mean to deny his ability. "'But there is something about him I never did like, "'and now it's accounted for. "'And Sir Alexander, well, well, "'your aunt will be disappointed in you, Margaret, "'but you are always a headstrong girl. "'Has this Jamie Brown ever told you "'who or what his parents were?' or where he comes from. I don't ask about his forebears, for he does not look like a lad who has ever had ancestors, and you, a Fraser of Lovett. Fie for shame, Margaret. Who is this Jamie Brown? He is James Brown, doctor of medicine at the University of Edinburgh, a good, clever young man, whom I love with my whole heart, replied Margaret, reddening. Hoot! Is that the way for a maiden to speak? Where does he come from? Who are his kinsfolk? Unless he can give a pretty good account of his family and prospects, I shall just bid him be gone, Margaret, and that I tell you fairly. Uncle, her eyes were filling with hot indignant tears, I am of age. You know he is good and clever, else why have you had him so often to your house? I marry him and not his kinsfolk. He is an orphan. I doubt if he has any relations that he keeps up with. He has no brothers nor sisters. I don't care where he comes from. What was his father? asked Professor Fraser coldly. I don't know. Why should I go prying into every particular of his family and asking who his father was and what was the maiden name of his mother and when his grandmother was married? 
Yet I think I have heard Miss Margaret Theresa speak up pretty strongly in favour of a long line of unspotted ancestry. I had forgotten our own, I suppose, when I spoke so. Simon, Lord Lovett, is a creditable great-uncle to the Frasers. If all tales be true, he ought to have been hanged for a felon, instead of beheaded like a loyal gentleman. Oh, if you are determined to foul your own nest, I have done. Let James Brown come in. I will make him my bow, and thank him for condescending to marry a Fraser. Uncle, said Margaret, now fairly crying, don't let us part in anger. We love each other in our hearts. You have been good to me, and so has my aunt, but I have given my word to Dr. Brown, and I must keep it. I should love him if he was the son of a ploughman. We don't expect to be rich, but he has a few hundreds to start with, and I have my own hundred a year. Well, well, child, don't cry. You have settled it for yourself, it seems, so I wash my hands of it. I shake off all responsibility. You will tell your aunt what arrangements you make with Dr. Brown about your marriage, and I will do what you wish in the matter. But don't send the young man in to me to ask my consent. I neither give it nor withhold it. It would have been different if it had been Sir Alexander. Oh, Uncle Fraser, don't speak so. See Dr. Brown, and at any rate, for my sake, tell him you consent. Let me belong to you that much. It seems so desolate at such a time to have to dispose of myself, as if nobody owned or cared for me. The door was thrown open, and Dr. James Brown was announced. Margaret hastened away, and before he was aware, the professor had given a sort of consent, without asking a question of the happy young man, who hurried away to seek his betrothed, leaving her uncle muttering to himself. Both Dr. and Mrs. Fraser were so strongly opposed to Margaret's engagement, in reality, that they could not help showing it by manner and implication, although they had the grace to keep silent. But Margaret felt even more keenly than her lover that he was not welcome in the house. Her pleasure in seeing him was destroyed by her sense of the cold welcome that he received, and she willingly yielded to his desire of a short engagement, which was contrary to their original plan of waiting until he should be settled in practice in London, and should see his way clear to such an income as should render their marriage a prudent step. Dr. and Mrs. Fraser neither objected nor approved. Margaret would rather have had the most vehement opposition than this icy coldness, but it made her turn with redoubled affection to her warm-hearted and sympathising lover, not that she had ever discussed her uncle and aunt's behaviour with him. As long as he was apparently unaware of it, she would not awaken him to a sense of it. Besides, they had stood to her so long in the relation of parents that she felt she had no right to bring in a stranger to sit in judgment upon them. So it was with a rather heavy heart that she arranged their future menage with Dr. Brown, unable to profit by her aunt's experience and wisdom. But Margaret herself was a prudent and sensible girl, although accustomed to a degree of comfort in her uncle's house that almost amounted to luxury she could resolutely dispense with it when occasion required. When Dr. Brown started for London to seek and prepare their new home, she enjoined him not to make any but the most necessary preparations for her reception. She would herself superintend all that was wanting when she came. He had some old furniture stored up in a warehouse, which had been his mother's. He proposed selling it, and buying new in its place. Margaret persuaded him not to do this, but to make it go as far as it could. The household of the newly married couple was to consist of a Scotch woman, long connected with the Fraser family, who was to be the sole female servant, and of a man whom Dr. Brown picked up in London soon after he had fixed on a house, a man named Crawford, who had lived for many years with a gentleman, now gone abroad but who gave him the most excellent character in reply to Dr. Brown's inquiries. This gentleman had employed Crawford in a number of ways, 
so that in fact he was a kind of jack of all trades, and Dr. Brown, in every letter to Margaret, had some new accomplishment of his servants to relate, which he did with the more fullness than zest, because Margaret had slightly questioned the wisdom of starting in life with a manservant, but had yielded to Dr. Brown's arguments of the necessity of keeping up a respectable appearance, making a decent show, etc., to anyone who might be inclined to consult him, but to be daunted by the appearance of old Christy out of the kitchen, and unwilling to leave any message to one who spoke such unintelligible English. Crawford was so good a carpenter that he could put up shelves, adjust faulty hinges, mend locks, and even went to the length of constructing a box out of some old boards that had once formed a packing case. Crawford, one day, when his master was too busy to go out for his dinner, improvised an omelette as good as any Dr. Brown had ever tasted in Paris when he was studying there. In short, Crawford was a kind of admirable Crichton in his way, and Margaret was quite convinced that Dr. Brown was right in his decision that they should have a manservant, even before she was respectfully greeted by Crawford as he opened the door to the newly married couple when they came to their new home after their short wedding tour. Dr. Brown was rather afraid, lest Margaret should think the house bare and cheerless in its half-furnished state, for he had obeyed her injunctions and bought as little furniture as might be, in addition to the few things he had inherited from his mother. His consulting room, how grand it sounded, was completely arranged, ready for stray patients, and it was well calculated to make a good impression on them. There was a turkey carpet on the floor, that had been his mother's, and was just sufficiently worn to give it the air of respectability which handsome pieces of furniture have, when they look as if they had not just been bought for the occasion, but are in some degree hereditary. The same appearance pervaded the room. The library table, bought second-hand it must be confessed, the bureau, that had been his mother's, the leather chairs, as hereditary as the library table, the shelves Crawford had put up for Dr. Brown's medical books, a good engraving or two on the walls, gave altogether so pleasant an aspect to the apartment that both Dr. and Mrs. Brown thought, for that evening at any rate, that poverty was just as comfortable a thing as riches. Crawford had ventured to take the liberty of placing a few flowers about the room as his humble way of welcoming his mistress. Late autumn flowers, blending the idea of summer with that of winter, suggested by the bright little fire in the grate. Christy sent up delicious scones for tea, and Mrs. Fraser had made up for her want of geniality as well as she could by a store of marmalade and mutton hams. Dr. Brown could not be easy, even in this comfort, until he had shown Margaret, almost with a groan, how many rooms were as yet unfurnished how much remained to be done, but she laughed at his alarm, lest she should be disappointed in her new home, declared that she should like nothing better than planning and contriving, that what with her own talents for upholstery and Crawford's for joinery, the room should be furnished as if by magic, and no bills, the usual consequences of comfort, be forthcoming. But with the morning and daylight, Dr. Brown's anxiety returned, He saw and felt every crack in the ceiling, every spot on the paper, not for himself, but for Margaret. He was constantly, in his own mind, as it seemed, comparing the home he had brought her to, to the one she had left. He seemed constantly afraid, lest she had repented, or would repent having married him. This morbid restlessness was the only drawback to their great happiness, and to do away with it, Margaret was led into expenses much beyond her original intention. She bought this article in preference to that, because her husband, if he went shopping with her, seemed so miserable if he suspected that she denied herself the slightest wish on the score of economy. She learnt to avoid taking him out with her when she went to make her purchases, as it was a very simple thing to her to choose the least expensive thing, even though it were the ugliest when she was by herself, but not a simple painless thing to her to harden her heart to his look of mortification 
when she quietly said to the shopman that she could not afford this or that. On coming out of a shop after one of these occasions, he had said, Oh, Margaret, I ought not to have married you. You must forgive me. I have so loved you. Forgive you, James, said she, for making me so happy. What should make you think I care so much for Rep in preference to Maureen? Don't speak so again, please. Oh, Margaret, but don't forget how I ask you to forgive me. Crawford was everything that he had promised to be, and more than could be desired. He was Margaret's right hand in all her little household plans, in a way which irritated Christie not a little. This feud between Christie and Crawford was indeed the greatest discomfort in the household. Crawford was silently triumphant in his superior knowledge of London, in his favour upstairs, in his power of assisting his mistress, and in the consequent privilege of being frequently consulted. Christie was for ever regretting Scotland, and hinting at Margaret's neglect of one who had followed her fortunes into a strange country to make a favourite of a stranger, and one who was none so good as he ought to be, as she would sometimes affirm. But she never brought any proof of her vague accusations. Margaret did not choose to question her, but set them down to a jealousy of her fellow-servant, which the mistress did all in her power to heal. On the whole, however, the four people forming this family lived together in tolerable harmony. Dr. Brown was more than satisfied with his house, his servants, his professional prospects, and most of all with his little, bright, energetic wife. Margaret, from time to time, was taken by surprise by certain moods of her husband's, but the tendency of these moods was not to weaken her affection, rather to call out a feeling of pity for what appeared to her morbid sufferings and suspicions, a pity ready to be turned into sympathy as soon as she could discover any definite cause for his occasional depression of spirits. Christie did not pretend to like Crawford, but as Margaret quietly declined to listen to her grumblings and discontent on this head, and as Crawford himself was almost painfully solicitous to gain the good opinion of the old Scotchwoman, there was no open rupture between them. On the whole, the popular, successful Dr. Brown was apparently the most anxious person in his family. There could be no great cause for this as regarded his money affairs. By one of those lucky accidents which sometimes lift a man up out of his struggles, and carry him on to smooth unencumbered ground, he had made a great step in his professional progress, and their income from this source was likely to be fully as much as Margaret and he had ever anticipated in their most sanguine moments, with the likelihood too of a steady increase as the years went on. I must explain myself more fully on this head. Margaret herself had rather more than a hundred a year, Sometimes, indeed, her dividends had amounted to one hundred and thirty or forty pounds, but on that she dared not rely. Dr. Brown had seventeen hundred remaining of the three thousand left him by his mother, and out of this money he had to pay for some of the furniture, the bills for which had not been sent in at the time, in spite of all Margaret's entreaties that such might be the case. They came in about a week before the time when the events I am going to narrate took place. Of course, they amounted to more than even the prudent Margaret had expected, and she was a little dispirited to find out how much money it would take to liquidate them. But curiously and contradictorily enough, as she had often noticed before, any real cause for anxiety or disappointment did not seem to affect her husband's cheerfulness. He laughed at her dismay over her accounts, jingled the proceeds of that day's work in his pockets, counted it out to her, and calculated the year's probable income from that day's gains. Margaret took the guineas and carried them upstairs to her own secretaire in silence. Having learnt the difficult art of trying to swallow down her household cares in the presence of her husband, when she came back she was cheerful, if grave. He had taken up the bills in her absence and been adding them up. 
two hundred and thirty-six pounds, he said, putting the accounts away to clear the table for tea as Crawford brought in the things. I don't call that much. I believe I reckoned on their coming to a great deal more. I'll go into the city tomorrow and sell out some shares and set your little heart at ease. Now don't go and put a spoonful less tea in tonight to help pay these bills. Earning is better than saving, and I am earning at a famous rate. Give me good tea, Maggie, for I've done a good day's work. They were sitting in the doctor's consulting room for the better economy of fire. To add to Margaret's discomfort, the chimney smoked this evening. She had held her tongue from any repining words, for she remembered the old proverb about a smoky chimney and a scolding wife. But she was more irritated by the puffs of smoke coming over her pretty white work than she cared to show, and it was in a sharper tone than usual that she spoke in bidding Crawford take care and have the chimney swept. The next morning all had cleared brightly off. Her husband had convinced her that all their money matters were going on well, the fire burned brightly at breakfast time, and the unwanted sun shone in at the windows. Margaret was surprised when Crawford told her that he had not been able to meet with the chimney sweeper that morning, but that he had tried to arrange the coals in the grate, so that for this one morning at least his mistress should not be annoyed, and by the next he would take care to secure a sweep. Margaret thanked him and acquiesced in all his plans about giving a general cleaning to the room, the more readily, because she felt that she had spoken sharply the night before. She decided to go and pay all her bills, and make some distant calls on the next morning, and her husband promised to go into the city and provide her with the money. This he did. He showed her the notes that evening, locked them up for the night in his bureau, and lo, in the morning they were gone. They had breakfasted in the back parlour or half-furnished dining room. A charwoman was in the front room cleaning after the sweeps. Dr. Brown went to his bureau, singing an old Scotch tune as he left the dining room. It was so long before he came back that Margaret went to look for him. He was sitting in the chair nearest the bureau, leaning his head upon it in an attitude of the deepest despondency. He did not seem to hear Margaret's step as she made her way among rolled-up carpets and chairs piled on each other. She had to touch him on the shoulder before she could rouse him. "'James! James!' she said in alarm. He looked up at her, almost as if he did not know her. "'Oh, Margaret!' he said, and took hold of her hands and hid his face in her neck. "'Dearest love, what is it?' she asked, thinking he was suddenly taken ill. "'Someone has been to my bureau since last night,' he groaned, without looking up or moving. "'And taken the money,' said Margaret, in an instant understanding how it stood. It was a great blow, a great loss, far greater than the few extra pounds by which the bills had exceeded her calculations, yet it seemed as if she could bear it better. "'Oh, dear,' she said, "'that is bad. But after all, do you know?' she said, trying to raise his face, so that she might look into it and give him the encouragement of her honest, loving eyes. "'At first I thought you were deadly ill, and all sorts of dreadful possibilities rushed through my mind. It is such a relief to find that it is only money. Only money, he echoed, sadly avoiding her look, as if he could not bear to show her how much he felt it. And after all, she said with spirit, it can't be gone far. Only last night here, the chimney sweeps. We must send Crawford for the police directly. You did not take the numbers of the notes, ringing the bell as she spoke. No, they were only to be in our possession one night, he said. No, to be sure not. The charwoman now appeared at the door with her pail of hot water. Margaret looked into her face as if to read guilt or innocence. She was a protégé of Christie's, who was not apt to accord her favour easily or without good grounds. An honest, decent widow, 
with a large family to maintain by her labour. That was the character in which Margaret had engaged her, and she looked it. Grimy in her dress, because she could not spare the money or time to be clean, her skin looked healthy and cared for. She had a straightforward, business-like appearance about her, and seemed in no ways daunted nor surprised to see Dr. and Mrs. Brown standing in the middle of the room in displeased perplexity and distress. She went about her business without taking any particular notice of them. Margaret's suspicions settled down yet more distinctly upon the chimney-sweeper, but he could not have gone far. The notes could hardly have got into circulation. Such a sum could hardly have been spent by such a man in so short a time, and the restoration of the money was her first, her only object. She had hardly a thought for subsequent duties, such as prosecution of the offender and the like consequences of crime. While her whole energies were bent on the speedy recovery of the money, and she was rapidly going over the necessary steps to be taken, her husband sat, all poured out into his chair, as the Germans say, no force in him to keep his limbs in any attitude requiring the slightest exertion, his face sunk, miserable, and with that foreshadowing of the lines of age which sudden distress is apt to call out on the youngest and smoothest faces. "'What can Crawford be about?' said Margaret, pulling the bell again with vehemence. "'Oh, Crawford!' as the man at that instant appeared at the door. "'Is anything the matter?' he said, interrupting her, as if alarmed into an unusual discomposure by her violent ringing. "'I'd just gone round the corner with the letter Master gave me last night for the post. Then when I came back, Christy told me you had rung for me, ma'am. "'I beg your pardon, but I have hurried so.' And indeed his breath did come quickly, and his face was full of penitent anxiety. "'Oh, Crawford, I'm afraid the sweep has got into your master's bureau and taken all the money he put there last night. It has gone at any rate.' Did you ever leave him in the room alone? I can't say, ma'am. Perhaps I did. Yes, I believe I did. I remember now. I had my work to do, and I thought the charwoman was come, and I went to my pantry. And some time after, Christy came to me, complaining that Mrs. Roberts was so late. And then I knew that he must have been alone in the room. But dear me, ma'am, who would have thought there had been so much wickedness in him? "'How was it he got into the bureau?' said Margaret, turning to her husband. "'Was the lock broken?' He roused himself up like one who wakens from sleep. "'Yes. No. I suppose I had turned the key without locking it last night. The bureau was closed, not locked, when I went to it this morning, and the bolt was shot.' He relapsed into inactive, thoughtful silence. "'At any rate,' It's no use losing time in wondering now. Go, Crawford, as fast as you can for a policeman. You know the name of the chimney sweeper, of course, she added, as Crawford was preparing to leave the room. Indeed, ma'am, I'm very sorry, but I just agreed with the first who was passing along the street. If I could have known. But Margaret had turned away with an impatient gesture of despair. Crawford went without another word to seek a policeman. In vain did his wife try and persuade Dr. Brown to taste any breakfast. A cup of tea was all he would try and swallow, and that was taken in hasty gulps to clear his dry throat as he heard Crawford's voice talking to the policeman whom he was ushering in. The policeman heard all and said little. Then the inspector came. Dr. Brown seemed to leave all the talking to Crawford, who apparently liked nothing better. Margaret was infinitely distressed and dismayed by the effect the robbery seemed to have on her husband's energies. The probable loss of such a sum was bad enough, but there was something so weak and poor in character in letting it affect him so strongly, to deaden all energy and destroy all hopeful spring, that, although Margaret did not dare to define her feeling, nor the cause of it, to herself, she had the facts before her perpetually, that if she were to judge of her husband from this morning only, she must learn to rely on herself alone in all cases of emergency. 
The inspector repeatedly turned from Crawford to Dr. and Mrs. Brown for answers to his inquiries. It was Margaret who replied, with terse short sentences, very different from Crawford's long involved explanations. At length the inspector asked to speak to her alone. She followed him into the next room, past the affronted Crawford and her despondent husband. The inspector gave one sharp look at the charwoman, who was going on with her scouring with stolid indifference, turned her out, and then asked Margaret where Crawford came from, how long he had lived with them, and various other questions, all showing the direction his suspicions had taken. This shocked Margaret extremely, but she quickly answered every inquiry, and at the end watched the inspector's face closely, and waited for the avowal of the suspicion. He led the way back to the other room without a word, however. Crawford had left, and Dr. Brown was trying to read the morning's letters, which had just been delivered, but his hands shook so much that he could not see a line. "'Dr. Brown,' said the inspector, "'I have little doubt that your manservant has committed this robbery. "'I judge so from his whole manner "'and from his anxiety to tell the story "'and his way of trying to throw suspicion on the chimney-sweeper, "'neither whose name nor dwelling can he give. "'At least he says not. "'Your wife says he's already been out of the house this morning, "'even before he went to summon a policeman, "'so there is little doubt that he has found means "'for concealing or disposing of the notes.' and you say you do not know the numbers. However, that can probably be ascertained. At this moment, Christy knocked at the door, and in a state of great agitation, demanded to speak to Margaret. She brought up an additional store of suspicious circumstances, none of them much in themselves, but all tending to criminate her fellow servant. She had expected to find herself blamed for starting the idea of Crawford's guilt, and was rather surprised to find herself listened to with attention by the inspector. This led her to tell many other little things, all bearing against Crawford, which, a dread of being thought jealous and quarrelsome, had led her to conceal before from her master and mistress. At the end of her story, the inspector said, "'There can be no doubt of the course to be taken. "'You, sir, must give your manservant in charge.' he will be taken before the sitting magistrate directly, and there is already evidence enough to make him be remanded for a week, during which time we may trace the notes and complete the chain. Must they prosecute? said Dr. Brown, almost lividly pale. It is, I own, a serious loss of money to me, but there will be the further expenses of the prosecution, the loss of time, the... He stopped. He saw his wife's indignant eyes fixed upon him, and shrank from their look of unconscious reproach. "'Yes, Inspector,' he said, "'I give him in charge. Do what you will. Do what is right. Of course I take the consequences. We take the consequences. Don't we, Margaret?' He spoke in a kind of wild, low voice, of which Margaret thought it best to take no notice. "'Tell us exactly what to do.' she said, very coldly and quietly, addressing herself to the policeman. He gave her the necessary directions as to their attending at the police office and bringing Christie as a witness, and then went away to take measures for securing Crawford. Margaret was surprised to find how little hurry or violence needed to be used in Crawford's arrest. She had expected to hear sounds of commotion in the house, if indeed Crawford himself had not taken the alarm and escaped. But when she had suggested the latter apprehension to the inspector, he smiled and told her that when he had first heard of the charge from the policeman on the beat, he had stationed a detective officer within sight of the house to watch all ingress or egress, so that Crawford's whereabouts would soon be discovered if he had attempted to escape. Margaret's attention was now directed to her husband. He was making hurried preparations for setting off on his round of visits, and evidently did not wish to have any conversation with her on the subject of the morning's events. He promised to be back by eleven o'clock, 
before which time the inspector had assured them their presence would not be needed. Once or twice Dr Brown said as if to himself, It is a miserable business. Indeed, Margaret felt it to be so, and now that the necessity for immediate speech and action was over, she began to fancy that she must be very hard-hearted, very deficient in common feeling, inasmuch as she had not suffered like her husband at the discovery that the servant, whom they had been learning to consider as a friend, and to look upon him as having their interests so warmly at heart, was, in all probability, a treacherous thief. She remembered all his pretty marks of attention to her from the day when he had welcomed her arrival at the new home by his humble present of flowers, until only the day before, when, seeing her fatigue, he had, unasked, made her a cup of coffee, coffee such as none but he could make. How often had he thought of warm dry clothes for her husband, how wakeful had he been at nights, how diligent in the mornings. It was no wonder that her husband felt this discovery of domestic treason acutely. It was she who was hard and selfish, and thinking more of the recovery of the money than of the terrible disappointment in character if the charge against Crawford were true. At eleven o'clock her husband returned with a cab. Christie had thought the occasion of appearing at a police office worthy of her Sunday clothes, and was as smart as her possessions could make her. But Margaret and her husband looked as pale and sorrow-stricken as if they had been the accused and not the accusers. Dr Brown shrank from meeting Crawford's eye as the one took his place in the witness-box, the other in the dock. Yet Crawford was trying, Margaret was sure of this, to catch his master's attention. Failing that, he looked at Margaret with an expression she could not fathom. Indeed, the whole character of his face was changed. Instead of the calm, smooth look of attentive obedience, he had assumed an insolent, threatening expression of defiance, smiling occasionally in a most unpleasant manner as Dr. Brown spoke of the Bureau and its contents. He was remanded for a week, but the evidence as yet being far from conclusive, bail for his appearance was taken. This bail was offered by his brother, a respectable tradesman, well known in his neighbourhood, and to whom Crawford had sent on his arrest. So Crawford was at large again, much to Christie's dismay, who took off her Sunday clothes on her return home with a heavy heart, hoping rather than trusting that they should not all be murdered in their beds before the week was out. It must be confessed Margaret herself was not entirely free from fears of Crawford's vengeance. His eyes had looked so maliciously and vindictively at her and at her husband as they gave their evidence. But his absence in the household gave Margaret enough to do to prevent her dwelling on foolish fears. His being away made a terrible blank in their daily comfort, which neither Margaret nor Christie, exert themselves as they would, could fill up. And it was the more necessary that all should go on smoothly, as Dr. Brown's nerves had received such a shock at the discovery of the guilt of his favourite trusted servant, that Margaret was led at times to apprehend a serious illness. He would pace around the room at night when he thought she was asleep, moaning to himself, would require the utmost persuasion to induce him to go out and see his patients. He was worse than ever after consulting the lawyer whom he had employed to conduct the prosecution. There was, as Margaret was brought unwillingly to perceive, some mystery in the case, for he eagerly took his letters from the post, going to the door as soon as he heard the knock, and concealing their directions from her. As the week passed away, his nervous misery still increased. One evening, the candles were not lighted. He was sitting over the fire in a listless attitude, resting his head on his hand and that supported on his knee. Margaret determined to try an experiment, to see if she could not probe and find out the nature of that sore that he hid with such constant care. She took a stool and sat down at his feet taking his hand in hers. "'Listen, dearest James, to an old story I once heard. It may interest you. There were once two orphans, 
boy and girl in their hearts, though they were a young man and a young woman in years. They were not brother and sister, and by and by they fell in love, just the same fond, silly way you and I did, you remember. Well, the girl was amongst her own people, but the boy was far away from his, if indeed he had any alive. But the girl loved him so dearly for himself, so that sometimes she thought she was glad that he had no one to care for him but just her alone. Her friends did not like him as much as she did, for perhaps they were wise, grave, cold people, and she, I dare say, was very foolish, and they did not like her marrying the boy, which was just stupidity in them, for they had not a word to say against him. But about a week before the marriage day was fixed, they thought they had found out something. My darling love, don't tremble so, don't take away your hand, only just listen. Her aunt came to her and said, Child, you must give up your lover. His father was tempted and sinned, and if he is now alive, he is a transported convict. The marriage cannot take place. But the girl stood up and said, If he has known this great sorrow and shame, he needs my love all the more. I will not leave him, nor forsake him, but love him all the better. And I charge you, aunt, as you hope to receive a blessing for doing as you would be done by, that you tell no one. I really think that girl awed her aunt in some strange way into secrecy. But when she was left alone, she cried, long and sadly, to think what a shadow rested on the heart she loved so dearly, and she meant to strive to lighten the life, and to conceal for ever that she had heard of the burden. But now she thinks, Oh, my husband, how you must have suffered! As he bent down his head on her shoulder, and cried terrible man's tears. "'God be thanked,' he said at length. "'You know all, and you do not shrink from me. "'Oh, what a miserable, deceitful coward I have been! "'Suffered, yes, suffered enough to drive me mad, "'and if I had been but brave, "'I might have been spared all this long twelve months of agony. "'But it is right I should have been punished, "'and you knew it even before we were married.' when you might have drawn back. I could not. You would not have broken off your engagement with me, would you, under the like circumstances, if our cases had been reversed? I do not know. Perhaps I might, for I am not so brave, so good, so strong as you, my Margaret. How could I be? Let me tell you more. We wandered about, my mother and I, thankful that our name was such a common one, but shrinking from every illusion in a way which no one can understand, who has not been conscious of an inward sore. Living in an assize town was a torture, a commercial one was nearly as bad. My father was the son of a dignified clergyman, well known to his brethren. A cathedral town was to be avoided, because there the circumstance of the dean of St. Bottle's son having been transported was sure to be known. I had to be educated, Therefore we had to live in a town, for my mother could not bear to part from me, and I was sent to a day school. We were very poor for our station. No, we had no station. We were the wife and child of a convict, for my poor mother's early habits, I should have said. But when I was about fourteen, my father died in his exile, leaving, as convicts in those days sometimes did, a large fortune. It all came to us. My mother shut herself up and cried and prayed for a whole day. Then she called me in, and took me into her council. We solemnly pledged ourselves to give the money to some charity as soon as I was legally of age. Till then the interest was laid by, every penny of it, though sometimes we were in sore distress for money. My education cost so much. But how could we tell how the money had been accumulated? Here he dropped his voice. Soon after I was one and twenty, the papers rang with admiration of the unknown munificent donor of certain sums. I loathed their praises. I shrank from all recollection of my father. I remembered him dimly, but always as angry and violent with my mother, my poor gentle mother. Margaret, she loved my father, and for her sake I have tried, 
since her death to feel kindly towards his memory. Soon after my mother's death, I began to know you, my jewel, my treasure. After a while he began again. But oh, Margaret, even now you do not know the worst. After my mother's death, I found a bundle of law papers, of newspaper reports about my father's trial. Poor soul! Why she had kept them I cannot say. They were covered over with notes in her handwriting, and for that reason I kept them. It was so touching to read her record of the days spent by her, in her solitary innocence, when he was embroiling himself deeper and deeper in crime. I kept this bundle, as I thought so safely, in a secret drawer of my bureau, but that wretch Crawford has got hold of it. I missed the papers that very morning. The loss of them was infinitely worse than the loss of the money, and now Crawford threatens to bring out the one terrible fact in open court if he can, and his lawyer may do it, I believe. At any rate, to have it blazoned out to the world, I, who have spent my life in fearing this hour, but most of all for you, Margaret, still, if only it could be avoided, who will employ the son of Brown, the noted forger? I shall lose all my practice. Men will look askance at me as I enter their doors. They will drive me into a crime. I sometimes fear that crime is hereditary. Oh, Margaret, what am I to do? What can you do? she asked. I can refuse to prosecute. Let Crawford go free, you knowing him to be guilty. I know him to be guilty. Then simply, you cannot do this thing. You let loose a criminal upon the public. But if I do not, we shall come to shame and poverty. It is for you I mind it, not for myself. I ought never to have married. Listen to me. I don't care for poverty, and as for shame, I should feel it twenty times more grievously if you and I had consented to screen the guilty from any fear or for any selfish motives of our own. I don't pretend that I shall not feel it when first the truth is known, but my shame will turn into pride as I watch you live it down. You have been rendered morbid, dear husband, by having something all your life to conceal. Let the world know the truth and say the worst. You will go forth, a free, honest, honourable man, able to do your future work without fear. That scoundrel Crawford has sent for an answer to his impudence note, said Christie, putting in her head at the door. Stay, may I write it, said Margaret. She wrote, Whatever you may do or say, there is but one course open to us. No threats can deter your master from doing his duty. Margaret Brown. There, she said, passing it to her husband. He will see that I know all, and I suspect he has reckoned something on your tenderness for me. Margaret's note only enraged. It did not daunt Crawford. Before a week was out, everyone who cared knew that Dr. Brown, the rising young physician, was the son of the notorious Brown the forger. All the consequences took place which he had anticipated. Crawford had to suffer a severe sentence, and Dr. Brown and his wife had to leave the house and go to a smaller one. They had to pinch and to screw, aided in all most zealously by the faithful Christie. But Dr. Brown was lighter-hearted than he had ever been before in his conscious lifetime. His foot was now firmly planted on the ground, and every step he rose was a sure gain. People did say that Margaret had been seen in those worst times on her hands and knees, cleaning her own doorstep. But I don't believe it, for Christie would never have let her do that. And as far as my own evidence goes, I can only say that the last time I was in London, I saw a door plate with Dr. James Brown upon it, on the door of a handsome house in a handsome square. As I looked, I saw a broom drive up to the door, and a lady get out and go into that house, who was certainly the Margaret Fraser of old days, graver, more portly, more stern than I had almost said. But as I watched and thought, I saw her come to the dining-room window with a baby in her arms, 
and her whole face melted into a smile of infinite sweetness. End of The Sin of a Father by Elizabeth Gaskell Read by Phil Benson in Sydney, Australia